Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Probe 7, log entry 1411. Another waking period. Ship seems to be functioning perfectly as usual. Wish they could make cars this reliable back home. Oxygen supply, right on the button. Food supply, a little over. Something wrong with my appetite. Not enough exercise, I guess. I know. I know. More workout time. Gotta stay in shape. Never know who I might meet in space. Coordinates on autopilot. Propulsion system humming like a top. Pressure flow, output, all right on the money. Ah, oh, come on, guys. You don't need a pilot up here. Could have sent an unmanned probe. All I am is extra weight. Think how much farther this crate could go without me. Of course, you wouldn't have my brilliant observations. Boredom, followed by prolonged disinterest, with periods of great loneliness. Must be fascinating. Here's an observation. All these blinking lights in the cockpit... They remind me of stars, or candles, or uh, cigarette lighters. That's it. You remember cigarettes? Did you know at concerts people had these little lighters, and sometimes they'd hold them up and, and look like a, a sea of stars out there in the dark? <laughs> I, I want to write a book, not this diary. doesn't have enough plot, just me remembering. That's who I am, boys. He who remembers. Oh, well. Better send you the numbers. Here goes the download. Transmitting now. Till next time, this is Colonel A.L. Cook. Over and out. Hold on, I think we've got a malfunction here. Some kind of overload. Yep, there's a power drain. Initiating diagnostics. No time for that. Switching to manual override. Base, this is Probe 7. Probe 7, calling base. Come in. I've just lost a rocket tube. Can't handle this baby. Controls won't respond. Losing power fast. 
have to set down on the nearest planet. Got one in view now. Not much choice. Entering atmosphere. Surface coming up fast. Can't slow down. No retro rockets. Ship's about to catch fire. Base, do you read? This is probe seven. Probe seven. Mayday. 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 One Colonel Cook. Traveler in deep space several million miles from his point of departure and presently out of options. He set a course across an endless ocean in a one-man lifeboat, now scorched and broken on an alien shore. But even if he should survive, his greatest ordeal is yet to come, for he must face a far more dangerous challenge, an opponent more menacing than the cold, lifeless vacuum of space. He must face what awaits him on the other side of the bulkhead, and do battle with the unknown. As soon as the dust settles, he will take stock of his plight with very little effort, a single 360-degree movement of head and eyes. For Colonel Cook has come to rest on a small, undistinguished planet not on any chart, one that is actually an outpost in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story... Probe 7, Over and Out, starring Lou Gossett Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Log entry 1412. I'm alive. That's all I know for sure. The ship is wrecked pretty badly. It might be possible to realign the main drive, but... Not without help. So far, I'm holding up. One badly bruised head and a broken right arm for which I made a sling. A few more painkillers in the first aid kit, but after that, I'm on my own. The planet has an atmosphere, so I don't need the pressure suit. That's another stroke of luck, if you can call it that. The terrain is desolate. Sand, rocks some low-grade plant life. That means there's water. The question is, how much and where? The ship has cooled down now, what's left of it. Main instrument panel is intact, so I'll try to contact the base directly, if there's enough power. More later. Cook, signing off. This is Probe 7. Do you read? Probe 7. This is Probe 7, calling base. Probe 7? With a landing report and damage assessment, 
Over to you, Bass. This is Probe 7. Come on, Bass. I'm waiting. Probe 7, Probe 7, this is Bass. You're coming through low, barely audible. Blaine, is that you? Yes, yes, this is Lieutenant Blaine. We read that you're... This is Cook, Probe 7. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you. Cook? Cook, we thought we'd lost you. Your, your transmission was interrupted. Everything was interrupted. I'm lucky to be alive. Probe 7 made unscheduled landfall approximately seven hours ago. What? Come again. Can't hear? I thought you said... I've crash-landed, Blaine, in another planetary system. Didn't have much choice. One of the thrusters broke off the ship. This planet is 92,900,000 miles from the nearest star. Sorry, but I can't send or receive a visual. Most of my equipment was fried in the crash. Okay. How's your oxygen? And that's the least of my worries. There's an atmosphere here. I don't know its density or composition, but it's breathable. Probe 7? Probe 7, your signal's drifting. Can you increase power? Not much chance of that. Far as I can tell, this is the last of my juice, at least for now. I've got half a generator and three solar cells working. I was afraid it wasn't enough to get through at all. Okay. Can you affect repairs? Say again? Repairs. Repairs. Can you make repairs? <laughs> if you give me maybe 20 years, a good right arm, and a new head while you're at it, I might make a start. The bottom line is, I need help. Got that base? Help. And right away. Great. How soon can you send a ship? Colonel, I'm sorry to say we have nothing here that can reach you. What? You had several ships on the drawing board. Repeat, we have nothing available. Say again? All construction is suspended pending the current crisis. Ah, oh, come on! Colonel Cook, I've been told you'll have to make the repairs yourself. Base? Now hear this. I don't have fuel, no propellant at all. I left most of my rockets scattered across 50 miles of dirt and rock. All I have is a ship that looks like a jigsaw puzzle. As for the wiring, it's nothing but spaghetti. So when you say you've got nothing that can help you, you're telling me you're crossing off one spaceman permanently. Folks, seven, we're having difficulty. Your words are breaking up. All right, base. I'll give it to you in a few syllables. This ship isn't going anywhere. Not forward, up, down, or back home. Is that plain enough for you? Now I'm asking you again. Isn't there anything you can do to help me out here? Or are you just going to write me off? Colonel Cook? There's the low power warning. I'm losing transmission. Got the sign off for now. I'll make contact again in three hours. Roger that, will you please, base? on this frequency, Colonel, and wait to hear from you. Oh, just a minute. There's someone here who wants to speak to you, Colonel. Colonel Cook, this is General Larrabee. We understand the spot you're in. We wish we could help. Thank you, sir. Well, there is a possibility that once you give us a full report on the ship, uh, we can send you instructions for its repair and walk you through it step by step. That's still an option. Is it? Well, here's an option. Why don't I just build me a new one, General? I'll make it out of tin cans and chewing gum. I'll burn some circuit boards with a magnifying glass. That's a possibility, too. Colonel, I'm trying to be frank with you. Sorry, sir. I'll transmit again in three hours. Over and out. 
Sonia, then help me. I wonder if that's a possibility. Log entry 1413. I'm standing on a hillside a few meters from the ship. You hear that? I think there's going to be a change in the weather. Back home we'd call it a sandstorm. Better head back soon. I see vines and some flowers down the other side of the hill. There's more life here than I thought. As to what stage of evolution is reached, that's pure conjecture. No sign of animal life, but the vegetation grows thicker in certain areas, like the valley. Can't trust my leg yet. Better stay close to the ship. I've picked some plants for analysis. We'll see if there's anything edible. Hey! Anybody! Hey! Take me to your leader. I've got beads and wampum. Is anybody here? Good wires in the whole ship. Here comes that sandstorm. I'm gonna get the hatch shut. Close, will you? That's it. A little bit more. This is Probe 7, calling base. Probe 7, calling base. Over to you, if you read. We read you. We read you very well, Colonel. Ah, you've got the video going. For now, General, I've wired all the solar cells in the series. At the moment, I'm running off the storage batteries, though. It's almost night here. My situation? Yes. Any change, Colonel? I've done what I can, but I'd have to call it unchanged. The power level's higher as long as I charge up during the day, but I don't know how long that will last. At least, I've got you on the screen. Got to see another face. Both of you. You should be used to solitude. You've been in space a long time. Yeah, I should. But that was different somehow. I was a big something in the middle of nothing. This, though, I've landed and it feels like I'm supposed to be somewhere, and I'm not. My memory of home is fading fast. Uh, Colonel, and the condition of the ship, uh, still a total loss. Probe 7 is no longer probing, General, unless it's the few feet of dirt I tore up when I crashed. There is life here, like I said, vegetable life, pretty elementary. I've explored the surrounding area in all directions, but I can't get down to the valley with this leg. The gravity is roughly the same as ours. From what I can tell, the atmosphere is similar as well. At least, there's no pollution. I haven't started coughing yet. Describe what's left of the ship. What's left of the ship, General, is a few feet of bent-up metal. I told you, it's unrepairable. There isn't one other section that's still intact. She'll do for a museum or a junkyard. Take your pick. As for me, I don't have the luxury of making a choice. Nor do we, Colonel. Nor do we. Right. 
The crisis. Listen to me, Cook. We've got a major problem here. Oh, you do? Since you left, we've had an international incident. A serious one. There's talk of war. The next 24 hours will be crucial. As long as I can remember, there's always been a crisis, and there's always been talk of war. Well, hasn't there? Yes. But this time, I'm afraid. You'll forgive me, General. But I've got a crisis, too. And it's a very immediate one. I have the remainder of my rations and two broken bones in one arm. You have my location. I need to know that help of some sort is on the way. Or would you call that unreasonable? Now listen up, Colonel. The rest of the fleet's been taken out. There isn't another ship, unless we build one. And if we go to hydrogen war in the next few hours, there'll be nobody left to do the building. Do I make myself clear? You're serious? That's the realistic view, Colonel. It may go down hard, but I'm giving you the facts of life. Ten hours from now, maybe six, maybe four, We'll be fully committed. I'm talking about a half billion people, not just one man. That's about as clear as I can put it. Very well then, General. I guess that's it. We don't see any alternative. Will there be any point in making further contact with base? Yes, Probe 7. For two reasons I can think of. Both of some benefit to you. One, so you'll know that you're not alone up there. And two, to confirm that your own world still exists. Though the latter is a moot question at this point. Over to you, Colonel. I can't think of anything else to say at the moment. Feel free to keep the signal open, if you like. Can't do that, General. I need to charge the batteries when it's light again. Here's that storm. Don't know how strong it'll be or how long it'll last. But I'll try to get through it. Nothing else I can do. Then for whatever it's worth, know that we're still here. For now. Over to you, Probe 7. Roger, base. And out. Blaine? General? I wish you could hear this. There's something outside, I swear. Something or someone. Log entry 1414. Just in case anybody ever hears this, I didn't get much sleep last night. I was waiting for the wind to die down. As soon as it did, I opened the hatch sometime around dawn. You see, I thought I heard something pounding on the hull, over and over. It couldn't have been an accident. It had to be something intelligent trying to signal me, to let it in from the storm. That was what I thought. Funny the way the mind works. I've never been so glad to hear anything in my life. And at the same time, so afraid. But I opened it anyway. Well, everything was covered with a fine layer of sand. Silica crystals, very much like the soil back home. And that was the trouble. Whatever had been outside, there was no sign of it now. If there were tracks, the sandstorm had wiped them out. The ground, everything, smooth as a beach where no man has gone before. I did find something, though. A broken branch. So, it was only the wind, after all, blowing it back and forth before it broke off. Had me going for a while. 
So much for my man, Friday. Now I'm back to the old routine. Reconnaissance, hunting, and gathering. Just think, a few million years from now, something on four legs or two or eight may actually walk this barren planet again. A few million more years, and it will grow a bigger brain so the species can start doing the same things I'm doing. Foraging for food, trying to survive. Wonder if there'll be anything left to the ship by then. Probably not. Me? I'll be a fossil at the bottom of a tar pit somewhere, and no one will realize I was ever here. Well, onward he marched, for want of anything better to do. Blaine? General Larrabee? Are you still there? Here, Colonel. Go ahead. Well, you look like you haven't slept. Not much. And you? Not really. Up at dawn to do some hiking. North, east, south, and west. I had been hoping. Yes? Just a crazy dream I had. No sign of anything... It's a primitive planet. I'm very much alone here, after all. Oh, not completely. I've got a wind that sings sad songs and some scrawny plants that check me out every now and then as I walk by. There might be some fruit trees that are edible down in the valley, if they're not poisonous. But that's it. That's all of it. I'm truly sorry. There used to be an old saying. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. The only thing wrong is I can't even plant lemons. But don't worry. I'll keep trying. Not that this will provide any vast solace to you, but at 9 o'clock this morning, Colonel, we went to war. And? The whole eastern seaboard went up. You mean all of it? Exactly. Twelve minutes. I suppose we retaliated? Oh, indeed. With great alacrity and effectiveness. And we still are. With everything we've got. It was uh, our old enemy? That's right, if it matters now. And the result of all this? Our world is doing a little wholesale dying at the moment. And there's nothing to do but watch it happen. What about the base? Are you safe? For the time being. Our location is classified. Only you and a few others know where we are. The signal's encrypted. That's good, then. Trouble is, we can't stay here much longer. There have been bombs as close as 400 miles from us, falling through the night. It's now a question, Colonel, of the manner of death. Very fast or very slow. It's that kind of consideration. Not one we thought would ever be a reality. General. You know, it's really quite a pity that we didn't send others with you. What you think of as a prison might have proved to be a haven of sorts for the survival of the species. Don't have any illusions about it, General. What you think of as a haven is only a very sizable dungeon. A good-sized dungeon with a breathable air. But that's what it is, and there's no way out. I don't much care for solitary confinement, and neither would you. Unfortunately, both of us have very little choice in the matter. General, this is urgent. Give it to me. What is it, General? What's happening there? I said, in a moment. Cook, I've just received an official communication. We're going to have to move out of here. Now, I don't know whether we'll be able to transmit again or not. If we are able to, I'll do my best to make contact. 
You have my word. Thank you. Try if you can. It means a lot to hear a real, live voice. I wish we could do more. Silence. Or cries. That's the story from our world. Silence. Or cries. God bless you. And good luck. Over and out. Probe 7. Yeah. Over and out. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Hell of an ending. To all my friends back home, take good care. Looks like I won't be seeing you again. Not in this life. Time to start a new project. Chapter One. The memoirs of Colonel A.L. Cook. And I've got a very good memory. You wouldn't believe the stories I could tell. Who knows? After I'm gone, maybe someone else will crash here and find it. A lifetime of memories. Every sight, every sound, all the way back to the beginning. The kids I knew, the girls I dated, my friends, mom and dad, the first job, all of it. Every detail recorded for posterity. Has anyone ever done that before? Maybe people who keep diaries their whole lives, except that no one ever got it all down. Didn't have the time, but I do. All the time in the world. Log entry, 1415. This one's for the record. A final official entry. From here on, it'll be the life story of Colonel A.L. Cook. Me, myself, and I. If for no other reason than to keep from going batty. But for now, it's a beautiful day. Here on Primordial World. Ship still standing, of course. You'd never know that's what it was. More like something from a scrap metal yard. The cost that went into building it, the man hours, and for what? To come to rest here. A little way station that isn't even on the map. I'd call that a waste. Exhibit number one in the elephant's graveyard. Ever hear of that? They used to say there was a place where elephants go to die. Hundreds, thousands of them. A secret place off the beaten path. And there were bones and tusks. And once in a great while, someone would stumble upon it. Like the Sargasso Sea, where sailing ships caught in the kelp and were trapped forever. Well, maybe other travelers will end up here, gone to ground, never to move again. Eventually, there'll be a whole collection of them from all over. But remember, I was the first. I should scratch it in the metal. Cook was here. But I digress. This is still supposed to be my official report. The evaluation of the crash site coming up. The tail fin is all but covered by sand. Have to dig it out before the next storm. Then build some kind of windbreak or the whole ship might get buried. I could gather some branches, make one. There's more vegetation in the valley if I can get up and over. Now, that's odd. If there are no other trees in the immediate vicinity, where did this branch come from? The one that was banging against the hull last night. Unless something carried it here. The wind or a... Oh well, maybe I just didn't notice before. That must be it. Rocks to the left of me, rocks to the right of me. One very dry, broken off branch in the sand. And what great sand it is. None better in the known universe. On sale at closeout prices. 
Note the fine crunch under my boots as I walk the proud land. The rare texture, the superb body. Why, it's positively... What? What in the name of... It can't be. It looks exactly like... No, 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 it must be... I must be hallucinating, but... But this... Impression... I could swear it's it's a footprint, a, a boot print, to be precise. A lot like my boot, in fact. But it's not one of mine, about four inches shorter. But that's what it is. It is! N now hear this. Now hear this. I've got company. I've got company. Hey, whoever you are, come on down. It's open house at my humble abode. It isn't much, but it's home. Drinks on me. Meet your genial host. Please. Please let me see you. Here's another footprint. And another. And another. Where do they lead? Up the hill? Has to be since the storm. So there was something here. I knew it. Hey. Hey. I don't care who you are or where you're from. Let's shake hands and be friends. Don't you need a friend? I do. Come on, friend. We can talk. I've got some stories, believe you me. Where are you hiding? Behind that bush? Oh! Do that. Group seven, come in. Uh, got to get inside. All right, I'm ready for you. You want in? Maybe I'll let you, and maybe I won't. It's up to you. You can be friendly, or you can be dead. Hey, friend. You want to come in? 
Must be lonely out there. I hear you. What's the matter? Hungry? You're going to get a lot hungrier. Or don't you eat, friend? What do you say? Speak up. Can't talk, huh? No. You only know how to hit. Take more than that to put me down. What'd you use, a tree branch? Not very friendly, if you ask me. Well, I've got a nice piece of metal in my hand, and I know what to do with it. Won't catch me again. Uh, this has been going on for hours. I don't know about you, but I need sleep. I really need it. Understand? Sleep. And this king-sized bump on my head doesn't help. Tell you what, we'll make a deal. I give you one more chance to get away. Go hide, I don't care. You may not understand the language, but maybe you get the message. I'll wait a while and catch some sleep. Then when I wake up, I'm going to have a nice freeze-dried dinner. If I don't hear you out there, we'll forget the whole thing. You stay up the hill, and I'll stay down here. Just remember to keep your distance. Otherwise, I might have to come up there and teach you a lesson. A man's got to have his boundaries. Oh, God, I hurt. I want to sleep just for a while. Hey, friend. Gotcha. Stay down. Pretty weak, aren't you? Let's see who you really are. Itoko. Miyano. Manda. Manda. No. You're a woman? No, no, wait, wait, let, let's talk. Can't we talk about it? Do you understand anything I'm saying? Min, oh boy. Look, look, look. My name is Cook, Colonel Cook. I'm from another planet. I, I crash landed here, cracked up my ship. This is my ship, get it? Or it was. It can't fly anymore. Now I'm just a, a wingless spaceman with no place to go and all the time in the world to get there. All right, be that way. I'm not going to hit you. I'm putting my weapon down, see? Oh, what difference does it make? You're probably an illusion. and Those prints you left on the ground, they're, they're illusions too. I've been fighting a, a running battle between fear and loneliness and loneliness took the prize. You can disappear any time now. Any time at all. Go on. Poof. And a puff of smoke. No, wait. Wait, please. Are you real? This knot on my head certainly is. All right, all right. Do whatever you want. Just don't go. N not yet. If you can't understand, I'll draw you a picture. Where's the stick? Look. Right here in the sand. This is my solar system. The sun in the middle, and this is my world. See? Oh, oh, Mida? You got it. Now then, I went off course. I didn't have the power to get back. You know, power? Vroom, vroom. Ah, no good. So, I tried to land here, where we are. Oh. Ah. Oh, Mida Korum. Go ahead. 
You draw. Chrome, my stone. Oh, that's your solar system and your world. You came from there. Ah. Let me see now. It went out of orbit. Is that it? Your planet left its orbit and moved away from the sun. In the line, that's where you went and where oh. your world went, right? Oh. I'm sorry. Oh. What about now? Where's your planet now? Oh. 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 I understand. Gone. Disappeared. Probably frozen by now. But you got out. How many others? How many got out? You got away. Any others? Min. One finger. That's a hard count, my dear. A very hard count. And you've been here a while, haven't you? Look at your suit. Your galaxy might be light years away. It would have taken years to reach here. Where's your ship? Ship. Where's your ship? It crashed too, didn't it? So you've been here a long time, a very long time. Me, Cook. Colonel Cook. You? Cor. Corava. Corava? Corava. Well, what do you know? I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. How does it figure? I thought you'd be a 50-foot flesh-eating ant or something. And you turn out to be a woman. Which is neither here nor there. Because however you slice it, we're stuck here. A one-armed man and one very tired lady. Quite a pair. What have you been living on? What food? You understand food? Eat? Uh, uh. Uh, well, I can offer you lunch or maybe uh, it's breakfast. I'm not sure which. And some companionship. And we can spend the rest of our lives drawing diagrams in the sand. Which will be somewhat tedious. But the brighter of us will have to learn the other's language eventually. I hope it's you. Because I've got some stories to tell. Believe me. Come, Karava. Eat. Food. In the ship. Chow time. Come along. Inside. Eat. Food. Food. O Okawa? Okawa? No, no, no. Not that way. Come here. Food. Please come back. I'm not going to hurt you. Please. Okawa! Ah, oh, for heaven's sake. Korov, please. You scratched me. What did you do that for? That's all you know how to do, isn't it? Draw blood. Well, go ahead. Get away from me. It's not just language, is it? It's our animal nature, the way we instinctively respond to one another. In that case, there's not much hope. Go on. Go. If that's the way you want it, go. Base, this is Probe 7. The following is sent on faith, which is appropriate since this transmission is in the nature of a fairy story. I don't know under what heading you would classify it. Very likely space medicine or space opera. The long and the short of it is that I'm not alone here. There's a woman from another planet. Her name is Korova. I don't know much about her. I do know that she comes from another planet in another galaxy. A planet that left its orbit and moved out of space away from its sun. I suppose the inevitable happened. They just froze. She's not very old, so she must have been sent in a spaceship as a little girl. But now that ship is no more. 
They probably sent others too. God knows what happened to them. Died en route, lost their way, landed elsewhere, who knows. But somehow or other, she made it. Uh, perhaps uh, as a child on a preset course. She was here alone until I came. If by some chance you're still there, I can't send you any soil tests. I can't send you data about plant species or anything like that. But I can give you an observation about the psychological makeup of the animal kingdom. They're a frightened breed, a very frightened breed. It must be a, uh, it must be a universal trait wherever there are advanced life forms. Though it's questionable how advanced we really are, so I guess we aren't alone in that regard, which is really quite a pity, as you may understand all too well if any of you survived. Base, this is Probe 7, last call, absolutely, positively, the last. Over and out. Log entry, 1417. Well, the ship is history. I've left it for good. I finally made it up the hill and down the other side. And guess what? There's much more vegetation here. Fruit trees. Flowers as big as your head. And through it all, a stream of running water. I swear, it's like a garden. I brought what I need in a backpack. I'm going to set up shop on the banks of the river and try to live here, for better or worse. It will be the last great adventure. I only wish I could share it. Oh well, there's always posterity, if anyone should ever find this and play it back. Cook! Oh, you. I was... Never mind. Talking to myself. But uh, you wouldn't understand. Why don't you just keep your distance? Cook? Ah. Cook. Not going to hit me, are you? No? That's a surprise. Well, you're just in time to say bon voyage, friend. I'm going that way. There are even more fruit trees over there. No reason to get in each other's way. Cook. You want to come? You may, if you like. We'll eat and we'll live. I don't know how or for how long, but we can try. Cook. What? Dirt? Soil? What do you call it? Earth. Earth? What does that mean? Earth. Is that the name in your language? All right. We've just given this place a name. We'll call it that. We'll call it Earth. Cook. Korava. Earth. That's right. M my name's Cook. My first name is... But uh, there's plenty of time for that. No need to rush things. Okay, Korava. This is our home now. This is Earth. What is, what, what's that? Food. So that's what you've been eating. Some kind of red fruit. Any good? Food. Eat. All right. Hmm. Not bad. We'll take some with us. If you think it's all right. Come on. Uh, oh, I wanted to tell you something, but now I've forgotten. I guess we'll have plenty to talk about, though. This place... A new life, after all. And after a while, we'll have new memories to talk about. Things we can share. Come along, then. Let's go. This fruit's all right. Any other life forms around? I hope not, for the moment. But if there are, we'll make the best of it, won't we? Pleasant enough place, don't you think? My leg's better. We'll explore as much of it as we can. No need to set up any boundaries, I guess. There's plenty for everyone. For you and for me. And it's a beautiful day.
Do you know these people? Their names might be familiar were you to hear them. They lived a long time ago. Perhaps they're part fable, perhaps they're part fantasy. And perhaps the place they're walking through now is not really called Eden. That's for you to decide. We offer it only as a possibility and a presumption in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Probe 7, Over and Out, starring Lou Gossett Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Tony Maka Sr., Sam Derrens, and Oksana Fedanushin. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amare and Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. I did. Oh, come on, honey. You're not in that much of a hurry, are you? Yes. Well, clear the room then. Tell them they're keeping the head of McClellan Enterprises waiting. Tell them that we... All right, all right. You want to forget the whole thing? No, I don't want to forget the whole thing. I just want to get this nonsense over with. Send you a postcard. Oh, that would be wonderful. Bon voyage. Ta-ta. Yes, Tata. Come on. Um, hello. May I help you? Mr. Spirito? I am he. We're the Ransoms. My wife called for an appointment. Oh, yes. Please be seated. Now, where exactly do we intend to go? We intend to go to London. Splendid. Of course, you've been. Oh, no. <laughs> charming place. You have picked a rather bad time of year, though, but... Excuse me, we're kind of rushed today. I wondered if you'd... Uh, certainly. Now, have we decided on an airline? No. Well, then, if I may suggest... We're not going by plane. I beg your pardon? I said, we're not going by plane? Ooh, but you must, un unless you're planning this for some time in the future. No, it has to be right away. 
Oh, <laughs> then I'm afraid a ship would be out of the question. You see, it's the off-season, and the liners have all been booked up, or put on short runs. All of them? All the acceptable ones, yes. I hope you won't mind my saying this, Mrs. Ransom, but, you know, airplanes are perfectly safe nowadays. I realize that some people feel a certain trepidation, but there's absolutely no reason... Eileen, if it's the only way... May we see a list of boats that are running? <sighs> if you wish. You promised. I know. It's important, Alan. We agreed on that. I'm afraid these are the only passenger-carrying vessels bound for England in the next 30 days. Some are freighters, but uh, it's sometimes possible... What about this one? The Lady Anne? <laughs> I don't think so. Why not? Well, it's very nearly the oldest ship in the water, and the slowest. Thirteen days till a half. Another half day to Southampton. Forget it. No, wait. This says it leaves on Thursday. We'll take it. Please, Mrs. Ransom, the Lady Anne is a veritable antique. Listen to the man, Eileen. We can relax when we get there if that's what you want. Don't make such a big deal out of it. It is a big deal to me, Alan. A very big deal. Give us two tickets. For this relic? Yes, that's right. The Lady Anne. Oh... Very well. A few extra days won't matter, will they? I don't have anything better to do. Check okay? Of course, sir. But, uh, Mrs. Ransom, the Caravan Travel Agency takes pride in its service. I beg you not to do this. Well, it isn't going to sink, is it? With a ship that old, you... Can't tell what might happen. Oh, give me that check. Here. We'll pick up the tickets. Come on, Alan. You can go back to work now. Thanks for your help, Mr. Spierto. Very well. <laughs> bon voyage. Portrait of a honeymoon couple about to embark on a journey. Like most newlyweds, they've never traveled a great distance together, nor have they become truly acquainted. But there is a difference. These newlyweds have been married for six years, and they're taking this honeymoon not to start their life together, but to save it. Or so Mrs. Ransom believes. She's not sure why she insisted on an ocean liner, except that it will give them some much-needed time together, even if it is the Lady Anne. The tickets read New York to Southampton, but this old ship is bound for a very different port. Its final destination? The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story... Passage on the Lady Anne, starring Martin Jarvis and Rosalind Ayers with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Perfect. A foggy night. Can't even see the ship. Where is everybody? Already on board. We're a few minutes late. I was ready. If you hadn't taken so long packing... There it is! Oh, Alan, isn't it beautiful? <clears throat> no, not it. She. The ship happens to be a lady. Sorry. She's beautiful. Mm, indeed she is. Oh, yes. There's the uh, gangplank? Is that what they call it? Come on, Alan. I can hardly wait. I know. From the descriptions, we were expecting a cross between a kayak and the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> You're, you're seeing someone off? No, we're passengers. What? How's that? Passengers. 
Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I hardly think so. No, you see, this is the Lady Anne. Toby, please. You have no right to badger them. Yeah, be quiet, woman. Well... Now, now young fellow, uh, look here. If you'll consult your tickets, I think you'll find there's been a mistake. I repeat, this ship is the Lady Anne. And I repeat, there's no mistake. Show me your tickets. Why should I do that? Call it curiosity. Uh, do you mind? Go ahead, Alan. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Alan Ransom, New York to Southampton. You're not going to read the fine print, too, are you? Well, they, they seem to be in order. Thank you. It's good to know that. Well, there must be an error. Uh, this is um, a private passage, you might say. Uh, a mistake in booking. No, no, it's a terrible mistake. Come along, dear. But, Millie, I, I don't understand. I really don't. I said, come along, dear. Well, I guess that's how the British say welcome aboard. Oh, don't get your back up. You'll be twice as cranky when you're his age. Bet we can beat him up the ramp. Not too late to turn back, you know? I mean, think of being cooped up with me for 14 days. I made a promise and I'm gonna keep it. Isn't that good enough? Sure. Not very steady. Really gives you confidence, doesn't it? At least try to enjoy this. <clears throat> One moment, please. Your names? Ransom. Mm, uh, yes, yes, I, I see it on the list. Do you want to see our tickets, too? Everything seems to be in order, sir. Stateroom 24, down that flight of stairs. Thank you. Important. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, here we are. Yes, here we are. Good evening. I say... You're not going to let them do this, are you? I'm afraid it's out of my hands. Out of your hands? Well, we'll see about that. Got the luggage on board. It'll be waiting in our room. You'll see. It better be. We're due to take off in ten minutes. Take off? Sail. Disimport. I think it's disembark. Right. Alan, you have to admit, it's a real showpiece. Did you notice this carpeting? And the oil paintings? And brass everywhere. Great. Where's the bar? I could use a drink. Number 24. This is it. What in the... Alan, look! It's like an old-fashioned drawing room with a tapestry and gold... everything. <laughs> Pigeon's blood vases. Mm. I don't believe it. Are those plaster cupids on the ceiling? Oh, it's marvelous! And the canopy bed. Shaped like a swan. <laughs> It's got a goose feather mattress. Oh, Alan, isn't this fabulous? It's probably the most ridiculous room in the entire world. You realize that? Probably? It is! <laughs> and you actually like it. Don't you? Look at this chest. It must be a hundred years old. A bowl of fresh flowers on top. And even a box of candy. Shaped like a heart. At least the luggage is here. No kidding. You think we can take it for two weeks? I mean, with all this, this, this... There's the whistle. Come on, let's go up on deck. Why? Why? That's what you do. Haven't you seen any movies? Hurry. Those 
of the ones I mean, Burgess. Not the ones going with us? Yes, I tell you. Nonsense. Obviously a silly blunder. No, no, no. They have tickets. Calm yourself, Mackenzie. This needs to be settled at once. Very well. Here they come. Oh, hello. Hello. How do you do? Oh, very well, thank you. Now then, uh, no doubt you young people aren't aware that this is a rather, well, how should I say, private sort of cruise, you see. Very tight. Dear me, yes, unquestionably a slip-up on the part of the, uh... Look, mister, we're getting a little tired of this routine. Try to understand. There hasn't been any slip-up. This is our ship, and we are sailing to England on it. Her. Her. What did I tell you? They're determined. This is bad news. Very bad indeed. Oh, really? For you or for us? Don't argue with them, Alan. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, see here, uh, please, this may seem odd to you, but we are actually trying to be of help. Yes, exactly so. You see, there are things you don't know about this ship. Yes. But what does that mean? Well, for example, it isn't common knowledge that... Uh, yeah, Burgess, Burgess. No, Mackenzie. We've got to tell them. But, um... Uh, <clears throat> this vessel is over 50 <sighs> years old. We knew that. Oh, but there are other things you couldn't possibly know. Because you haven't had time <sighs> to look. Such as? Well, she's falling apart. Everywhere. The deck chairs wouldn't support the weight of a baby. <laughs> yes, that, that's true. And the staircase is about to collapse at any moment. And the food, oh, food, dreadful, dreadful. It's positively poisonous. Um, Tomin, you know. Yes. But the worst of it is the danger at sea. Those boilers, not to be trusted. They've been ready to burst for years. Oh, yes, 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 for years. So uh, you can see how impractical the whole idea is. Hmm. There's just one thing. Yes? If it's such an awful, dangerous ship, what are you doing on it? Hmm? What? No. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we're old and eccentric. Well, yes. <laughs> well, we're young and eccentric. We like impractical things, the challenge and all. Besides, we think it's an absolutely charming boat. Um, ah! Oh, last warning. They'll be pulling away the gangplank at any moment. Look, you'll, you'll be quite bored. We never get bored. Do we, Alan? Nope, not at our age. You're uh, sick, then. Yes, 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 you'll get sick. No stabilizers. She rides like a washing machine, I can tell you. Hmm, sounds like fun. I think I've heard about enough. Wait. I have my checkbook. What's that for? I am prepared to pay you double the amount of your tickets. This is ridiculous. No, I want to hear it. Pay us to do what? If you will abandon your plans... I'm sure you'll find another booking, something more suitable. That's a very generous offer. Yes, very much more suitable. Alan, you're not considering it, are you? Well, what do you say? Not a chance. Triple the amount, then. Yes, yes, triple, triple. Yes. No. Very well. I am forced to extremes. Sir, madam... If you will leave the Lady Anne at once, I will give you the equivalent of, um, let me see, uh, 50,000 American dollars. 50,000 American dollars, yes, uh, which uh, I will match. Well, I haven't got to go on me, but... I, I, Making I it a total of 100,000. Yes, 100,000. You're talking my language now, gentlemen. Alan! Let's say pounds sterling, shall we? In pounds? Or better yet, an even quarter million U.S. currency will be fine. Um, no, no, that amount is, is completely unreasonable. I'm sorry. Uh, no, 
In that case... But... but... Sorry. Let's go, honey. You must reconsider. You don't understand the implications. Look, fella. Ever since we picked this tub, people have been doing their best to discourage us. I don't know why, and I don't care. But if you're worried about brash Americans crashing your cozy little tea party... No, 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 no. It isn't that at all. Forget it. From now on, leave us alone. I'm proud of you. Thought I'd take the money, didn't you? Well, for a minute there, I didn't know. Oh, look! We're moving! Off to a great start. I could use that drink now. Me too. Too late. We did our best. We should have tried harder. Mm. But the funds he was demanding... <laughs> Highway robbery. Nevertheless, it was our duty. The duty of everyone on board. Who knows what the consequences will be. I fear we should have done whatever was necessary to keep them off this ship. It's almost 11. Hmm. Mm. Don't tell me you're nervous. We're not going to let two cranky old men spoil our second honeymoon, are we? A lot more than two. Mm hmm. Better get dressed. Fire drills in 15 minutes. What? inspection. Is that what they're doing? Apparently it's a safety requirement. Well, there was the Titanic. I picked up a few more names. The Mackenzies, of course, and Mr. Burgess. How could I forget? The one on the end is named Van Vlyman. Next to him is Mr. Bristow. Cooey! Hello there. Care to join us? Yes, do join us. Hello. <laughs> In a moment, Mrs. Mackenzie. You don't suppose that everyone else on this ship is... Everyone. I checked this morning. The youngest person I saw was 70. Oh, but that's silly. It must just be the first class section. There aren't any other sections. The entire ship is first class. You mean they're all... Show some respect. This group alone represents several thousand years. All for fire drill practice! Remember, Eileen... Getting there is half the fun. Chin up. Your life jackets. Oh, thank you. Uh, now then, as soon as you're all ready. I think the straps go over your shoulders. Like this? That doesn't look right. Psst. Do you need help, dear? Good morning, Mrs. McKenzie. As a matter of fact, you should put your arms through the hole. No, 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 no. Let them learn for themselves, dear. I was just trying to make it easier. <laughs> See you later, then. Yes. <laughs> Do the best you can. We look like a couple of clowns at a funeral. Now then, in the event the balloon should go up, the alarm will sound. Proceed to the Imperial deck in a calm, orderly fashion and await further instructions. The groups will be divided in the following manner. Group A, 
Mr. and Mrs. Huntley Small, Mr. and Mrs. Mackenzie, and Mrs. Scott Ailes. Imperial Lounge. Looks like we're in time for the noon orgy. Alan, I think it's elegant. Like a private club. That's the problem. We're not members. This isn't a ship. It's a floating rest home. Shh. You wish something from the bar. Do you suppose you could fix us up with two double martinis? Very dry? Yes, sir. Alan, I'm sorry. I didn't know it would be like this. But it doesn't matter that much, does it? We didn't want to mix with other people anyway. We wanted to... Stop saying we. If you'd listened to me, we'd be in London by now. And you'd be in a business meeting. Not necessarily. Yes. And it would be the same the next day and the next and... Oh, Alan. That's what this is all about. Don't you see? Your drinks. Thank you. Look, I know you've been unhappy, but do you think I enjoy working 28 hours a day? It comes down to the same thing, doesn't it? We never see each other. We never talk, or... I told you, after I close this deal, I'm going to start taking it easy. Which is what you said two years ago. You closed that deal, but it didn't make any difference. There were more deals. There'll always be more deals. Because that's all that matters to you now, isn't it? Bartender, another. Yes, ma'am. Try to control yourself. I have been controlling myself for six years, and I'm tired of it. I am tired of begging for little bits of your time. You're not interested in me anyway. You're interested in success. Fight your way to the top, and then fight to stay there. Stop making a scene. Why? Does it take your mind off mergers and board meetings? No, it takes my mind off the fact that we're supposed to be on a trip together. Come off it, Alan. You're going to England on business. I happen to be along. That's all. Why? Because I insisted. If I hadn't, you'd have gone alone. Isn't that true? Admit it. I can't talk to you when you're like this. You made me like this. Because the truth is, you don't care anymore. I was stupid to think that a few days together would make a difference. You're a flaming success now. Alan Ransom, the financier. And I'm the nagging wife who doesn't understand. Eileen, please. What's the matter? Are you afraid they'll catch on? Don't worry. They think we're a happy couple. Made for each other. Shut up. Yes, sir. Well, when this tub finally gets there, you can relax. Because I'll be leaving. That might be a good idea. Oh, it is. You'll have all those nice deals to keep you warm with no silly woman around. It should be marvelous. It will be. For now, I'll be on deck reading the Financial Times. Here's for the drinks. Excuse us. Oh, not you again. Well, yes. Well, uh, not really. How do you do, dear? Nice to see you, Mrs. McKenzie. If you don't mind, I'm trying to read the paper. Uh, yeah, um, um, my wife, um, uh, Millie, uh, yes. Um, 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 I, well, I say my wife, I, I mean we would very much like you to join us for tea, if, if you'd be so kind. Because I'm wearing my tweed jacket? No, hmm? no, no, no. no. <laughs> tweed jacket, I think. Yeah, I think we're very British. <laughs> no, no, we simply want we simply want to chat. Is it a date then? 
And, um, We'd be delighted. In about an hour? About an uh, hour, yes. Yes, in the Imperial Lounge. We'll see you there. And thank you. Mm, not at all. An hour, then. Yes. Jolly good. Looking forward. <laughs> Why did you do that? Because you and I don't have anything more to say to each other. You know it's true. We're finished. But you said it yourself, we're stuck here. So we might as well call a truce for now and make the best of it. Agreed. I'm so glad you could make it. Charmed, I'm sure. Ah, uh, do, do, do sit down. Do sit down. Uh, not at all. Um, <clears throat> nasty day. What? Um, <clears throat> now look. The reason for this meeting, apart from the pleasure of your company, is, um, uh, well... Uh, Go ahead, Toby. Uh, yes, yes, um, thank you. Um, Millie, yes, my wife, yes, 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 uh, 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 Millie pointed out that uh, we've all been, well, uh, something less than hospitable to you, if not rude. Uh, and so I, I expect I ought to apologize. And do you? Hmm? Oh, oh yes, 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 uh, most sincerely. But... You see, there is something more important. Uh, good news, in fact. Yes, uh, uh, we've been talking the whole thing over, and we've decided that you won't have to leave the ship after all. We won't? Say, that is good news. We were afraid we were going to have to swim back, and it's had us sick with worry. Really? Hmm? No. Nope. <laughs> oh, I see. It's, I see. It's not very good. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, my boy. But we were quite concerned, all of us, as I, I dare say you gathered. You see, it simply hadn't occurred to us that an outsider would ever want to travel on the lady. Well, the last time she, she took on a new passenger was, well, according to Captain Prothero, uh, was some 16 years ago. So, so you can... You can understand. Yeah, but never mind that. It's all settled now. What's all settled, Mr. McKenzie? Oh, no, we, we'll, we'll get to that in good time. You simply must forgive us. We can't have been very good company so far. Well, frankly... Yeah, the point is, we spent a good many fine hours, Millie and I, my wife Millie, uh, on, on this old, um, well, scowl. And when we heard they were going to retire her, well, it seemed right somehow that we should join her on her last return voyage. Yeah, absolutely. And the same is true of the others. Yeah, well, the other people. Yeah, and, and that's what accounts for the number of, of senior parties uh, aboard. We didn't understand. No. And you still don't, really. More tea? It's quite bracing. Yeah, I'll go. There's one thing that hasn't changed. Mm. Mm. Yes, tea is still the best in the world. What about the others, Mr. McKenzie? Hmm? Well, the others? Oh, oh, yeah, yes, uh, like us, as I said. Sentiment, you know. Of course they know, Toby. Why else would they have chosen the Lady Anne? Oh, yes, that's true. Our story isn't so different, I guess. My husband and I had never really been alone in six years. Excuse me. I'm going to get us a drink. Scotch all around? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> splendid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's embarrassed, isn't he? I seem to be doing that to him all the time now. You were saying the two of you hadn't been alone? Well, he's a busy man. You get wrapped up in things if you want to be the best, and... I don't know. When I heard he was going on a business trip to England, I made him promise to take me. Uh, 
But that doesn't explain the Lady Anne. No. No, I suppose it doesn't. Mostly it was the time. More days together. And, well, it just seemed kind of special. Oh, my dear, the Lady Anne is special. Very special. More special, I should say, than either you or your husband could imagine. You see, this is the ship Toby and I sailed on when we were married, which would be 53 years ago. 52. Yeah, she was a splendid thing then. Yeah, the ship, I mean. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Toby, really? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you told us it was an old rust bucket. Uh-uh, not it. She, she, yes. Oh, I should have been struck down by lightning for such a fearful lie. Mrs. Ransom, mark this. The Lady Anne was the finest ship that ever crossed the sea. Queen of the fleet, she was. Oh, yes, indeed. Is, Mackenzie, is. No other ship can touch her. Quite right. Uh, sit down, Burgess. This is an old companion of mine, Ian Burgess, Mrs. Ransom. Ah, oh, yes. Congratulations. Uh, I... I don't follow. I hear there's been a decision made in your favour. Not now. Nonsense. Quite a relief, I must say. What is? Why, what else? My good lady, you are in luck. How so? Well, haven't you told them? It's about you and your husband. It seems you won't have to die after all. Oh, I wept. I'm so sorry. What did you say? <laughs> he said you won't have to die after all. <laughs> yeah, of boredom, he means. <laughs> Well, don't stand there like a ninny, Ian, tea all over you. Yeah, but sit down, sit down. Um, yes, um, to be sure. Sorry, I seem to have spilled my tea. Uh, yeah, but, uh, well, uh, you see, uh, Mrs. R., um, she was the only one of her kind, specialised in honeymooners. That was her freight then, yes. Oh, yes, young people in love. Ah, uh, the drinks. Ah, yes. You see, that, that's what makes your presence so... Um, so... Uh, Sweet? Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Well, it was that. It, it certainly was that. Young married couples, you see. That's all you'd ever see. Full of, of juice and the moon in their eyes. All those children trying to act grown up and worldly and used to it. And everyone as nervous as a mouse. <laughs> yes. But that sort of thing, it lasted for only a few days. The Lady Anne gave them time to know each other. Oh, she was a wise ship. Cheers. 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 Everything was arranged for young people. Love has its own point of view, you know. It sees things larger than life. Nothing is too ornate or too fancy or too dramatic. If it is a good love, it demands the theatrical and then transfigures it, turns the grotesque into the lovely, as a child does. With it, we can see what we wish to see in people. Without it, we cannot see it all. We can search forever. <laughs> How a shipping line ever found that vision, I cannot imagine. But they made the Lady Anne into an enchanted gondola and took that moment of happiness and pure sweet pain all lovers have and made the moment live for two unspeakably pleasant weeks. Uh, <clears throat> well, they, they get the drift, my dear. There's no need to go gooey. <laughs> but I feel gooey. The same is true for all of us, actually. 
Paulshia Jones and his wife over there, the bald chap. Engineer in his day, and a good one. The Whiteways. Hmm. Next to them, Lord Bristow, with his cigar. Nice enough, but uh, he's getting old. And there's old Champion. Innis Champion, the writer, adventure stories, that sort of thing. Quite a droll fellow, though you wouldn't guess it now. Widower, you know. I and his wife. <laughs> there was a wild thing. She passed on in... Oh, can't be sure of the date. What about you, Mr. Burgess? The same. We'd planned this trip together, but... Have you a picture? In my breast pocket, over my heart. She's very beautiful. Ah. Oh, my dear, please. This is purely temporary. I shall be with her soon. I'm so sorry. Oh, there, dear. It's all right. None of it really matters if you're in love. You are in love, aren't you, Mr. Ransom? Yes, of course. Well, that's the only thing that counts, you know. Everything else perishes. <laughs> now you've made her cry. Oh, perfectly all right. I cry all the time, don't I, Toby? All the time. Well, I don't. Why don't you two go out and get some fresh air? Do you good? Fog or no fog? That might be a good idea. Yes. We'll see you later. Of course you will. I think they're all very, very nice. The sun. What about it? It's behind us. It was over there, and now it's... We're heading north. So we're heading north. We should be heading east. Blame it on me. Everything else is my fault. Why not this? There you go. Starting again. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Look at them down there playing shuffleboard. Or sitting. Wrapped up in their blankets. Really, Eileen, this whole idea was ridiculous. Eileen? Eileen, where are you? Eileen? Eileen! I thought you did get rather gooey there, my dear, but you know, I rather liked it. <laughs> gooey. <laughs> oh! Oh, Mr. Ransom. Uh, I say, is something the matter? I can't find my wife. We were standing over there at the rail. She was right behind me. You don't think anything could have happened to her, do you? Oh, I, I doubt that. It, it's rather difficult to fall overboard. Oh, yes, yes. Eileen. Eileen. Have you seen my wife? Uh, uh, no, sir, but I, I wouldn't worry. I want this ship searched. I'll take the liberty of alerting the crew. Uh, have you tried the library? Eileen? Uh, not here, sir. But she's got to be somewhere. Uh, still looking, sir. Haven't you found her yet? Easy, sir. We'll... we'll let you know. Eileen? Eileen, where are you? I say, not 
turned up yet? No, I searched everywhere. She'll turn up. Have a nip with me. Come on, boy. Uh, let's go inside. Uh, yeah, maybe she, she's inside. Come on. Let's go into the Imperial Lounge, what? Two whiskies, make them strong. I can't believe it. She's gone. Well, it does seem that way. <laughs> But of course it isn't so. You've just missed her. You don't know how much. A toast to the Lady Anne. Here, here. Oh, yes. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Lady Anne. Mm. Yes. It's a pity. What's going to happen? A crime. An evil, black-hearted crime. Easy, Burgess, easy. Easy? Gad, they want to scrap the lady. Outlived her usefulness. Nonsense. A little slow, perhaps. Speed. That's all that counts now. Why? What's the rush, eh, Ransom? I... see your point. Freddy, another gin. That's the state of the world today. It's a plot. Doubtless of communist origin. Who wound him up? Burgess, do sit down. Haven't you eyes, man? The Lady Anne was condemned because she represents a better way of life. She's grace and manners and tradition. She's the Empire. Oh, I say, somebody turn him off. Silence, Adicott. The beasts are at the gate, and we stand about like statues, with our medals gone to rust and our swords broken. Soon they'll reach up their hairy hands and pull the queen down from her throne. Scrap the lady? They'll scrap the world! Poor chap. He'll feel better later at the party. Another drink, Mr. Ransom. Mr. Ransom? You mean you were here all the time? But I've been searching for you. I'm here. I've always been here. Oh, Eileen. Are you drunk? Maybe so, or maybe this is the first time in six years that I've been sober. What's that you're wearing? The nightgown? Oh, Mrs. Mackenzie gave it to me. She wore it on her honeymoon. It's beautiful. You're beautiful. This whole stupid world is beautiful. What happened to you? I don't know, but I'm going to try not to forget. I'm going to try very hard. Oh, Alan. Will you look at all this? Balloons, ribbons. Over here! Join us, please! <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Mackenzie! Oh, come on, drink up. The champagne's getting warm. <laughs> well, you found her. Oh, you're as bad as Alan. I think we'd like you to meet Captain Prothero, Mr. and Mrs. Ransom. Happy to meet you, sir. My pleasure. You've had a pleasant voyage, I trust. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're grateful to be a part of it. Indeed. Your presence has been good for us as well. 
You packed your things? Shh, shh, shh. But they don't know yet. Oh, well, I uh, suppose it doesn't matter. Know what? Nothing important. If you'll excuse me, I have to make some preparations. Be back shortly. You look positively radiant, my dear. The Lady Anne has worked her magic on you. She... and you. All of you. I'd forgotten some things. How to relax. I was so busy, I... Well, I lost sight of what's important. It won't happen again. I say, let's drink to that. Have the engines stopped? Oh, no, nothing to worry about. Cheers. Mr. Burgess, why are we having a party now? We're only part way there. You'll understand soon enough. Who needs a reason to party? Mrs. Ransom, may I have this dance? I have been waiting for someone to ask. Mrs. McKenzie? I'm not very good, but... Oh, delighted, Mr. Ransom. <laughs> oh, splendid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see they haven't gotten them fixed. What? The engines. The engines? No, oh, there's nothing wrong with the engines. Ready now? Your luggage has been collected. Luggage? Really? Should have told them. Didn't want to spoil the party. Excuse me, but what are you talking about? Why should our luggage be moved? Because, my friends, we're putting you off the ship. You're what? Are we in trouble? No, no, nothing like that. They'll come to understand. Maybe so, but we don't understand now, and we're not going anywhere until we do. I'm afraid there isn't any choice. Follow me, please. Uh, Ellen? Is this some kind of gag? You don't just put passengers off a ship in mid-ocean. Stuart! Captain! Draw your pistol. Yes, sir. You're kidding, aren't you? If you'll do as the captain says, this way. I tell you what, we'll all go. Ellen, what's going on? You can't be serious. There's nothing to worry about, my boy. Your exact position has been radioed. Even now, help is on the way. Alan, I'm not kidding. Captain, this is outrageous. Your luggage is in the boat. Flowers, a tin of biscuits. And champagne, if I thought of that. The lifeboat sends out a signal so you'll be picked up straight away. Everything you need, really. Except a reason. It's time we were off. Into the boat with you! No, please, I... But why? Is it something we've done? Not a bit of it. Then tell us! You can't do this without a reason! Cause, my boy, you can't go with us. Not yet. Yes, come along. Not where we're going. <laughs> no, no, no. Step carefully, please. We liked you people. We thought you liked us. They do, Alan. Don't you see? Blow it away. Don't forget the blankets. Alan, look. Everyone's at the rail. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. I see. What are those papers, dear? They're your letters, Toby. Don't you remember, dear? I've kept them for so long. You're throwing them overboard. They deserve a proper burial at sea. I won't be needing them now, will I? <laughs> no, dear. Not anymore. Listen, the engines are starting again. They're moving. 
And so are we. We will. <laughs> I promise you. Here's a blanket. I don't need it. Aren't you cold, darling? Not with your arms around me. I don't think I've ever felt so warm in my life. Do you think we'll see them again? Yes. In fact, I'm sure of it. Lady Anne never reached port. The ransoms were picked up by a cutter a few hours later, just as the captain promised. They searched the newspapers but found no mention of the Lady Anne. The ship, with all its crew and passengers, went down in the mid-Atlantic, or so it was said. But Alan and Eileen knew better. They knew it had sailed on to a better port, its final destination on a distant shore called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Passage on the Lady Anne, starring Martin Jarvis and Rosalind Ayres, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Pasquese, Anne Soneville, Jim McCants, Joby Cerny, Eleanor Weingart, Martin Astro, and Nick Ruddle. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Lamari and Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. This is Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here's to Michael Franklin, in honor of the most stunning, ruthless stewardship of a corporate takeover I've ever seen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, everyone. And may I just say, I absolutely deserve it. <laughs> I know you've had your eye on that corner office for some time. Well, it's yours. Mm, actually, Alan, 
Uh, I have my eye on the corporate suite. <laughs> That's my office. Exactly. Careful, Michael. Your ambition is showing. <laughs> well, my ambition is what made this deal happen. My ambition is what allows our billable hours to skyrocket every quarter. And my ambition is what will eventually lead me to not only your office, Alan, but to your company-paid condo, your company-paid Mercedes, and your company-paid weekly $200 haircuts and manicures. Uh, I have to admit, you had me going there, Michael. I have no doubt that someday you will occupy my seat in the company. Uh, We'll have to wait and see what the future holds. Tut, tut, no harm in celebrating. Uh, Speaking of the future, check out that wild-looking old woman sitting behind the table. Ah, Wearing that colorful headscarf with all the jewelry? She looks like a contestant for best Halloween costume. No, I think she's telling fortunes. See how she's looking at that guy's hand? Let's go see what she has to say. Alan, (laughs) you don't believe in this stuff, do you? Of course not. It's just for fun. On the other hand, maybe she can give us a hot tip for our next takeover target. I see there are two more supplicants who wish to learn about their futures. Make that one supplicant? Uh, I'm not playing. Oh, go ahead, Michael. What can it hurt? I put my faith in real things, Alan, <laughs> like profits and a well written prospectus and a robust return on an investment dollar. And people? <laughs> people are the least reliable things on the planet. Well, anyway, I'll spring for your reading. How much is it, please? For this most rare and deep connection to the mystic masters of the cosmos, the charge is five dollars. Five dollars? It's highway robbery. (laughs) All in good fun and worth five bucks to find out what's next for the amazing Michael Franklin. There you are, my good woman. The mystic masters thank you. Yeah. But they do. Please be seated and give me your right hand. What's wrong with my left hand? The right hand crosses the body's meridian, connecting directly to the humors of the heart through the intercession of the soul. I'll say this for you. (laughs) You've got the sales pitch down pat. Please close your eyes and focus your thoughts on your inner golden light. I would have guessed that green is your color. Michael, quiet. All right, I'm quiet. I'm focused. Watch as the golden light moves toward you. Slowly, it surrounds your consciousness. Surrender to its mystery. I never surrender. The mystic masters perceive you as a man who values work above all else. (laughs) She's got that right. She could have said the same thing about anybody in this bar. There are people in your past who have suffered a disconnection with you. Spirits are left unsatisfied. Well, it can't be old girlfriends. He doesn't take time to go on dates. Mm. Your soul is troubled. Uh, my soul is just fine. Thank you very much. There's something strange. I am attempting to discern your future. But I cannot. I could have told you that. <laughs> no offense. What's the matter? The reading is over. What? Hey, we paid you to tell us fortune. Here is your money back. I cannot complete the reading. Now look, lady, (laughs) 
I don't believe in all this hocus pocus, but a deal's a deal. Just tell me I'm going to be the richest man in the world and you can keep the five bucks. I do not take lightly the readings of the soul. I'm going to go complain to the manager. Alan, hold on, Alan. Look, we don't want to cause you any trouble, lady, all right? Just say what's on your mind, and we'll leave. Very well. I will tell you what the mystic masters have divined. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. What is it? Alan's going to fire me? (laughs) I'm going to lose my hair? Your future is very clear, and it is this. In ten days, you will be dead. What? Mm. (laughs) I don't think that's very funny. (laughs) The signs are serious, and the reading is true. What kind of scam is this? Come on, Michael. Don't let her ruin your night. You know, lady, we were humoring you by coming over here. The least you could do is play along and not be such a downer. I did not wish to reveal your fate. You insisted that I do. When the clock strikes midnight on the tenth day to come, you will be dead. Uh, And now what? And no, (laughs) don't tell me. Uh, Let me guess. Uh, Oh, yeah, I pay you another five bucks, and you tell me how I can avoid this terrible fate. That is impossible. Your fate is sealed. Let's go get a beer. Come on, Michael. Fine. It's been a real pleasure spending time with you, ma'am. Alan, I'm heading home. I got some paperwork to finish anyway. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Suddenly, I don't know, I've just ah, lost my desire for celebration. <laughs> okay, buddy. See you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. I'll be dead in ten days. I'll be dead in ten days. Ha! Huh. Jeez, yeah. Con artist. Hey. Come on. Oh, where's a taxi when you need one? Oh. Hey, taxi! Taxi over here! Hey, where to, buddy? Take me to. Take. Hey, pal, you okay? feel uh, dizzy. You don't look so good. I I need... Hey. Hey, buddy. Oh, my gosh, he passed out. Gotta get him to the hospital. Mr. Franklin, can you hear me? Where am I? Where am, where am I? Ah, you. Uh, you're in the emergency room at Samaritan Hospital. What? What, what happened? What's, what's going on? Easy, easy, please. Don't try to sit up right away. You're still recovering from the anesthesia. Anesthesia? Yes. For, for what? You were brought here because you passed out in a taxi cab. Do you remember that? Um, vaguely. We performed some tests on you. Blood pressure, heart. Everything was normal. Hmm. Well, then, I don't get it. Then why am I... I... In, an, in an abundance of caution. We gave you an MRI. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we found something unusual. Oh. Well, what does that mean? There's a dark spot on the X-ray of your brain. We... We don't know what it is until we perform more tests, of course, but I must impress on you. This is a very serious situation. Well, what happens next? Well, I'd like to check you into the hospital for further procedures. 
We can consider options for chemotherapy and radiation right away. But... but I feel fine. I, I'm in great shape. Cancer has no respect for those issues, I'm afraid. How long do I have? A, a few years? Uh, given the size of your anomaly, I suspect that your prognosis is dire. And how long? Is that six months? It could be a matter of days. I'm very sorry, Mr. Franklin. I will send the nurse in to take your information, all right? Days, wait. The old woman in the park, she was right. I'll be dead in ten days. Portrait of a man frozen in the amber of fear. Michael Franklin, workaholic captain of industry, ruthless to his enemies and dismissive of routine human interaction. Given a prognosis that would send a chill of terror down the spine of the most stalwart of men, he is faced with the rising specter of his own mortality. But even worse, he stares into the rear view mirror of a life only half lived. Devoid of true friendship, with only a string of consummated business deals to mark his measure, Michael Franklin is about to embark on a frightful journey of self-examination that can only be experienced in the land between regret and insistent memory, a land we like to call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, 10 Days, starring Ned Bellamy with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Uh, nurse, what happened to the patient who was in this bed, Mr. Franklin? I just saw him a moment ago, doctor. I have no information about his condition. Oh, I certainly hope he isn't about to do something foolish. Is Alan in yet? Oh, yes, Mr. Franklin. He's... Are you all right, Mr. Franklin? I'm fine. I don't believe I've ever seen you in the office without shaving or changing your clothes from yesterday. I was in a hurry this morning. Is he in a meeting? He just finished a call. Uh, fine. I'll only need a minute. Oh, but he's got another appointment at... I'll only be a minute. Michael, you look like you haven't been to sleep all night. Isn't that the suit you wore yesterday? Don't tell me you went out to celebrate without me. Alan... I quit. <laughs> yeah, me too. Alan, listen to me. I'm quitting. This is some kind of joke, right? I would appreciate it if you would expedite the disposition of my account. I want to close out my portfolio. I'm cashing in my stocks. I need my retirement funds and my annual bonus. Every bit of it. Michael, you're talking crazy. What are you doing? What's this all about? What part didn't you understand? I mean, you can't just quit. But... <laughs> I just did. What on earth for? Personal reasons. Personal reasons? After all these years of working together, you offer me that? Correct. Michael, if this has something to do with that crazy old woman who told your fortune last night... It's not that. I just... I just decided to take my career in a different direction. I've... I've just been thinking about making this move for a long time. I don't believe you. Alan, no offense. But I don't care if you believe me or not. I've made my decision, and I'd like you to honor it. You realize that if you disassemble your corporate portfolio early, there will be substantial penalties. Not to mention the perks you'll be losing. The company car, the country club membership, the center court basketball tickets. Can you have the accounting department wrap everything up right away? Oh, and I'd appreciate all of the various income streams to be folded into one check. <laughs> that check will be worth several million dollars. Yes. Well... I can't say I approve of what you're doing, and I can only hope you have a good reason, even if you won't tell me. 
Could you make the call, please? I'm in a bit of a hurry. After 12 years, I don't see why there's such a... Uh, y yes, this is uh, Alan Fisher in corporate. I have a... Well, it's an unusual request. Michael Franklin has decided to leave the firm, and he wants all of his outstanding monies gathered into one check for immediate pickup. Yes, I understand the amount is substantial. Very good. He'll be right there. All right, Michael. The check is being... Michael? Michael? Where did he go? You, sir? I'd like to buy a ticket to Rome, please. Leaving today. Very good, sir. And on what date would you like to return? Uh, just a one-way ticket, please. I just love Rome. The sights, the food, the museums. It's a banquet of... Uh, yeah, I'm in a hurry. Please. If you'll just sign here. Will you prefer a window or an aisle seat? Surprise me. Mr. Franklin, welcome to the Grand Hotel Rome's premier destination. Our presidential suite has been prepared, all three fireplaces are ablaze, the champagne is on ice, and your veranda opens onto the courtyard where Rome's finest string quartet is waiting to play for you. And of course, an entire staff of valets are at your disposal. And the concert tickets for this evening? The limousine will gather you at 6 o'clock. You will be driven directly to the private entrance where a personal elevator will whisk you to the ambassador's box. Only the finest for you, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> Bravo! Wonderful! Excuse me, Mr. Franklin. The young lady in the next box I sent this fine wine to you. Uh, well, please ask the lady if she would care to join me. Right away, Mr. Franklin. I haven't seen you at the theater before. Do you come to Roma very often? <laughs> You might say this is a, a once-in-a-lifetime vacation. <laughs> I want to see him d do everything. All the finest foods, all the finest wines. I, I want to hear the best music and experience all the riches the, the world has to offer. <laughs> all at once? <laughs> Why settle for the ordinary when we can fill our lives with the amazing? Oh, you are a man of action. Speaking of action, would you care to dance? <laughs> I would love to dance, but not here. There's a fabulous nightclub in the center of the city, very exclusive. The limousine awaits. <laughs> what a wild dancer! <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. It's a, it's a champagne. You're so funny. <laughs> I believe I'm slightly tipsy, too. Oh, uh, tipsy? What does it mean? It means I've had too much to drink, which means I'll probably have a ferocious hangover tomorrow. Oh, that is too bad. Oh, but no worries. The, the way to prevent a hangover is to keep drinking. More champagne! More champagne! <laughs> More champagne! And more dancing! And more dancing! <laughs> Michael, are you sure you can afford to buy drinks for the whole restaurant? That's only money. 
And, and look how much fun they're having. Look how much fun I'm having. <laughs> waiter, waiter, another round for my friends. A three cheers for a friend of Matthew. It's Michael. Okay. Cheers, cheers for, for Michael. 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 Michael, are you able to walk? It's not me. It's the streets that keep moving. You dance the night away. And we'll do it again tonight. The sun rises over the ocean. If I see a million mornings, I never grow tired to seeing that sight. Imagine if you only had a few more to see. I'm sorry, what did you say? I, I said, would you care for some breakfast? I'm starving. Then let's go to the best restaurant in the city and order everything on the menu. I've never met a man like you, Michael. If you want something, you just take it. <laughs> of course. What's that old saying? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Michael, what's wrong? You look sad. Did I say something wrong? Maria, I wanted to ask you something. What is it, Michael? Would you care to join me on a small trip? Where to? Oh, I know a charming village near here. We could have a picnic. Actually, what I had in mind was, was Paris. Paris, France. And, and then London. And then Monte Carlo, or, or, or Moscow, or, or Hong Kong. I mean, we could go anywhere in the world. But what will we do when we get there? Whatever we want. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you diamonds or a new car. Would you like a new car? Michael, you're making my head swim. I don't need a new car or diamonds. What then? A, a yacht? My life is here, in Roma. I can't just pick up and leave to go hopping from one country to the next. Why not? You just said you admired me for that very thing. I admire your freedom, but... I have responsibilities. My parents are here, my friends. Well, that'll be one phone call away. I can't just leave. You can do anything you want to, just like me. Don't you have anyone you feel responsible to? <laughs> we were discussing breakfast. Breakfast, that's what we need. Michael, I asked you a question. Come. We'll order the most expensive breakfast in town and the most expensive restaurant. We'll have them serve us eggs on, on plates made of gold. I'm not really hungry. Where are you going? Where are you going? I have things to do. But, but what about Paris, London? You're willing to give all that up? If I left with you, then I would be giving up something. Like what? My life here. It's who I am, the people I love, the friends I have. So, window dressing, none of that is important. And what do you think is important? I am, and what I want. I see. Goodbye, Michael. Fine! I'm parents by myself. <laughs> There's lots of beautiful women there, too! Bonsoir, Monsieur Franklin. Welcome to Paris. Your suite is prepared for you with a view of the Seine and a bottle uh, of... A bottle of champagne on ice. Right? May we? <laughs> what did you say your name was? My name is Angelique. Uh, uh, I'll call you Angel. My uh, beautiful French Angel. What about you, my dear? I am called Giselle. Ah, Giselle. 
Giselle, I knew her well. <laughs> oh, you are so silly. <laughs> I'm Michael. <laughs> but why don't you call me Mike? <laughs> Nobody ever calls me Mike anymore. Not since I was a little boy. Were you as naughty then as you are now? I was a good boy. Very smart. In fact, I was smarter than everybody. Did you know that? I was better than all of them. <laughs> oh, you are a good person, Mike. Nobody ever bought me a pearl necklace on the same day I met them. Mm -hmm. I'll buy you another one tomorrow. <laughs> Hey, we need more caviar here, Garçon! More caviar, s'il vous plaît! But Mike, we have two bowls full on the table already! They're ten minutes old! We need fresh caviar! Frickin' caviar! Ooh. Let's Whoa. dance! Whoa. Welcome to London, Mr. Franklin. Your suite has been prepared for you and... Bottle of champagne and ice, got it, got it, got it. Let's say, just on, on second thought, cancel my room. Book me on a flight to Monaco. I got an itch to gamble. Uh, uh, right away, sir. And the number is 29, Greg. Don't worry about it. It's only money, and there's plenty where that came from. Hey, another 10,000 in chips, please. Is the gentleman sure he has already lost several hundred thousand dollars? If the gentleman wanted to hire a babysitter, the gentleman would have done so. You understand? As the gentleman wishes. Mr. Franklin. Good morning, Mr. Franklin. Mr. Franklin? Hello? Uh, Mr. Franklin, your brunch is here, sir. Shall I place the champagne bottle next to the bed? Shall you... shall you... who are you? Yeah. Where am I? I am Captain Philippe Duchette. This is the Fandango Dancer. The luxury yacht you rented last evening. I, re I rented? Was I alone? The gentleman was escorted by several very attractive ladies, and uh, there was a request for the boat to take you to Australia. But, as you may know, that trip is beyond the range of this vessel. I wanted you to take me to Australia. <laughs> After we received the Alaskan crab, Russian caviar, and of course, the champagne. Uh, I hope I never see another glass of champagne. What shall I do with the cases that are on the deck? <laughs> How many cases did I order? Ten. <laughs> They're yours. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Do you wish to proceed with the cruise? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Very good, sir. All right. For a week, I've eaten the finest foods, drunk the most expensive champagne. I've slept in the most exquisitely comfortable beds with the most luxurious silk sheets. I've, I've held beautiful women in my arms. I should be the happiest man on earth. I should have a permanent grin tattooed on my face. Why am I so miserable? Uh, I'll have a few days left to live. A few days. I need to be... I need to be somewhere where someone knows me, where I... where I don't have to pay for the company of people. I need to go home. I need to go home.
Taxi! Taxi over here! Hey, where to, mister? 1020 Clark Street. Hop in. Look like that wind was gonna take you away, mister. We flew in through the storm. It was quite a bumpy landing. Well, it'll probably blow over soon. Say, I don't think I've seen you around here before. Well, I haven't lived here for quite some time. That must be it then. Oak Grove being such a small town and all, I know just about everybody around. Yeah, yeah, well, as I, as I said, it's been a few years. Just visiting? Uh, that's right. Family? Mm, not, not really. What'd you say your name was? I, I didn't, but it's, it's Michael Franklin. Your dad was the high school teacher. That's right. Oh, I don't think I remember seeing you at the funeral. What was it, uh, four years ago? Uh, I wasn't here for the funeral. You didn't come to your own father's funeral? <laughs> Not that it's any business of yours, but <laughs> I had meetings in Japan and I uh, couldn't fly all the way back here. Is that all right with you? Is it okay with you? Look, if you don't mind... You'd prefer if I'd stop flapping my gums, right? <laughs> well, I wasn't going to put it like that. <laughs> Not to worry. The wife says I'm 99% hot air. It's just that I've been flying for the better part of 24 hours jet lag and all that, you know. Well, say no more. My lips are sealed. Anyway, here we are. 1020 Clark. Let me help you with your bag. It's all right. I can manage. Here you go. Keep the chain. Uh, mister, do you know you just paid me with a $50 bill? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Well, you have yourself a really fine day. Because I sure will. And you be careful in that wind, you hear? Uh, well, something tells me it's not the wind I'll have to worry about. Uh, here it goes. Hi, Carrie. Surprise. Michael? What are you doing here? It's, it's a long story. Um, may I come in? Well, I... It's pretty windy out here. I suppose so. Thank you. Michael, what's going on? You just show up on my doorstep after four years? Well, you know me. Spur of the moment. You are not a spur of the moment person. You plan everything in your life. I wouldn't be surprised to find that you plan how many times you blink every day. Well, the truth is, I, I don't have any place else to go. That sounds dramatic. It's true. What about the penthouse? It's gone. The beach house? Gone. They're all gone. I... I sold everything. I thought you went through your midlife crisis when you left me. Apparently, it's still going on. Please, Carrie. I don't want to fight. Then what do you want? I, I just... I just wanted to see you again. You just wanted to see me. Okay, you see me. Now what? Do, do you mind if we, we sit down? Michael, I have to be at work in an hour, and I'm in the middle of a term paper. You went back to school. I'm getting my master's. That's wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, you planned it for years. It's, it's, it's great that, that you finally decided to do it. Yeah, well, if there's nothing else on your mind... So, uh, how have you been? Busy. I don't have a lot of downtime, but that's how I like it. You, 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 you redecorated things here. You redecorated the house. I needed a fresh start after you left. Oh, well, Carrie, about that, I, I'm so... If you're about to apologize, please don't. I've already more than paid you back by thinking the most horrible thoughts any person could think about another person. I guess I deserve that. Oh, you have no idea. How could you just walk away from a marriage, Michael? 
What was so terrible that you couldn't stand up like a man and fight for me? For us? It wasn't about you, Carrie. Oh, that's good to know. Because when I was picking up the pieces, when you left, it sure felt like it was about me. What I mean is that uh, I wasn't a good husband. True. You were always working. And I knew that I wouldn't be a good father. True. You never even walked the dog. So, I didn't give up on you. Or us. I gave up on myself. Well, that makes everything all better. You can go now. Carrie, please. Oh, I could just clobber you for coming back here. It isn't fair for me to have to dredge up these old feelings again. Well, maybe a civilized conversation without any bickering would do both of us some good. I don't think so. Please, Carrie, it's more important than you know. For what purpose, Michael? So you can go back to your high-powered, big-shot job in the city and feel good about yourself? I just don't want to leave loose ends. Please, for, for better or for worse, can we, can we just talk? I'm not looking for forgiveness, just closure. Well... One cup of coffee? I'll, I'll even make it. All right. One cup, and I'll make the coffee. Yours always tasted like motor oil. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you quit your job, sold your homes, and now you're here. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, about that. I, I guess I just realized that being a workaholic isn't very much fun, after all. But that's all you know. When we were married, you barely slept at night. You were up early to track the Asian stock market. You stayed up late to finish paperwork. I can count on one hand the number of times we actually went out on anything resembling a date. And even when we did go out, you acted like it pained you to be away from your business calls. That is all over now, Carrie. Money doesn't mean a thing to me. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> believe it. It's true. So, what? You're gonna take up oil painting? Or become the stand-up comedian you always wanted to be? Nothing like that. Actually, actually, it's quite serious. Last week, I... What was that? It came from the living room. Oh, the tree! The wind knocked the tree into my house! Carrie, wait a sec, wait a sec, Carrie, don't go over there. It might be dangerous. That's a tornado warning! Oh my god! The house across the street! The roof just caved in! Alright, look, let's get into the basement. The power just went out! I have flashlights downstairs! Wait, outside, look! What? Michael, come on, there's no time! Oh, look, in the street, there's a kid in a bike. <gasps> oh no! That's Jimmy from next door! He doesn't know which way to go. Oh, Michael, he's going to be hurt. Uh, I'll get him. Michael! What are you doing? Michael! Jimmy! Jimmy, keep your head down! That's it. Jimmy, I'm coming for you! Help me! I'm right here, buddy. I'm right here. I'm gonna carry you into the house, okay? What about my bike? I'll get you a new one. Let's get out of the storm, okay? Okay. Put your arms around my neck and hold on! I'm trying! Squeeze real tight, Jimmy! I'm scared! And I'll be brave for the both of us, Jimmy! Okay? Get the door open! Michael, I can't budge it. Carrie, push! Push as hard as you can! I'm... Carrie, push! Pushing! Harder! As hard as you can! There, you got it! We made it! We made it! Into the basement! Come on! Come on, Jimmy. That's it. Let's go get safe. Okay. Storm's cleared. It's over. Is the wind gonna get me? 
No, honey. You're safe. Look. <laughs> that car. It's been overturned. At least there's no more damage to the house. Mom! Jimmy! Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy, we didn't know where you were. We had him in the basement, with us. I was so scared. And then the wind came, and then this man came and saved me. You saved my Jimmy? Well, not really. Yes, you did, Michael. You ran right into the path of the tornado and brought him inside. Oh, come here and let me give you a hug. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Oh. How can I ever thank you? You don't have to. It was my pleasure. Is our house okay, Mom? Yes, sweetie. We were very lucky. Jimmy, you're a very lucky little boy. Yes, and thank you again for my son's life. Yeah, thanks. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Michael, you saved Jimmy's life. You're a hero. I, I didn't even have time to think. I, I just saw him and ran. It was still amazing. When the chips were down, you really came through. I'm proud of you. Oh, look. look at the damage in your living room. No, it's okay. All of that can be fixed. The main thing is that we're all safe and healthy. Right. Listen, Carrie. Those repairs? They're gonna be expensive. I have insurance. Oh, yeah, but that will only cover the basics. Let me take care of the costs. Michael, you don't have to do that. No, but I want to. And I can afford it. But you can't just drop that kind of money on a problem that isn't yours. And listen, all I know is that when I helped Jimmy just now, it felt good. It, it felt better than anything I've done for a long time. And, and the idea of helping you out with bills feels good, too. So please, just let me do this. Well, I'm not in a position to turn down a gift like that. But what about you? Before the storm hit, you were about to tell me something. You said it was serious. It, it doesn't matter now. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Here, here, let me write you a check before I leave. Are you going so soon? You just got here. Yes, yes, I... I... <laughs> I think I got what I was looking for. Here. Here you go. Now listen. Don't you look at it until I leave, okay? I promise. Where are you going? I have some business to finish. Goodbye, Carrie. Goodbye, Michael. A million dollars? Michael! Michael! Yes? What is it? Forget the late hour, Reverend. Uh, I, I realize it's nearly midnight, but I wanted to visit the chapel and the, and the door's locked. Unfortunately, in these times, we must protect ourselves against theft. The doors remain locked overnight. Is there any way I could just go inside for a few moments? No, I'm sorry. If you can come back in the morning, yeah. But you see, uh, tomorrow morning will be too late. I, I only have tonight. Mm-hmm. It always seems that way, my son. But have a little faith. Please. Go home. Get some sleep. I don't have a home anymore. I, I've just come in from the airport. I, I, I came straight here. Please, it's, it's, it's more important than you know. All right. You seem to be in great need. Thank you. Thank you, Father.
Yeah, it, it, it's one of these. Ah, here we go. I'll come back in ten minutes. I won't need more than five. And now that I'm here, I don't know what to say. It's been a long time since I've set foot in a place like this. In fact, I can't remember the last time. I, I suppose it's true, people come back when they're in trouble, but I'm not exactly in trouble. In fact, all my troubles will be over in just a few minutes. Then why am I here? Maybe I just wanted to see if I could find a moment of peace before everything ends. Just a single solitary moment when I don't have to feel so alone. The, the truth is, I'm alone because of my own actions, by the selfishness of the man I've become. I was given love, but I turned away from it in favor of my career. I gave up friendship in favor of business colleagues who couldn't care less if I lived or died. So what did it all mean? What is the sum total of my life? I have no job, no home. I'm going to die without a single friendly voice in my ears. I did have some good times with Carrie. Thank goodness for Carrie. I don't blame her for being angry. And despite her anger, she took me into her home. She forgave me. And Jimmy, I saved his life. He'll have a chance to grow up, to have a family and a little boy of his own. I gave that to him. I did make a difference after all. Maybe I had to go through it all so that I could be there to save his life. If that's true, then it's worth it. I'm glad things turned out the way they did. I did something worthwhile. My life mattered after all. Nearly midnight on the tenth day, just like the old lady said. When the clock strikes midnight on the tenth day to come, you will be dead. I'm not afraid. <laughs> I thought this moment would be terrifying, but I actually feel ready. No regrets. I'm prepared to say goodbye to everything. Excuse me, sir. I'll have to ask you to leave now. Yes, I'll, I'll go. And, and thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. No, oh, may, may I ask one favor? What is it? If anyone asks, can you tell them I was ready and that I was grateful? Grateful? For what? Uh, for everything. It was all a gift. It's time. I don't know what to do. What I... I mean, if I should... How do I... How? Church bells. They stopped. They stopped. Okay. It's midnight on the tenth day. And I'm still alive. Nothing happened. Okay. Nothing's happening. The old woman said I had ten days to live, that I would die at the stroke of midnight. <laughs> she lied. <laughs> she lied. Hey, excuse me. Hey, excuse me. The old lady, the, the one who reads fortunes, is she here? She just left a few minutes ago. She walks to the bus stop down in the corner. Oh, which corner? Which way? Up that way. Go left. Where is she? Don't let her be. Don't let her be. Ah, there. There she's ever. Hey, don't get on that bus. Wait. What is it? Who's calling? You... you lied to me! Who is it? Who, who are you? What do you want? Look, I'll stand in the light so you can see my face. 
No. You remember me? Ah, yes. The angry man. And I'm still angry. You you told me. In ten days, at the stroke of midnight, I'd be dead. Ten days are now over. I sold my home. I shut my life down because I, I believed in you. Yes. I told you that in ten days you would be dead. So? And I was correct. The man I spoke to ten days ago is dead. What? What, 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 what do you mean? That man was selfish and cruel. That man was friendless and meaningless. Can you say the same things about yourself today? I guess not. He's gone. Bury him. Give yourself the rarest of all gifts in life. A second chance. A second chance? Sounds too good to be true. And yet, here it is, yours for the taking. You're right, things are different now. I don't know how to thank you. Live for someone other than yourself. That's the best thing any of us can do. Actually, there might be someone willing to let me try. And her name is Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for the second chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael Franklin, a man on a mission to burn every bridge even before he made his way across. Stung by the terrible knowledge of his impending demise, his journey toward redemption faced a detour of intoxication and self-indulgence. As he now knows, such things are not the stuff of satisfaction, only empty calories and heartache. Ironic, then, that a man who placed such a premium on personal wealth could only feel full upon losing everything. A stark, lonely truth, but an eternal one. Upon such truths are built second chances, here in the Twilight Zone. Ten Days, starring Ned Bellamy with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Mark Valente. Heard in the cast were Linda Reiter, David Darlow, Ernest Perry Jr., Roger Mueller, Tony Mockus, Saskia Bellori, Joby Cerny, Elizabeth Lido, Martin A. Strope, C.J. Amari, Molly Glynn, and David Pasquese. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee and Todd Beyer. Music for The Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Incorporated New York. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including six free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, 
of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here we have the famous temptress from ancient Egypt, Cleopatra. Her beauty almost brought about the destruction of Caesar, Mark Antony, and the Roman Empire. And now, if you will follow me, the last group of figures in our little wax museum, the piece de resistance, if I may say so, the most infamous black-hearted killers of all time. This is not for the faint of heart, so <laughs> if there are any who would prefer to stay behind... I don't like this place. Come on, honey. They're made out of wax. But... No? Very well, then. Feast your eyes upon... Jack the Ripper, Henri Landrieu, and the dreaded Burke and Hare. It's Burke who's smothering the poor lady with a pillow, while Mr. Hare assists by holding her feet to the bed. And last but not least, in the sailor's garb, Albert Hicks, about to sink his gleaming axe into the skull of his hapless victim, one Martin Sinescu. Move in, please. They look so real. Closer. Closer. But not too close. <laughs> Allow me to introduce Mr. Sinescu, the curator of Murderer's Row. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if I startled you. Uh, I, I thought he was one of the dummies. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. Perhaps not, young man. But who can tell? What evil lurks in the heart of the man standing next to you? Go ahead, Martin. Introduce your friends. With pleasure. Albert W. Hicks. Mate on the oyster smack E.A. Johnson. A gentleman. Yet one day, in 1860, off the Atlantic coast, he murdered everyone in his crew with an axe exactly like this one. Why did he go mad? I'm afraid we'll never know. Not to mention Burke and Hare, two more monsters of their time. But do they look like monsters? What torment drove them so late in life to behave like ghouls? You see here how they suffocated their victims. A technique called burking. Think of the agonies they endured. Which one's he talking about? Search me. Both of them, sir. All of them. Surely it's dreadful to be murdered, as our victim here would tell you if she could talk. But to commit murder, to take a life with your own hands, again and again, and not be able to stop yourself, can you begin to imagine the horror? Nope, but uh, why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> I wish I could. But somewhere in the world, now, at this very moment, there is someone who can. Yeah? Who? Well, no one knows yet. But if his torment is great enough and he kills as these poor creatures did, then future generations will know, for he will end up here, immortalized in wax, remembered as you and I will never be, like Henri Landru, so filled with love and hate. He loved nearly 300 women in his lifetime. Spinsters and lonely widows. He too must have felt agony as he strangled the life out of them. A master of the garret, identical to the one you see in his hands. That looks like some kind of cord. That is a piece of string. Let me see that. Get away from there. Get away from there. I was only... Mr. Sinescu is right. The figures are not to be touched. 
they are too rare and valuable. <laughs> Besides, the museum can't be held responsible for what might happen to you. And here, another soul in torment. The Ripper himself, of all the faces in London's Whitechapel district. Which was his? And why did he feel driven to kill those pathetic drabs with one sweep of his knife? Identical to the blade you see before you. Step closer, young lady. What? Go on. It's only a prop. Lean forward. There. It's quite all right. Look deep into his eyes and remember them so you'll never fall prey to such a man yourself. A man who carried a long, sharp weapon which he slashed across women's throats like this. That knife, it swung at me. It almost... A spring in the arm. Pretty good trick. A trick, yes. But one that serves to remind us how near death is to all of us. When we look at Hicks, at Burke, and Hare, at Landru and the Ripper, we see what appear to be ordinary men. What devils push them to their bloody fate? We can only guess. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Sinescu. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our tour of Ferguson's Museum. Exit to your right, please. Mr. Martin Sinescu, a gentleman and the curator of Murderer's Row in Ferguson's Wax Museum. He looks after these replicas with care and dedication, and he ponders why ordinary men are driven to commit mass murder. What Mr. Sinescu does not know is that the groundwork has already been laid for a special kind of madness, a torment found only in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The New Exhibit, starring Joe B. Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There now, Mr. Landrew. Collar turned up just so. Mm. Easy to see why you're a real lady killer. We have to do something about that soon. <clears throat> Martin? Y yes, Mr. Ferguson? I'd, um, like to talk to you. All right. I'll be through here in a moment. That can wait. Uh, what I have to say to you is rather important. You know, sir, I, I think Landrew needs a new suit. This one is ten years old and shows it. Something wrong, Mr. Ferguson? Well, yes and, and no. I, I think we'd better discuss it in my office. All right. If you like, sir. <clears throat> Is it something I've done or haven't done? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, sit down. Uh, very well. Martin, I'm abandoning the museum. Uh, abandoning? I'm afraid so. Uh, <laughs> Is this a joke, sir? No. But... <laughs> But you can't. <laughs> you mustn't, sir. I know how you feel, Martin, but there isn't any choice. I, I don't understand. I've been offered a large sum of money for this property. Some people want to build a supermarket here. A supermarket? When I first opened the museum 30 years ago, I never dreamed I'd see this day. But the day is here, Martin, and we will just have to face it. 30 years, sir. No, for heaven's sake, don't make it more difficult than it is. I'm sorry. I hate this, Martin. You're the best employee a man could have. The way you've run the Murderer's Row exhibit, why, I, I don't think you ever missed a day's work. No, never. How many more days? None. This was the last. They start wrecking the building next week. What about the wax figures? I haven't decided yet. <gasps> Sir, we can open another museum. We'll move everything somewhere else. I'm not as young as I once was. I could use a rest. But, sir, I'll, I'll do all the work. You won't have to lift a finger. I appreciate that, Martin, but it would be foolish. Foolish? Foolish? Why? 
We have become passé. People aren't interested in wax museums anymore. Look at the numbers, it's all here. Our attendance figures, our profits, but mostly our losses. This year has been the poorest of all. There's even a news story about the closing of the Grand Guignol. Surely not. The handwriting's on the wall. Seriously, what do we offer? The great lovers of history? The discovery room? Scientists? That isn't why people came here. That isn't why at all. What they really came to see was your murderer's row. We've always known that. But they've been coming in decreasing numbers. And do you know why? Because the evening news offers them fears we could never match. The wars, the atrocities, the perversions, they've all ruined our chamber of horrors. People are blasé. They think they've outgrown the need to be frightened. They already live in fear day in, day out. It's the world, Martin, and the world has changed. No, it would be foolish to open another museum. Maybe it's the location or, or the exhibits. Remember how people came after we installed the Ripper's arm with the knife and the spring mechanism? That was years ago. They're simply not interested anymore. But what's going to happen to them? Landru and Hicks and the others? If I could sell them, I would. But there is no market for wax figures. Mr. Ferguson, you're not thinking of destroying them. Are you... I mean, they were meant to live forever. Martin, I tell you, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're forgetting something. Come with me. Martin... Look at Landru. His eyes. Don't you see the shy, frightened little choir boy he once was? The bookkeeper who so longed for freedom. Of course, but... Even the cheek feels real, like flesh with pores and the mouth. Isn't it about to say something? Oh, Landru was an elegant man, full of tenderness. It's right here in the lips. The way... What are you trying to say? Mr. Ferguson... You seem to have forgotten that these figures are the work of the great Henry Gilmond, the only ones he created outside of Europe. I haven't forgotten. There was genius in everything he did. They're not just so much candle wax. It's as though they were alive. I'm afraid it doesn't make any difference now. I don't think I could stand it if these figures were destroyed. It would be... it would be like losing five close friends. I won't destroy them, Martin. I give you my word. But where would I store them? You know how vulnerable they are to changes in temperature. I could take them. You? Yes. What would you do with them? I wouldn't put them in an ugly warehouse. I'll tell you that. They need constant care. I'll put them in my basement. That's ridiculous. Think about it. What would Emma say to having the figures of five famous murderers in her basement? Oh, she wouldn't mind. She rarely goes in the basement. It's my space. She'll understand. I'll put air conditioning down there and a heater for colder days. Oh, you'll see. I'll take care of them, just as I always have. You haven't eaten your breakfast. I'm not hungry. They should have arrived by now. They'll get here when they get here. Now, how long do we have to store them? Not long. What time is it? You asked me that five minutes ago. Oh, maybe something happened. It's not like moving furniture, you know. They should have let me ride in the truck. What if they dropped one of the crates? There they are now. Just relax. You Monsonescu? Yes, are, are, are they all right? The boxes? They okay. They didn't break, right? Nope. No bumps? No bumps. Where do you want them? Look, uh, carry them to the rear of the house and, and down to the basement. Uh, careful, carefully. Take your time. Whoa, wait a minute, how much time will it take? I don't know, an hour maybe. You gotta pay by the hour, you know. Sign here. With pleasure, and, and please, hurry. 
You see? All here, safe and sound. Easy! Please, please, don't jiggle them! Will you stop worrying? It's getting warm. What? I say, it's getting warm outside. They're very delicate. They can't stand more than 80 degrees. I didn't think they were so big. They're not. The boxes are big. The actual figures are not any bigger than you or I. See? Landrew's in the first one. The next is Jack the Ripper. Oh, Emma, I, I, I'm so sorry I got mad. But... It's gonna be like opening Christmas presents. Mr. Sinesco? Yes? Miller's Appliances. Got your air conditioner in the van. Where do you want it? Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Look, put it there. There. The basement window. Oh, please. Please hurry. I'll do my best. Thank you. You bought an air conditioner? I had to. They can't stand the heat. How much did it cost? Don't worry about that. Well, I am worried about it. Please. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone with my friends, all right? Now, if you don't mind, I have to go downstairs. Feels cool enough. Now then, gentlemen, Bloody Jack, Jack the Ripper. How are you today? None the worse for wear, I see. Oh my. Cape's a bit shabby, though. Martin, are you down there? Yes, dear. Positively threadbare. Martin! Yes? Are you fussing with the Ripper's cape again? No. Yes. No, no. Uh, it's his hat. His hat is going to need cleaning and blocking before long. I in fact, all their clothes could stand it. It's been almost a year since Mr. Ferguson let me do that. Martin. Emma, li listen to me. The truth is, these men need clothes. But the Ripper here, oh, his are the worst. Part of his coat backs come undone, and, and... Martin! What is it, dear? We're not buying them any clothes. Oh, Emma. Emma, listen. It's not just buying. It's tailoring to fit their bodies. I, I don't care, Martin. Oh, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Honestly, Martin, you pay more attention to, to those murderers than you ever did to me. Oh, Emma, listen, that's not true. You practically live down there. <sighs> Emma, they're a trust, a sacred trust. These figures were made by Guy Lamont. They're masterpieces. All right, so they're masterpieces. But you told me it would only be for a few days. Now, they've been here for weeks. I've been nice about it, Martin. You can't say I haven't. How long is this going to go on? I'm sorry, dear. I, really, I, I didn't lie. I, I thought they'd be here only a little while. I really did. But, well, I, I can't find anybody to finance the museum. How can you find anyone if you spend all your time down there? Well, I phone, but, but everyone I talk to never even has heard of Henry Guillemont. Can you imagine that? I, I, what's that? The electric bill. You see how much this air conditioner is costing us, running around the clock? Well, you know how hot it's been. Oh, oh my. That is high, isn't it? I'd like to know how we can go on paying it. Martin, there's no more money in the bank. I know, but you mustn't worry. I. I promise you, I'll, I'll think of something. There must be somebody somewhere. Mr. Ferguson. No. Why not? You've told me he loves these things as much as you do. Besides, isn't it up to him to take care of them? Emma, 
I don't know anyone in the world I respect as much as Mr. Ferguson. And I would never trust these figures to him. I couldn't be sure they were cared for properly. I don't even think I could sleep if, if I... So we're stuck with them. Stuck? Emma, it's an honor, a privilege. For you, maybe. But how do you think I feel? I am afraid to go into the basement because of the, of these monstrosities. I mean, I just about get a heart attack, Martin. The way they stand there and stare at me, they're frightening. <laughs> they're supposed to be frightening. Live with them as long as I have, and you'll come to love them. <gasps> love them? One day, they cease to be strangers to you, and you want to say good morning to them and ask them how they pass the night. And when that happens, Emma, I tell you, Emma, 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 where are you going, Emma? I just don't know what to do. I mean, we can't borrow any more against the house. That's true. There's no chance for a refi without proof of income. <laughs> and then today, when the electric bill came, I realized we've been spending a fortune just to keep the basement cool. You should have told me about this. I know, but I didn't want to bother you. I'm also your brother, remember? Oh, Dave. If only one of those people would loan him the money to open the museum, everything would be all right. Now, Emma, listen to me. Nobody's going to put money into a crazy scheme like that. Old Ferguson knew what he was doing when he sold out, and he was smart getting Martin to take care of those dummies. I shouldn't complain. It's just that you know how much he loved his job, and it was such a shock losing it. Do you want me to help? I didn't come here to ask you for a handout. Don't be silly. We're family. And believe it or not, I've always kind of liked the guy. But what's happening now? It sounds like he could use a few hours with a shrink. I can give you the name of a good one. Oh, Dave, he'd never go. Exactly. So what we've got to do is get Martin away from those things. Does he have them all? Only a few. How come? Ferguson had two or three hundred, didn't he? Yes, but these are special. Some man in Europe made them. Well, they can't be too special if they're not worth anything. They are to him. It's the first time that anything has come between us. I hate those murderers. I'll stop by and talk to him. It won't do any good. Then you talk to him, Emma. But not the way you have before. Lay it on him. Tell him it's those stupid dummies or you. And if that doesn't work, well, there is another way. What? Air conditioners break down. Emma? Emma? Is that you? Where have you been? Do you care? I know you're angry, but what can I do? I have to keep the figures in perfect condition. I can't let them go, or... Where did you get those groceries? I thought you said we didn't have any money left. Dave gave me some cash. Oh, no. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. You told your brother. Martin, we can't go on living like this. I'll borrow some money from Mr. Ferguson. Borrowing isn't going to solve anything. Now, Martin, I know what those figures mean to you, but... But what, Emma? What? I simply will not have them in this house one minute longer. Martin, once they're away from here, you'll be a different man. You'll see. You've lived with wax dummies so long, you've forgotten how to be a human being. No, I haven't. What kind of friend do you think I am? 
I cannot desert them now. Not after all these years. They need me. They'd be lost. Martin, they're not alive. They don't need anybody. I want you to see a doctor. What? A doctor? Yes. Just once. What do I need a doctor for? Because, Martin, there's something the matter with you. You haven't been yourself lately. Oh. Well, who have I been then? Well, I'm not sure. Somebody I've never known. But Martin, staying down in the basement all day and talking to those things, honey, it's not natural. I know it's not natural, but it's my job. I'm not the only husband who brings his work home with him. This was your brother's idea, wasn't it? Well, you go back and tell him to mind his own business. So it's hard to know where it's heading. Chances are we're in for another ride tomorrow. And that concludes our broadcast day. This channel will return to the air at 6 a.m. with the early report. Until then, we bid Are you asleep? Good night. God forgive me. It's time for the air conditioner to break. Oh, it's so dark down here and cold. Well, it won't be for much longer. Oh, where's the fuse box? Let's see. Which one is for the air conditioner? I should have brought a flashlight. I can't see a thing. Here it is. Good. What? Who's there? What's happening? Basement? What are you doing? Emma, I asked you not to go down in the basement alone, Emma. I don't want you touching the figures. You leave them to me. Emma. Oh, where's the light switch? Ah, that's better. Emma! 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 Oh, good Lord, what happened? Your throat. For the love of Emma. Who, who, who could have, who could have? Oh, you. The Ripper's knife? The blood? Oh, there's so much blood. No. No. I hate to bury you down here, Emma. I know how much you hate the basement, but I don't have any money. I know I should report it to the police. Who would believe me if I told them you had your throat cut by Jack the Ripper? You just bumped into the Ripper in the dark and his spring arm went off. It was an accident. Besides, if I go to prison, who will take care of the figures? It's better this way. 
They didn't like you, you know. You said some very unkind things about them, and, and they heard you. You have to be careful around Jack. He has such a temper. I should have warned you. <clears throat> there. Now for the cement. Oh, poor Emma. But it's too late to tell her anything now. Yes, man. Come back later. <sighs> All right. Hi, Mr. Snesku. I gotta read the meter. Hey, careful of the cement, it's wet. Oh, yeah. Doing a little patching, huh? Floor must have been pretty bad. Yes, sir. Uh... It was cracking. I had to do the same thing. These old houses, holy mackerel! Something the matter? Woo! For a minute there, I thought they were real. How'd you ever get statues like that? Yes, well, they're wax, actually. From the museum, I'm taking care of them. <laughs> Boy, they're the most realistic things I ever saw. You sure they ain't alive? Well, not altogether. Well, you could have fooled me. Should be a fine thing come Halloween. Something like this will really throw a scare into people. <laughs> man, oh man. Even close up, they... What's this? What? Uh, whoever made these thought of everything. Even put blood on a knife. Well, I gotta go. You've got quite a layout here. Hey, tell me something. Yes? Don't they ever give you the creeps? Not when you know them as well as I do. <laughs> You're a real joker, Mr. Sinescu. Wait till I tell the wife about this. Hey, do you think it'll be all right if I bring her over for a look? No. Um, well, I mean, we're going to be gone. I don't know when we're going to be back. Oh, okay. Well, I'll see you next month. Fine. Goodbye. to keep the outside door permanently locked. <sighs> Jack, I'm surprised at you. I really am. How did you manage all those murders without being caught by Scotland Yard? Any killer knows you can't leave blood on the murder weapon. And I don't mean to make a joke, Mr. Ripper. It's a dead giveaway. Life's good as new. Now, now behave yourself. Emma? Oh no. It's her brother. Martin! You in there? Emma? Martin? Where are you? Door. Martin, if you're in there, open up. Now. Martin, are you in the basement? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, is that you, Dave? I'm down here. Open the door, will you? I, I, I can't. Why not? I'm painting the stairs. Look, um... Uh, give me, give me a second. I'll, I'll go out the cellar door and come in the kitchen. Okay. Where's Emma? Ah, uh, sh she went out to get some air. Just as well. Mind if I sit down? Why? What do you want? You sit down too. Dave, look, I, 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 I don't have time. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. Now, just tell me what you want. Emma came to see me yesterday. I'm very embarrassed. She told me about it. She did, huh? Well, uh, that'll make it easier. Perhaps. Oh, you two have an argument? Yes. But look, uh, Everything is settled now. Glad to hear it. 
She was pretty upset when she talked to me. I know. You didn't treat her square when you brought those dummies home. That's been changed. Huh. Well, now, I guess I had you pegged wrong. You got rid of them. Yes. <laughs> Must have been pretty hot in here last night, huh? What? For a bunch of wax dummies. Hey, what's that humming noise? I don't hear anything. It sounds like it's coming from the basement. No, is that the air conditioner? I don't know what you're talking about. What are you driving at? Why is this door locked? I told you, the steps are wet from paint. I don't smell any paint. And why is the air conditioner still going if you got rid of the dummies? Well, I thought it might help the paint dry. Yeah? I thought it might get rid of the fumes. Is that all right? This is my house, isn't it? I think you locked it because you don't want me going down there. You better open up. Are you threatening me in my own house? You didn't get rid of those things at all. Where's Emma? Look. I am tired of answering questions. I've had a busy day. I'll thank you to leave now. All right. I don't want to cause trouble for Emma, so I'll go. But have Emma call me when she gets back, here. I will. to bed now. Sweet dreams. Good night. Huh. Locked up tight as a drum, huh? And what's so important down there he didn't want me to see? Ugh. Window's too dirty to see in. So, I guess I'll just have to force it open. Ooh, air conditioner's on all right. Cold as a tomb down here. It's so dark. Right, let me light a match. <gasps> oh, a dummy in a sailor suit with an axe. Oh, Martin, old boy, you need help. You really do. Ugh, when you look at these two, plug ugly. And two more big ones. Ooh, some knife. Looks real. What the heck? Oh, a shovel? Fresh cement? What is he trying to cover up? Ah, blasted match. Who's there? Who's there? Wait. What the? Are you, where's the axe? from you and put it up in the rafters where you couldn't reach it. I tried to make sure that nothing like this could happen. How did you get it down from there? Why did you take it off the rafter? Martin? Martin! Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Martin, let me in, would you please? 
Just a moment. Hello, sir. Hello, Martin. Waking you is like raising Lazarus. Don't you answer your doorbell anymore? I, uh, I, I, I was sleeping. Uh, actually, I, I overslept. <laughs> I was uh, doing a lot of cleanup work in the basement. Hmm. Well, it's nice and cool down there with the air conditioning anyway, right? Yes, sir. How's Murderer's Row? Oh, uh, fine, fine, in, uh, in rare form. Good, let's go see. I would have come two days ago when you first called, but things haven't been finalized yet. What things? Uh, <clears throat> I must say, you've kept them up well. But I, I have done my best. We get along so well. You don't know what a relief it is to see you. They've been threatening to cut off the electricity because I haven't paid the bill. Think what would happen to the figures. Well, you won't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, mm. I, I knew I could count on you, sir. Thank you. But it, it isn't just the electricity. Look at the Ripper's coat. It needs to be fixed. The threads are falling out. Look at all of their clothes. Maybe, maybe it's too humid down here after all. You won't have to worry about that either. Oh, I was going to have Emma repair this little rip in the sleeve, but... You have a remarkable wife. Thank you. There aren't many women who would have put up with an exhibit like this in their basement. She got used to it. You're looking a bit grubby. Have you been sleeping down here? Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, I wanted to show you. I came across an item in this book last night. Martin? I, I, I forgot I even had this. It's got a letter in it written by Landru himself. Martin, listen I'll, to me. I'll read it. But for you, whose very walk is beautiful, whose sweet eyes and smile make a just claim to happiness, whither am I bound, my dear little friend, under your tender leadership? Oh, isn't, isn't, isn't that touching? It's the one Landru wrote to Fernand Segre. Ha! Ah, you know it then. He also strangled her as he did all the others. Martin, are you all right? Yes. Well, that, that isn't, that isn't so. I'm, I'm, I'm not all right. Some strange things have been happening. Strange? Yes. You see, my house guests haven't exactly been behaving themselves. Who? Oh, come on now. It's true. I swear, you have no idea what they've been up to. Martin, you've been so close to these figures for the past three months, you're beginning to imagine things. Oh, no. Oh, no, it was not my imagination. Well, that's neither here nor there now. I can't... I can't keep it from you any longer. What, sir? The best news in the world. Martin, old friend, when I told you nobody would ever want them, I was being pessimistic. The fact is, somebody does, but not just anybody. The Marchand Museum. Did you hear me? Marchands in Brussels. Aren't you pleased? You won't have to take care of them anymore. I want to take care of them. I know you do, and I appreciate what you've done. But it's all signed. You don't mean that you've sold them? Yes, and for what I'm getting, there will be substantial compensation to you for the years you've put in. But my museum? I was going to buy them. You know you could never do that. Say you have another buyer. I'll get the money somehow. Please, Mr. Ferguson, they're all I have left. Martin, time moves on. There's no longer any need for our specialty. I thought with the closing of the Grand Guignol in Paris that things must be the same in Europe. But Marchand's is actually expanding. They were delighted to make an offer. The transaction was consummated only this morning. But what am I going to do without the figures? I'd die without them. Oh, come on now, man. You'll get over it. 
Why don't you go upstairs and prepare us a cup of tea or something while I take some measurements? The Marchand people want the exact dimensions. <sighs> All right, Mr. Ferguson. If you're sure that that's how you want it. I'm sure. Very well. Very well. Let's see now. Hicks. Six feet, one inch. And broken hair. Hello there, Landrew. Still holding your waxed cord, I see. Be with you in a second. Now then, Mr. Hare, five feet, ten inches. What? What? of tea. Mr. Ferguson, I don't remember whether you take cream and... Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Your throat! Why did you strangle Mr. Ferguson? And the rest of you? I know you didn't have any part in this, but you didn't stop it either. Landrew, you have gone too far. You wanted for nothing. I washed you. I cleaned your clothes. I waxed your shoes. The air was always the right temperature because I made it so. I defended your deeds against the thousands who came to see you. And when Mr. Ferguson sold the museum, who spoke up for you? Who wanted you? And now what have you done to repay me? Murdered Mr. Ferguson? He was a good man. The books were right. You are monsters through and through and for that I am going to punish you do you know what I'm going to do do you know what I'm going to do I'm going to take my saw and I am going to cut you into little pieces then I'm going to turn up the heat and let you melt into pools of wax It's no more than you deserve. Who's gonna be first? You, Landrew? Because it was you who murdered Mr. Ferguson. <gasps> it was not I, Martin Sinescu, who strangled your friend. It was you. <gasps> It was you. You killed him while I was upstairs, making tea. No, maid, it was always you. With my blade, you murdered your wife. You killed her while I was asleep. You used my axe to kill your wife's brother. Get away from me, Hicks. Get away from me. You are the murderer. Perk, stay back! You are the murderer. 
You killed them all. You, you, you lie! You're monsters! Not so, Martin Sinescu. No! <gasps> And here is the latest addition to Marchand's Wax Museum. Murderer's Row. Complete with its newest cast member, Martin Lombard Senescu. A remarkable and most versatile man. Who knows what thoughts went through his mind as he dug the grave for his wife, Emma, whom he killed with a knife. His brother-in-law, David, whose skull was split with an axe. And his friend and employer for 30 years, Mr. Ernest Ferguson. We'll never know. We can only guess what fierce devils tortured Seneski's soul and drove him to his destiny. But he has taken his place with the infamous and depraved. Next to Albert X, Burke and there. Landru and Jack the Ripper himself. This way, please. The new exhibit became very popular at Marchand's, an instant hit. But of all the figures modeled so lovingly in wax, none was ever regarded with more dread than an American named Martin Lombard Senescu. There was something about the eyes, people said, dazed, vacant, as if he had seen too much and come to understand it a moment too late. But they shouldn't have been surprised. It's the look one often gets after a quick walk through the Twilight Zone. Exhibit, starring Joby Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for the Twilight Zone by Jerry Soule and Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Jim McCants, Nancy Baird, Richard Hensel, Nick Sandys, Tom McElroy, Christian Stolte, Damian Arnold, Roderick Peoples, Craig Harris, Martin Aestrom. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Assist you, madam? 
You, you startled me. I, I, I've lost my way. My home is somewhere around here, I'm sure, but I, I don't know where. Perhaps I can help you find it. Oh, th thank you. Thank you. I don't even know how I came to be out here. It's certainly not safe at this time of night. Or oh, any time. Well, surely the daytime when the streets are crowded. No, that's what is most dangerous. For me. It's, so you see, I never go out. Never? Never. But, dear lady, why not? I'm afraid. Afraid? Of something or someone? Some... It's difficult to explain. Please, try me. Oh, I'm not sure you'd believe me. You think I'm just a senile old woman. I'd believe you, Wanda. What? What did you call me? Wanda. That is your name, isn't it? Yes, but... But I didn't tell you that. Um, you didn't? Are you certain? Yes, I'm certain. How do you know my name? Because I've been looking for you for a long time, Wanda. Oh, no. You've kept me at bay for many years, but no longer. No. Get away from me. There's nowhere to turn, Wanda. You don't know where you are, remember? You certainly couldn't run from me, a frail old woman like you. Please. <laughs> no, I won't let you. Say that again. It amuses me. He won't let me. How do you imagine you're going to stop me? You really have no choice, Wanda. There's nowhere for you to go now. Come to me, old woman. Take my hand. No! Take my hand. No! <laughs> no! Would I be? But 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 is it is it night or oh, day? Oh, that's right. The clock is broken. It's it's been broken a long time. And I can't get it repaired, can I? Not without going. No, no, I can't. I mustn't. I have to resist every temptation. Oh, really, Wanda? How could you be so careless? How could you fall asleep before? Uh, I must check. Oh. Uh, oh. Yeah, yes. The, the boards and the windows are still secure. Is, is that... Can I feel a breeze? Is there a gap? Oh, not enough. Not, not enough. He still can't get in. Oh, what about the door? Ah, ah, chain is on. And the door is locked. Good, good. He can't come in that way either. Oh, yes, I'm safe. Safe for another day. But, but I've been careless. Careless, really. Falling asleep before checking. I... I mustn't take chances. I can't take chances. Not while he's out there. And he's always out. <laughs> Miss Dunn? Miss Dunn, are you all right in there? Who are you? It's Barry. Mr. Fabian, you know, uh, from the grocery store. I know we've actually never met, but... Well, we've spoken on the phone, Miss Dunn. At least we used to. <laughs> do you even have a phone anymore? Anyway, you know me, right? What do you want? I'm delivering your groceries, Miss Dunn. You remember? Charlie, the kid who works for me, was supposed to bring them, I know, but he called in sick. Yeah, kids these days, huh? 
No sense of responsibility. Anyway, I, uh, I thought I'd better get them to you now instead of waiting till tomorrow. I figured, you know, you'd be waiting for them. Is, is that all right? Put the food through the letterbox. The letterbox, right. Okay. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Y your money is coming under the door now. Under the door? Here it is. Miss Dunn, wouldn't uh, it be easier to just... Six dollars and... Okay. Thir Thirty-two cents. Uh... Many thanks, Miss Dunn, but, uh... Good day to you, Mr. Fabian. Miss Dunn, are you still there? Yes. What is it? Well, I, I... I've been thinking. I mean, I... I just wonder, Miss Dunn, does anybody else bring you food? I really don't see what business of yours that is, Mr. Fabian. Well, well, no, it's nothing like that, I promise you. I mean, this isn't anything to do with business. I'm just concerned for your well-being. I mean, it seems to me a person can't live on food big enough to fit through a letterbox. I can assure you, Mr. Fabian, I'm in no danger of dying as long as I observe this strict regimen. Oh, well, uh, I'm glad to hear you talk like that, but... I don't know. I, maybe if I could come in for a minute. Come in? Yeah, I just want to talk, Miss Dunn. I mean, I can't do that so well out here. I really think you need to see a doctor. Out of the question. No one is coming in here, Miss Fabian. Not a doctor and not you. Miss Dunn. Miss Dunn, could you open the door, please? Go away. Miss Dunn, I just want to help you. I know what you want. Leave me alone. Miss Dunn. Miss Dunn, all I... I know who you are! You do? Well, that's good. That, that, that's very good. Myself, I, I have a very bad memory. Every morning, you know, my wife gives me a pen. Every day I lose it somewhere. So, will you let me in? Stop trying to get in here. You won't get me. Just go away and leave me alone. Come on, Miss Dunn. Look, I've got other deliveries to make. I, I just I just want to help you if I can. I, I, I think you could use a little help. Ah, the heck with it. Good luck living here in this neighborhood. What's left of it? you in. I won't let you get me. Leave me alone. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Please! Please! shot. I need help. Please. Please do something to help. Who are you? Uh, officer. I, I, I'm a police officer. Please, you have to open the door. I need help. I've been shot. You're lying to me. I know you. You can't fool me. No, 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 no. I'm not, I, I'm not trying to fool you. Please. Please. I, th I think I'm dying. You can't trick me so easily. You're no policeman. Why can't you just leave me alone? I know who you are. I know what you are. An old woman living in a waking nightmare. An old woman who has fought a thousand battles with death and has always won. Now she's faced with a grim decision a decision that might to others seem the simplest in the world, that of whether or not to open a door. And in some strange and frightening way, she knows that this seemingly ordinary door leads to the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, 
Nothing in the Dark, starring Marshall Allman, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Please, why won't you help me? Stop this! Why must you do this to me? I'm losing a lot of blood. It's so cold out here. <sighs> Listen to me. I... Uh, uh, I'm going to open the door. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But I'm leaving the chain on. Don't even try to touch me. I won't let you. Don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. I couldn't hurt anybody. Oh. You're so young. Almost a child. Unless, unless you help me, I'm going to die. I don't think I can even move very far. Oh, don't say that. Oh, it isn't fair. No, oh, it just isn't fair. You keep trying to trick me. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't move. Don't do that again. Or, or I'll close the door. What? Listen, lady. I've been shot. I'm bleeding to death. Do you understand? Do you understand? Please. My name is Harold Belden. I need a doctor. I need a doctor right away. Please, call the hospital. I can't get there myself. I... I can't call the hospital. I haven't got a telephone. Not anymore. Then let me come inside. You can't just leave me. I'm begging you. I'm freezing. I, I have to unlock the door. You can't ask me to do that. You can't. I don't want to die. You understand? So you're not going to help me? You're just going to let me die out here? I know who you are. No, I told you who I am. My name is Belden. Officer Harold Belden. <laughs> That's not her name. There is no such person. Stop trying to trick me. I don't understand why you keep saying that. Look, it hurts. It hurts, okay? Please, lady, please. Stop! Stop! Oh, why are you torturing me like this? I tell you, it isn't fair. I don't want to die. Well, I don't want to die either. If I could get help for myself, I would, but I can't move. I've been shot in the side, you see? Look, look. I'm bleeding. Oh, it is unfair. It is unfair. Will you help me? Yes. Yes, I'll help you. Thank you. Take my hand. What? Take my hand. Pull me inside. No, I won't. I mean, I, I can't. Oh, can't you? Can't you crawl in? Oh, I don't think so. Please try. <gasps> Quickly. I don't want to leave the door open. <sighs> That's it. Come over here. Into the bed. Yes. 
Eventually. Now, drink this. What is it? Tea. There's no milk, I'm afraid. Uh. No, no, don't get up, officer. Conserve your strength. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Please, call me Harold. You, you saved my life. I owe you at least that much. Is it good? Um, it, it's fine. Thank you. How long have I been out? Hours. What time is it? Well, I'm not sure. Morning, I think. What do you think? I... I don't have a clock. I, I guess it is morning. It's hard to tell. What happened to your windows? Who boarded them up? Well, I did. A long time ago now. But they're still as strong as ever. What? Why would you do that? Oh, I have my reasons. Well, we all have our own reasons for doing things. Why would you want to be a policeman? To be in a job where people try to kill you. Well, why would you want to court death like that? Court death? I, I don't know that I'd put it that strongly. I do what I do because there's just some jobs that have to be done. You mean it's a sort of vocation? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I guess you could say that. Listen, uh, Mrs. Um, uh, it's Miss Dunn. Listen, Miss Dunn, you should try to get some rest yourself. <laughs> you need it more than I do. No, really, I, I feel much better. When the doctor gets here, he'll, he'll take me off your hands for good. The doctor? Yeah, sure. He'll, he'll check my wound, take me to the hospital. You, well, you didn't call the doctor? No. No, I didn't. Why not? Well, I, uh, I told you last night. I haven't got a telephone. <laughs> don't you remember? No, I don't. I was, I was kind of out of it last night, I guess. Oh, of course. Perhaps you could use your radio to ask someone to come get you. Oh, you could wait outside for them. No, I, no, I busted my radio when, it, when I fell on it. <clears throat> Let me see. Hello? I don't think I got the shrink left to get up on my own. Look... Couldn't you go to one of the neighbors? Oh, there aren't any. What are you talking about? There aren't any neighbors. There must be. Everyone has neighbors. Well, I don't. Not anymore. Why? What happened? Well, they've all moved away. Not all of them. That's impossible. All of them? Trucks came and took away their furniture. First one, and then another. Is something happening to these buildings? I wouldn't know. I'm sorry to ask, but how, how can you not know something like that? I mean, if it was my home... I don't have a great deal of contact with the outside world. I haven't for quite some time. I couldn't even tell you who the president is. Wow. <laughs> I mean, but there has to be somebody around who can help, you know? Or maybe a phone booth somewhere where you could call a doctor. Perhaps. I don't know. But even... Even if I could call the doctor somehow, I couldn't take a chance and let him in. Why not? It's too dangerous. Dangerous for you? Yes. You let me in. Oh, I didn't have a choice. You were going to... I didn't know if I could trust you, but... But <laughs> I'm, I'm still alive. Of course you're still alive. What do you think I was going to do? I mean, but the, but the doctor, he's, he's not going to be any harm to you. I keep telling you I can't let the doctor in. I can't let anyone else come in. Don't you see? It might be him. It might be him? Who? Him who? Mr. Death. Uh, Mr. Death? 
<laughs> what? I know he's out there. He's trying to get in. He comes to the door and knocks. He begs me to let him in. Last week, he said he was from the gas company. The gas company? Oh, he's clever. After that, he claimed to be a contractor hired by the city. He said this building was condemned, that I'd have to leave. But I knew who he was. I kept the door locked, refused to let him in. Eventually, he went away. Uh, condemned, huh? I mean, that explains why there's no one else in the neighborhood. No, <laughs> he knows I'm on to him. Yesterday, he said he was Mr. Fabian from the store. But all he really wanted was to come in. That's all he ever wants. Wait. Wait a second. No, it's no use. You wouldn't understand. I knew you wouldn't. How could you? Well, I mean, oh, wait. But I, I want to understand. I do. I mean, this man you're afraid of, you say... You say he's Mr. Death. That's right. You don't mean just anybody, do you? You mean... You mean, like, death, right? Death. That's right. So is this Mr. Death a person like you or me? I know it sounds crazy to someone like you, to anyone but me, but it's true. I know it's true. Okay, I understand what you're saying, but, I mean, people die all the time, all over the world. Now how could one man be in all those places at once? I, I don't know. Don't ask me that. <laughs> Maybe there's more than one of him. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to upset you. Please, please don't cry. I, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm sorry. Okay. Can, can I have another cup of tea? Please. Uh, uh, of course. Tell me about Mr. Death. Your tea. Thanks. Please, Mr. Death. I would like to know about him. All right. At first, I couldn't be sure. It was a long time ago. Everything is. It's been so long since anything happened to me. But I was on a bus. There was an old woman sitting in front of me, knitting um, a scarf, I think. There was something about her face. I felt I knew her. Then a man got on the bus. He wasn't special in any way. Not short, not tall, not fat. Just, just a man. I remember that there were empty seats, but he sat down right next to the old woman. He didn't say anything to her, but I felt that his being there upset her in some way. I couldn't understand why. He seemed like such a nice man. When the old woman dropped her ball of yarn, he bent down and picked it up right in front of me. He held it up to her. I saw their fingers touch. He stood up and got out the next stop. I couldn't move. It was as if I knew, knew what had happened. But I couldn't do anything. I was just so frightened. When the bus finally reached the end of the line, the driver came over to the woman. He thought she was asleep. But I knew, I knew she was... What, dead? Dead. And right then and there, I knew it was his touch that killed her. Okay, but you said it yourself. She was an old woman. 
Okay, just because this man touched us. Mr. Death. Just because he touched her hand, it doesn't mean he killed her. Maybe what you saw was just what it looked like. A man trying to be helpful. I mean, the real cause of her death might have been, I don't know, a, a heart failure or, or a stroke or something. I don't know. No. He killed her. <laughs> okay, I'm a cop. I've seen dead bodies. I've seen people that were killed by guns, knives, but never by a touch, okay? The man being there when she died, that's just a coincidence. But I've seen him since then, several times. I've seen him in crowds. I've watched for him. Every time someone I knew died, he was there. He, the same man, the one on the bus. No. Once he was a young soldier, then a, a salesman, a, a taxi driver. Someone you wouldn't notice uh, unless you were watching closely. But you could see him. Oh, yes. And I wondered why that should be. Why I could see him when... No one else could. And then... I knew. Why? It was because I was getting older. And my time was coming. I could see clearer than younger people. People like yourself. Now, do you understand? Oh, I know you don't believe me. That would be too much to ask of anyone. But... Do you at least understand? Please. I have to know. All right. Maybe. Maybe, okay? But if there is some Mr. Death who's able to visit all the people in the world like Santa Claus... Don't mock me. I, I'm, not, I'm not meaning to mock you, okay? I would never do that. I swear. But if he's real... He is. If he's real, then I don't see what the problem is. You don't see what the problem is? Oh, you must be joking. No, I mean, if you know what he looks like, what have you got to be afraid of? If you're right, and you can see death, I'd say you're kind of fortunate. Fortunate? Sure, yeah. I mean, you'd be able to see him coming. You could just avoid him. Oh, didn't I tell you his face is always different? He's different sizes, different ages, different races. I couldn't be sure. Well, how about when you go out? Out? Sure. Well, I know you said you don't have much contact with the outside world, but you have to go out sometime. I mean, to the shops or something, you know? Now, couldn't he touch you then, if he wanted to? No. Why not? I never go out. Never. Never. Oh, I haven't been out for years. I don't know how many. I don't keep count. That would be too depressing. But I suppose you can guess from the smell. You're too polite to mention it. But it must bother you as much as it bothers me. So, so what do you do about food? The boy at Mr. Fabian's store delivers it. But I never open the door to him. How, how can you live like this? Oh, don't think I enjoy it. So why do you do it? Because if I don't live like this, I won't live at all. If I don't watch out, if I let down my guard even for a moment, he'll get in. I know he will. I haven't always lived like this, you know. I was young once. People said I was pretty. I lived out in the sunlight. I hated to be inside, even for a minute. My mother always said I'd spoil my fine complexion, but I didn't care. I loved outdoor things. I lived out in the sunlight, so warm, so beautiful. Beautiful, like, like I once was. You're still beautiful. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm old and cold. I miss the warmth of the sun so much. I... 
See that patch of sunlight on the floor? Where is it coming from? Um, I, I think it's coming in from between the cracks in the boards of the window over there. Oh, yes. Uh, it's so warm to the touch. You know, I've always hated the dark and the cold. And now I'm old. I've lived a long time, but I don't want to die. I've heard people say it was his time when an old person dies. But it's not your time if you're not ready to die. I'd rather live in the dark than not live at all. Miss, Miss Dunn, I promise you, there's nothing to be afraid of. We're all alone here. Hey, there's nobody outside the door. I know you're upset, okay? And you're clearly under a lot of pressure. But I think all you need is some rest. <sighs> ah, ah. Oh, officer. And yeah, and I need help. Oh, I, I don't know what to do. Just give me some medical attention. Look, I don't, I don't know how badly I've been hurt, okay? But I've lost a lot of blood. And I need help soon. Or, or I don't know how much longer I can... I've told you I can't go out there. You can't ask me to do that. Look, this whole Mr. Death thing, I promise you, you don't have anything to worry about. Shh, shh, shh. Someone's coming. Well, get, get, the, get them to help me. <gasps> no! There's nothing to be afraid of. Please, answer it. Go on. That's right. Go ahead. You're doing fine. Answer it. Go on. Uh, I, I'm keeping the chain on. That's fine. Do whatever you want. Just, just see who it is and get them to call for help. I'm sorry, lady, but I got my orders. No! Oh, get away! Officer Belden, help me! I can't fool around any longer. Step aside, I'm coming in. <laughs> Take my hand. Easy, lady. Just lie quiet there till you get your strength back. Oh. Uh, uh, what? You gave me quite a scare there when you fainted like that. Sorry I pushed you when I put my shoulder to the door. You started to faint and I offered you my hand, but you passed right out. For a second I thought that... Well, I don't even want to talk about that. But I I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're okay. Oh, and still, I live. Huh? I told you I didn't mean to hurt you. It was an accident. You're not going to sue, are you? Oh, what do you want with me? Here, let me help you get up. Take my... I can get up myself. <laughs> oh. Look, you got to understand, man. I, I don't get no pleasure out of busting indoors. Who would? Except maybe some thug, but I'm no thug. I'm just a guy doing a job. Your job? Look, you don't seem to realize how important this is. I've got a crew and equipment coming in an hour to pull this tenement down. I'm begging your pardon, man, but looking at this place, I say it's long overdue. Frankly, I'm kind of surprised it's still standing. And... You're really not Mr. Death? Mr. Who? I don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. My name's Armstrong. Bud Armstrong. I don't know about any Mr. whatever you said. All I know is I got a contract to demolish this row of buildings. That's what I got to do. Everybody else moved out a long time ago. Until the other day, I thought this whole building was deserted. I seen them windows boarded up, and I figured you moved out when the rest of them did. Thank goodness I met that guy from the grocery store, that, uh, Mr. Fabian. 
Oh, Mr. Fabian. Then he was real, after all. Real? Well, what are you talking about? Uh, I told him about my job down here, then he told me all about you. That he was worried about you. Told me he had a kid bringing you stuff. That was the first I knew about you, and it's damn, I mean, excuse me, you're darn lucky I found out. Well, you'd still be in here when the wrecking ball hits. Now, come on, we gotta get out of here. You want me to go outside? Sure, didn't you just hear me? This place is coming down. You can't stay in here. You want me to leave here? You have to. I can't. It's Miss Dunn, right? Well, Miss Dunn, you were notified about the demolition job months ago. Look, I'm not out to bully you. I'm just trying to do my job here. These buildings were condemned by the city. Can't say I blame them. And I'm the one who's got to tear them down. Tear them down? Wow, can you? Look around you, ma'am. This building has had it. You can see that. I can see that. Anyone could see that. It's all worn out, dilapidated. All these buildings have got to come down. You seem like a nice person. A nice person shouldn't have to live in a place like this. Now let's the two of us just- Get away from me. Don't touch me. Please don't act like this. I ain't a monster lady. I've got a heart just like anybody else and I can see how you could get attached to a place, but you know, not want to see it wrecked. But when a building's this old, it's not fit to live in no more. It's dangerous. It's got to come down to make room for a new one, a stronger one. That's life, lady. Old make room for the new, you know? No. People get the idea that I'm some kind of destroyer. They think I get kicks out of tearing stuff down. But that ain't the way it is. No, that ain't the way it is at all. I just clear the ground so other people can build on it. In a way, I guess I kind of help them to it. Can't have one without the other, am I right? Look around you. It's just the way things are, you know? Like uh, like when a big tree falls in the forest and a new one grows right out of the same ground. Old animals die and young ones take their places. It's just nature. That's how it is. Even people step aside when it's time. I won't. When I finally kick the bucket or when I get too old to contribute, my son-in-law will probably take over the... <gasps> the door! What about it? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't realize the chain was on when I put my shoulder to it. Door's okay, but the chain's high. You left the door open! Hey, there's no need get to... Get out of my way! <sighs> you don't have to do that. What's the sense of locking a door that won't even be here in an hour? I'm on the clock here, and we've waited long enough. If you've got any possessions you want to keep, Miss Dunn, I'd move them out while there's still time. I'll help you. You, you think you're helping me? I'm not going to leave here. Not with you. Not with anyone. Don't try to touch me. I, I don't want anyone to hear me. Now look, ma'am, I've been nice to you. I've been trying to go easy. I know this must be tough for you. Any kind of move is a big upset. Especially to an older person like you. But if you insist on staying here, I'll have to call a cop. A, a cop? A police officer? It's just for your own good. Please cooperate, lady. <gasps> hey, where are you going? Of course, Mr. Belden! Explain it to him. T tell him the reason I can't go out there. I know you understand. I've told you everything. Y you'll help me, won't you? You'll help me stay? Well, say something. What are you doing? Who are you talking to? Well, Mr. Belden is a policeman. Mr. Belden? Who the heck is Mr. Belden? Is he your pet? You got a cat in here? Please, please tell him. Lady, I think maybe you're sick. You should come with me. I'll get you to a doctor. I don't need a doctor. Mr. Belden, won't you tell him? 
Okay, okay, I get it. I see how it is. Hey, I'm sorry, but if you're still here when the crew arrives, uh, I'll have to call a cop. I'm sorry, I wanted to make you understand, but... Okay. What's the matter with you? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you help me? I thought you understood. I thought you'd help me. I think the question you should be asking yourself, Wanda, is how he looked straight at this bed and didn't see me. You called me Wanda, but I never told you my first name. Oh, oh no. No, 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 no. It, it, it's not true. It's not true. Yes, it is. The mirror, Wanda. Look in the mirror. What do you see? I can't. I won't. Look in the mirror, Wanda. What do you see? I see nothing. Nothing but an empty bed. Turn around. Now what do you see? I see you. Mr. Death. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. And now, Act 3 of Nothing in the Dark, starring Marshall Allman. It was you. It was you all the time. Yes. It was me. Oh, don't get up. You're still... Oh. You're not hurt. No. No, I'm not. But you were shot. Those men... Did you see me get shot? No, but you were bleeding. Do you see any blood stains now? No. And the men? Did you see them? You were never hurt, were you? I can't be hurt. You tricked me. Yes, Wanda. I tricked you. It was all an illusion. One I created just for you. If it helps, I'm sorry. I would have preferred to avoid it if I could. But why? Why did you do it? The moment I let you inside, you could have taken me any time. Yes, I could have. But you were nice. You made me trust you. But I had to make you understand, Wanda. You see me now, and you've seen me before. Many times before. Starting with that day on the bus. Oh, I was right. It was you. The old lady's name was Iris. I knew then that you were upset. <laughs> upset? I thought it was important that you got to know me. What I said to you before, it was true. What, what you said? When you thought I was a policeman, you asked me why I did what I did. And you said there were some jobs that had to be done. That's right. That it was a kind of vocation. Actually, Wanda, you said that. But I suppose you're right in a way. Now ask yourself, am I really so bad? Am I really so frightening? You've talked to me. You've confided in me. Have I tried to hurt you? Well, no, but... Do you really believe I would ever hurt you? You don't look like someone who would want to hurt me. You see? It isn't me you're afraid of, is it? You know me now. You understand me. What you're afraid of, what you've really been afraid of all these years, is the unknown. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Don't. Don't be afraid. But I am afraid. You must be very tired, Wanda. I am. But the running's over now. 
It's time to rest. I'd like that, but... Give me your hand. I don't want to die. Trust me. No. No. Mother, give me your hand. I will. You see? See? See what? No shock. No engulfment. No loud thunder. What you feared would come like an explosion is like a whisper. What you thought was the end is the beginning. When will it happen? When will we go? Go? Yes. I... I'm ready now. Look over there, on the floor. What is that? Oh. Oh. Now do you understand? It's me. It's you. My body. I look so calm. You see? We have already begun. Come with me. Yes. Please, I'd like to. It's such a beautiful day. It is. It surely is. You know, Mr. Armstrong was right about a lot of things. What things? Well, for one, his son does take over the business when he dies. Will that be soon? Another 16 years. Oh, dear. It'll be quick. I'm glad to hear that. I'm afraid I was a little harsh on him. Now the son-in-law, he lives to be 102. 102? Oh, goodness. I know. It's remarkable, really. Of course, the oldest person I ever met was a lady in Tibet. Well, how old was she? Take a guess. Oh, I know who to guess. Come on, take a guess. You'll never believe me. There was an old woman who lived in a room and like all of us, was frightened of the dark. But who discovered in the minute last fragment of her life that there was nothing in the dark that wasn't there when the lights were on? Object lesson for the more frightened amongst us. In or out of the twilight zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often and I'll see you in the zone. Nothing in the Dark, starring Marshall Allman with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by M.J. Elliott and written by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Roz Alexander, Jeff Morrow, Doug James, and Mike Starr. 
This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Custom Foley effects, sound design, and mixing are done in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by Cerny American creatives Matt Sorrow, Bob Benson, Todd Beyer, and Tim Cerny. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. It's done. It's Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Anything on the radar? Uh, not yet. No signal at all. Try 4.0, true. It'll probably come from that direction. I had her on that all morning, sir. Still nothing. You're past your time, aren't you? Who's your relief? Al Baines, Captain. Baines? <laughs> I'll see what happened to him. Yes, sir. Morning, all. Anything yet? Afraid not. They lost, you figure? There's no telling. Okay, if we fill our containers now? Go ahead. As long as the water supply holds out. Be a while till the next batch is ready. Julie! Where's your husband? He... he was sleeping, Captain. Get him, Julie. Is something wrong? There's something wrong. Yes, sir. How does it taste today, Henry? Same as always, hot, flat, and unforgettable. <laughs> but wet. Suffer it a little bit more. Six months from now, you'll be drinking chocolate ice cream sodas. You want to see me, Captain? There's a man in the radar tower who'd like to see you, Al. He would have liked to see you two hours ago when you were supposed to relieve him. I overslept. Tell that to Hank Parker up there in the tower. Tell him you overslept and then be good enough to tell him, Al, that you'll stand his watch all day tomorrow. That's not fair, Captain. It doesn't happen often. Once is too often, Al. More than once is intolerable. And many more than once is a case history of Albert Baines who likes his sleep. I prefer it to a stupid game in the hot sun, both of them. A game, Al? What are we listening for? Thirty years of two shifts a day. What have we ever heard? Wind noise. And what have we ever picked up on the radar screen? Dust particles? But anything to make you happy, Captain. You listen to me. There's a ship on its way. And when it reaches this atmosphere, it may want to be vectored in. They may want landing instructions, wind direction, ground temperature. And if Al Baines is in the sack, we may spend the rest of our lives here. Is that what makes you happy, Al? How do we know there's a ship out there, Captain? A lot of garbled static two months ago that you told us was a message, and then nothing. Two whole months, and you decide there's a ship coming here to take us back. You make the rules and set the watches and plan the days, and now you tell us the Messiah is coming. To tell us to pray? 
The difference between you and me, Captain Benteen, is that I do my dreaming when I'm asleep. You do yours on your feet. There's a ship coming, Al. All of us believe it. Because he tells you to. And we believe him. Whatever Captain Benteen says, that's what will happen. Sure you believe him. He tells you this is the best of all possible worlds, and by God, you break into song. You're sweating your lives away on this rock, but the captain says it's paradise, and we have to clap our hands. Rule by hypnosis. Al, there's a ship coming. This happens to be a fact. There's a ship coming. Believe it. I tell you, it'll happen. And you know it's real, just as you know this is real. You haven't forgotten our ship, have you? The Pilgrim One, the first spaceship sent up to colonize the outer regions, and this plaque placed here by the 130 men, women, and children who established the first off-Earth colony. We owe them our belief, because they had faith. Don't ever forget that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I better go check on the generator. This is William Benteen, who officiates on a small outpost in space. An outpost slowly disintegrating under the heat of two suns, with the holes, the cracks, the fissures that are the residue of despair. He tries to fill them with faith and to retain a faith of his own. This is a remnant society, a handful of people who left the earth looking for a millennium, a place without war, without jeopardy, without fear. What they found was a lonely, barren place whose only industry was survival. And this is what they have done for decades, survive. Until the memory of the earth they came from what has become an indistinct and shadowed recollection of another time and another place. Two months ago, a signal from Earth announced that a ship would be coming to pick them up and take them home. In just a moment, we'll hear more of that ship, more of that home, and what it takes out of mind and body to reach it. Because this outpost is located in the far reaches of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, On Thursday We Leave for Home, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Can't keep the generator running, sir. No wonder. Look at these wires. They're rotten. That's all we got, Captain. No backup? This is it. Any insulation? That's all gone, too. We used it on the uh, converter belts. Well, we have to get the current running somehow. If that refrigeration unit stays off, the temperature in the underground rooms will go up 50 degrees. Well, we could stop the saltwater converter for a day or so, switch the parts. Then we'll have to do that. Tell the people to fill up all the jugs they have. We'll be shutting off the water in six hours. Yes, sir. Captain? What about the ship? It's on the way. We know that much. Then everything will be different. When we get back, the things that are old and worn out, we'll throw them away. Just throw them away. Captain, Captain, Captain Benteen. What? The main square. Come quick. It's Mrs. Rodale. She's hanged herself. Cut her down. What happened? Is that lady all right? Get them out of here. Come, children. 
God have mercy on her. You men there, prepare her. We'll bury her in an hour. Yes, sir. We now consign to, to this planet the remains of Mary Rodale. We ask God in his infinite mercy to give her the serenity and joy that she sought while she was with us. And we ask his forgiveness for her sin. Amen. 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 We ask that this good woman be allowed to rejoin her beloved husband who preceded her in death 11 years ago. Bid your farewells now. Forgive her, Lord. Have mercy on her, Lord, for what she's done. A terrible thing. She didn't know what she was doing. She knew what she was doing. Better and clearer than the rest of us. Oh, no. This is a funeral, Al. The ninth funeral in the last six months. Nobody talks about it. We just let it go by. But there have been nine people who thought that maybe heaven is a place where they can get a drink of water without salt in it. Where they'll be able to breathe air without choking on the heat of it. If you want to talk blasphemy, I'll take it away from here. I'm talking truth, Captain Benteen. I'm saying that this woman and the others, they took their own lives because living became intolerable. And I say that dying was their right. Anything else? Just this question. I put it to everyone here. Al, please. No! Isn't living tough enough that we don't have to do it by the book? Isn't it hot and blinding and miserable enough that there shouldn't have to be rules? So that we shouldn't have to suffer by the numbers? Will anyone make the simple observation that there's far more happiness going into that hole than what's left above ground? There's more peace of mind in that dead body than in all you mourners put together. What we've got here is anguish. Captain Benteen, let us live with it or die from it in our own way. Young Mr. Baines here wants us to lie down in the sun. Young Mr. Baines would have us give in to death when there is still life. He would end all the rules. He'd throw away the regulations. There'd be no standing in line for water. Let the strong take it away from the weak. No rationing of food. Let the young steal it from the old. And when that ship comes down to take us back to Earth, it won't find a society. It will find only a pack. There'll be no human beings left. Only animals. There's a ship coming. It's winging its way in now. It's on its way. Say it! Say it out loud! Let me hear you say it! There's a ship coming! 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 That's right! There's a ship! A ship! Yes! A ship that's coming to take us! Hear that? Can you hear that, everyone? Do you hear? It's the. Meteor storm! It's a meteor storm! Find shelter! Get inside! Up to the cave! Get up to the cave! Julie! It's Julie! She's bleeding! Quickly! We have to move! I can't. Something hit my arm. I think it's broken. Stand aside. I'll carry it. It's just a cut to the forehead, not very deep. But keep this bandage on it. Julie? Julie, honey? Can you hear me? Al? Don't let her move just yet. She may have a concussion. 
How's your arm? It's not broken. Must have been a rock that hit it. Captain, thank you. For a little first aid. <laughs> no thanks necessary. I deliver babies, too. You might want to keep that in mind. Now I'd better go see to the others. Will it go on much longer, Captain? I wish I knew. It sounds like it's spending itself. I've seen meteor storms before, Captain, but nothing this size. What about the damage, Henry? Two underground cells destroyed. At least, that's what it looked like from out front. Everybody accounted for? I think we're all here, Captain. I've checked. Nobody's missing. Thank God. Everyone try to stay calm. The worst of it is over. Jojo? Yeah, Captain? You're not scared, are you? Well, kinda. Now, we can't have that. Mind if I sit for a minute? We'll talk, you and me. Captain, tell me about the Earth. Would you, Captain? Tell us what you remember. Yes, do. Well, all right, I guess I can do that. We'd like to hear. You, over there, is that you, friend? Yes, Captain. And you, Buck. Yes, sir. You fill in the holes if I leave out anything. Straighten me out if I'm wrong about any of my recollections. Jojo, I was a boy of 15 when we arrived here. But I remember Earth. I remember it as... as a place of color. I remember that in the autumn, the leaves changed. They turned different colors, red, gold, orange. And I remember streams of water that flowed down hillsides. And the water was sparkling and clear. And I remember clouds in the sky, white, billowy things that floated like great majestic ships. They looked like sails. What are sails? Don't you know what sails were? In ancient times, that's how ships moved across the water. There was so much water. The men unfurled large sheets of canvas against the wind. And it was the wind that moved them. And I can remember night skies. Night. Endless black velvet stars, and sometimes a moon that seemed to hang there as, as big as the face of an old man, looking down on us all. Captain, what's night? Why, that was the quiet time, Jojo. Night was when the earth went to sleep. It was the cover it pulled over itself. Not like here, with two suns always shining, always burning. It was a darkness that felt like... like a cool hand brushing over tired eyes. And there was snow on winter nights. Gossamer things that drifted down and turned the earth all white. And we could build snowmen the next morning and see our breath in the air. And... It was good then. It was right. So, why did you leave there? Oh, we thought we could find another Earth, Jojo. Then we found... this. We thought we could escape war. We thought, uh, we thought we could build an even better place. And it took us 20 years to find out that we had left our home a billion miles away only to be stranded, like visitors, transients, that no roots could take hold in this ground. But it was too late. So we spend the next 30 years watching a clock and a calendar and waiting. 
But we can't wait any longer. Not a day, not an hour. We have to get back home. There's no more time. I'll go outside and survey the damage. Not much harm. Radar tower is still standing. What? Why, it's... Al! Al Baines, do you hear that noise? All of you, come out here! Do you hear it? What is that? It's not a meteor That's not a meteor. And it's not wishful thinking. Not this time. Those are rocket engines. Look, I remember the sound of them. That's the ship. The ship has come at last. Pretty fast. Watch your step. That looks like you got plenty of room for everybody. Do you have any water? Clean water? We have enough. Oh, doesn't that sound wonderful? Delicious. Careful. I better talk to your leader. You have one, don't you? Sure do. Captain Benteen. I don't see... You're standing over there. Hey, Captain, come see the ship. Mr. Benteen? I'm Benteen. Colonel Sloan. I command the Galaxy 6. Our orders are to transport you all back to Earth. <laughs> Colonel, what took you so long? Six and a half months, Mr. Benteen. A hundred times that. We've been waiting for 30 years. Does it all look like this? Salt flats and scrubby mountains. Two suns, hot and perpetual. Thirty years of it. Thirty years. The children have never seen Earth, and some of the older ones don't even remember it. They'll see it now. Our orders are to get you aboard as soon as possible. We figure that we should be able to lift off on Thursday. Are you still using Earth time? Of course. Good. That'll give you three days to prepare. Unfortunately, your people will only be able to take what they can carry. Over 200, aren't there? 187 men, women, and children. It may be a little crowded, but we'll fit you all in. You've been used to a lot of space, Mr. Benteen, haven't you? Space? Room to move around. Oh, uh, that's all there is here. That and the heat. I can feel it. They'll make the trip standing on their heads if necessary. I'm sure they will, but I don't think that'll be necessary. Do you know? Can you understand? What a godsend this is for all of us. It's hard to imagine. I can only say your country's very, very proud of you. What of the Earth? Has it changed? Not too much. Still green? Still green. And the cities? The cities still stand. And war? As always, I'm afraid. One dies down, another one springs up. But through some miracle and the grace of God, we never had the big one. Now, Mr. Benteen, all things considered, I think you'll find it very much as you left it. Captain Benteen. Captain? That's what the people call me. This place, their very lives, it's all been my responsibility. You've done quite a job, Captain Benteen. But you can rest easy. I'll take over the responsibilities now. No need. I'm used to the job, Colonel. The living quarters, they're underground? I was saying, Colonel, I'm used to the responsibility. I wouldn't quite know how to function without it. Is it cooler there, Mr. Benteen? I'm sorry, I didn't... Your underground rooms, are they much cooler? Yes, they're refrigerated. Uh, it's... it's... Uh, Captain. Morning, Captain. George. 
The best morning ever. We just wanted to say thank you, Captain. Why? For what? For keeping us alive all these years. That's right. Without the Captain, none of us would be here. That's not necessary. You better believe it, Colonel. I do. I do believe it, Captain Benteen. Go ahead, Colonel Sloan. That's all right. I'll see to the others. You know, I don't need this. I'm not going to take this. Hi, Captain. Julie, where's your bandage? Oh, I don't need it anymore. But we put one around your head so the cut would heal. What's this? Isn't it incredible? It's called a medicinal patch. You wear it for 24 hours... It accelerates the growth of new skin. Look at her forehead, Captain. You can hardly see the scratch. Better put the sling back on your arm, Al. I don't need a sling. Just this metal band. It's magnesium. Colonel Sloan said my arm would be perfect by the end of the week. Well, I, uh... I seem to have had my practice taken away from me. But while we're here, I'd use that sling. I'll bet I've fixed about 500 broken wings in my time, and the only way to be sure it heals properly is to keep the limb immobile. Where's Colonel Sloan? I want to ask him what to pack. Uh, Eleanor, uh, let me help you with that bundle of clothing. Thank you kindly, Captain. I'll carry it for you. No, thank you, crewman. I've got it. Here you go, ma'am. I don't know how to thank you. Are all the crew as strong as you? That's our job, ma'am. Nothing to it. <laughs> Hello there, Captain. Well, I'm so excited. How much longer? Not long. Be patient. May I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> yeah. Good question. Quiet, please. What is it, Captain? As all of you know, we have less than 36 hours before we depart. And as I told you earlier, there is a maximum allowance of 14 pounds per person. Soon we'll begin weighing your belongings, and if we're over the limit, I'll make up a list of necessary items. I hope I'm not intruding, Captain. I was just telling them about the weight requirements. We'll handle all that tomorrow. I heard you'd called a meeting here in the cave, so I brought Lieutenants Engel and Rafferty with me. Everyone has so many questions about Earth, I thought perhaps this would be a good time. Actually, Colonel, the purpose of this meeting is simply to make some last-minute arrangements. Colonel, I used to live in San Diego. Is California still the same? Sunny and warm most of the time, but not this warm. Los Angeles has become the biggest city in the world. These kinds of questions, we could just as well handle them when... Colonel Sloan? Are there still major leagues? My dad used to tell me about baseball and the World Series. The leagues are just as before, American and national. What about the Dodgers? <laughs> they, they came in tenth last season. I'm told they need pitchers pretty desperately. I'll tell you what. When we're finished here, we'll improvise a ball and bat and have ourselves a game. How's that sound? Yes. That'd be great. Let's do it. I, th I, think, I think it's a little hot for that kind of activity. What we could do is have some group singing. We haven't done that for a while. I got an old sack. That'll be the ball. Who's got a stick? What are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> please, please wait. We haven't finished yet. Jojo. Jojo, I haven't told you a story in a long time. How would you like to hear a story about... What have you got there? This is what they call candy. One of the spacemen gave it to me. It tastes... It tastes... Sweet, Jojo. It tastes sweet. Yeah, sweet, Captain. Want a bite? No, oh, thank you, Jojo. Back on Earth, we can get all we want. Something, Captain? I'm not sure. I'm not at all sure. You've promised them all candy. You've made it sound as if... Uh, as if that was what the Earth is made of. Sugar and spice and everything nice. Maybe... Maybe they ought to be told the truth.
the universal language. Baseball. You have a limited vocabulary, Colonel. Do you have any idea what the temperature is? At this hour, it's about 110. I don't know whether your crew can take it, but I know my people. They're going to pay for this little athletic event. Some of the older ones, it might even be serious for them. It's just a game, Benteen. My guess is that it's worth it. Now, I'd better get back to the ship. Colonel Sloan. Something else, Mr. Benteen? Colonel, when we get on the ship, you can tell us what to do and we'll all fall into line. But here, in this place, I'm in command. I'm not trying to usurp authority, Mr. Benteen, but I really don't see what harm a little game... It's still Captain Benteen. For now. <sighs> Galaxy crewmen, back to the ship. That's an order. Oh, come on. It's time for rest now. All of you go back to your homes. I'll announce when the new day will start. You happy now, Captain? I was never unhappy, Colonel. I just happen to know what's right and what's wrong. I ask you to keep your crew in the ship during the rest time. I don't want my people distracted. You rule with a heavy fist. If it were one ounce lighter, no one would have survived. I've held these people together by will. They'd have died, Colonel, without someone they could hold on to. They'd have withered away. Not anymore, Captain. Relax. That's a luxury I've never been able to afford, Colonel. I've never been able to marry, to think only of myself, because of them. I've been a father figure, a governor, a confessor. I've been all those things. And if I hadn't been, there'd be no life here. These are my people. Understand? My people. What's with him, Colonel? Now bear with him a little bit longer, fellas. He's really quite a man. He's got just one minor aberration. And what's that? He believes he's God. As far as he's concerned, we're booting him out of heaven. Yes? Mr. Captain Benteen is here, sir. Showman. Very well, sir. Come in, Captain. Sorry, my quarters are a bit cramped. Please, sit down. Colonel Sloan, this is a list of all passengers with their approximate weight and the weight of their belongings after each name. The scale we have is pretty beat up. My guess is that it underweighs by about four or five pounds. Fine, fine. All I wanted was an approximation. We'll weigh them in on our own equipment before blast off. This is Wednesday, 12 midnight? I keep getting confused with the constant light. When do the people get up? About two, Earth time. The hours from 7 until 1.45 are the hottest. That's when we try to stay indoors. Then we have our meetings at the cave about two hours afterwards. We've had to improvise our own schedule. You've improvised very well, Captain. I looked at the saltwater converter, your electro plant, the sun shields you put up over the crops. Very inventive. Necessity hasn't been the mother of invention here, it's been the father and the whole family. <laughs> well, you'll be able to give way to progress now. Though I wonder if all of it'll be to your liking. The way you'll be lionized when you get back to Earth. You're referred to in the press as the Lost Pioneers. They're gonna make quite a thing of you when we land. Oh? Wherever any of your people settle, there'll be keys to the cities, brass bands. I expect they'll scatter all over the U.S. The government's had inquiries by, well, it must be thousands of relatives. My guess is that they'll just about have time to look into a television camera and then get whisked off. Well, they won't be scattered, Colonel. They'll go as a group. We'll find a place where we can settle, and that's where we'll stay. I... I'm talking about when we get back to Earth, Captain. That's what I'm talking about. They won't be splitting up. Not my people. Captain, as a point of interest, did you ever ask them? Ask them what? Whether they'd want to stay together. That would be a ridiculous question, like asking a child if he wants some more, uh, some more ice cream. They're children, you see, Colonel. Oh, chronologically, they range from six months to 60-odd years, but socially, psychologically, they're children. 
I've kept them alive and functioning all this time. Once we're back on Earth, I'll simply continue the process. Captain Benteen, have you told them that? Have you told them that after 30 years of waiting, 30 years of living in a compound, they're going to travel a billion miles just to walk into another one? Have you? There's no need. They wouldn't have it any other way. To leave them to their own devices, that would be an act of cruelty. Captain, do me one favor. Just ask them. Naturally, we won't have to concern ourselves with the colder climates. The northeastern states, the upper regions of the Great Plains, we will find an area much farther to the south, perhaps Florida or Texas. Southern California has a temperate climate. Uh, Captain, you better tell us about frostbite treatment, because I'm moving to Wisconsin. That's where my family settled originally. What about Oregon, Captain? That's where Joan and I plan to settle. I've heard about the forest there. Please, wait a minute. You don't understand. <clears throat> uh, let me make this clear. All of you will have a chance to meet your relatives. I see no reason why visits can't be arranged, perhaps even for a week or more. But naturally, we'll remain together as a community, in whatever land grant we obtain from the government, or whatever given area we can arrange. I can assure you of one thing, and I hope put all your fears to rest. I'll remain as your, well, your guide, your consultant. And I guarantee that no one will lack for my help or my advice. Captain, Julie, Julie and I were thinking of farming. Why, that's a fine idea, Al. We'll farm just as we have farmed, but much more easily. The rainfall back on Earth is so plentiful. And as I told you, there's only one sun, so you won't have to shield the crops. Of course we'll farm. Certainly, we'll farm. Julie's got relatives in the state of Washington. You couldn't take the cold. None of you could. But I guarantee that wherever we settle, the farming will be good. I'll see to that. What's the matter? Don't you understand? We... we don't plan to stay together. You don't understand, Al. You've never understood much of anything. If we split up, I seriously doubt that we'd survive. Al, explain it to him. Go on. We'll survive, Captain. If anyone wants to stay together, that'll be their right. But if they want to go their own way, that'll be their right too. Am I wrong, Colonel? You're not wrong. We're to take you back as a group. Once on Earth, you can do as you please. Colonel, let us settle our differences in our own way. There are no differences, Captain. There are differences. There are changes that have taken place on Earth. Things we aren't prepared for. Oh, the Colonel has made it sound like a big holiday. The good life just plucked off a tree. Well, friends, I don't want any of you disillusioned. Wherever men live, they grub, they scrabble. They have to dig to stay alive. It's a fact. But together, that's the word, together, we've got to stay together. Think of that word now. Let's say it out loud. Everybody, now, together, 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 together. Looks like the congregation isn't with you anymore, Captain. What's the matter with all of you people? Wait. I've made the compartment assignments. I'd like to go over them with you. Assignments? There's not much time, and there's some things we have to check off. There's a decompression problem that we've got to tell them about, and a moment of weightlessness shortly after we leave the atmosphere that I want to explain to the children. Do you know, do you know what we called you while we waited for you to come? We called you the Messiah. Did you? You were supposed to bring freedom, but that's not what you brought. You brought selfishness, dissatisfaction, divisiveness. With all the misery we've had here, those germs never infected us. I brought nothing but a ship and a crew and a means of escape. You've had no diseases, no viruses. Did it ever occur to you why? 
You've lived in a test tube, Captain. Antiseptic and germ-free and sterile. Sure, you're a group, a cell, but that's all over with. Now it's time for you to be what God meant you to be, individuals. Time to break the test tube. Time to rejoin the human race. What I'd like to know is why in the name of God you're so reluctant about it. Because I remember the human race. This is incredible. Oh, it's really incredible. I was wrong, Colonel. I've been telling them about an Earth that doesn't exist. An imaginary garden. No. We can't go back. It's too late. Captain, really. Everybody, gather around. I've got something to tell you. Listen to me, all of you. I want to tell you all... Uh, listen to me, uh, uh, all of you. I, I want to tell you about the real Earth. Captain, are you all right? Let's talk about the diseases. What? The viruses, the, the cancers, the floods and the freezing, the wetness and the cold. And there are other, other miseries, worse than anything we've experienced. Hatred, jealousy, violence. Listen to me, it's an Earth we don't know. We can't leave here. We'd be committing suicide. We'd die of, of things we've never been exposed to before. We'd die of the loneliness that animals get in a zoo. Because we don't belong. We don't belong to his kind. Do you understand me? We don't belong there. Captain Benteen, why don't you let your children vote on it? Only if they know what's waiting for them. Only if they understand that Earth isn't any garden. It's never been, and it never will be. That's fair enough. I'll tell you what Earth is. The same as it's always been. It's a race struggling to survive, just as you have survived. Captain Benteen is right when he tells you that it isn't all a place of beauty. There may still be wars and prejudice and strife. I suppose there will always be jealous men and angry men and unforgiving men. But it has one thing you don't have. Every man is his own master. There won't be anyone telling you when to eat, and when to sleep, and when to meet, what to sing, and how to play. Instead of heat, you may feel cold, and instead of thirst, you may feel hunger. But you'll be men and women. You won't be sheep. You won't be a kindergarten. And when you pray to God, his name won't be Benteen. A vote now, Captain. And the majority wins. Those of you who want to be on the ship, ten hours from now, heading back to Earth, step forward. All right, I'm going. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That's it. Let's go. I suppose that makes it unanimous, Benteen. Even you, Jojo. Well, I want to go with the Colonel. Give me something, anything. Give that sledgehammer. Here. Angle! Rafferty! There, sir. Stop him! He's running for the ship! No, no, no! Captain! Captain, no, please! We'll see how far you get. Without a tail fin! Put it down! Ah! Ah. Uh, uh. You all right, Colonel? I'm fine. What about the ship? Just a couple of dents, nothing serious. Lucky you stopped them when you did. Captain Benteen, let go. For everyone's sake, loosen your grip and let go. God help you. God help you all. Tomorrow you think you're getting on a ship headed for paradise. What you don't realize is you're heading for hell. What about you? I'll stay here. That's right. This is my home. This is where I belong. This is where you belong. You just don't have the brains or the guts or the sense to know it. This ship leaves at 0800 tomorrow. If you're not on board... I want no special privileges, Colonel Slow. No special treatment. 
If you're to blast off at eight, you blast off at eight. As for the rest of you, you can go on the ship or you can remain here with me. I'll be at the cave. Any who want to remain can meet me there. That's it, folks. The rocket's fired up. Everybody on board, single file. What about the captain? I'll give it one last try. Lieutenant Engel, see to the passengers. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. Where are you going, sir? To the cave. Captain? Benteen? Benteen, we know you're in here. Please, let us talk to you. He's not going to show himself, Colonel. We're leaving now. We have to blast off in five minutes. If we don't, we'll have lost our orbital position. Benteen, it has to be now. Captain! Captain, please, come out! Remember this. If we leave without you, there'll be no other ships. This is where you'll live the rest of your life. And this is where you'll die. All right, Benteen. As you prefer. Let's go, Baines. Goodbye, Captain. Hello, hello, friends, all together at the meeting place. Any new business today? No? Jojo, I'll bet you want to hear about Earth, about the rivers and the seas, the, the blue skies, or the night, the stars and the moon. Which do you want to hear about this time? Uh, there's, um, well, there's color on Earth, the change of seasons, and the wind, the wind brings the smell of the ground, the plants, the seeds, the roots, flower petals, sap from the trees, and the smell of the weather, the rain or the mist or the fog, and on the earth, on the earth, there's green, the color green, the feeling green, there's something fresh about it, something living. Earth. It's called Earth. Don't. Don't, don't leave me. Please. Oh, don't leave me. A man named Benteen, sometimes known as Captain, who had certain prerogatives. He could lead, judge, legislate, even dictate. It became a habit, and finally, a necessity. William Benteen, once a god, now a population of one, on a distant outpost in the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. On Thursday, We Leave for Home, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Christian Stolte, Elizabeth Lido, C.J. Amari, Richard Hensel, Justin Kaufman, Kurt Nabig, Joby Cerny, Jennifer Joy, Meg Thalkin, Tracy Hernandez, Jake Salins, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, and Amanda Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hurry. We can't miss the monorail. Make way! Coming through! Keep pushing. I'm doing my best. Ah, wait a minute. One of the wheels fell off again. I'll get it while I hold him up. Okay, okay, I got it. Here, here. Uh, let me slip it back on. Hurry! Excuse me, conductor? Yeah? Is this the monorail to Kansas? Sure is. Better get on board, though. But you know, uh, you, you should have checked your cargo. <laughs> this ain't cargo. It's a B-2. A what? A B-2. Whoa! What is that? Is that a man? Is, is he alive? That, sir, uh, is a B-2 boxing robot. Wow. He sure looks real. Yeah, he looks even better in the ring when we activate him. Westbound monorail will be departing on track 10 in one minute. Uh, conductor, we bought a ticket for him. Uh, here you go. He's fighting tonight. We have to keep an eye on him so he doesn't get damaged. Well, he's got a ticket, so, uh, so get him on board. We're pulling out. Sure thing. Okay, I got this end. Okay, ready? One, two, three, lift. Come on. <coughs> Oh, my How much does this guy weigh? Oh. Oh. Ah, next time, let's get a lightweight instead of a light heavyweight. <laughs> All aboard!
Ladies and gentlemen, kindly observe the no smoking sign and ensure that your seatbelts are securely fastened. Thank well, you. <laughs> here's our seats. C11 through 13. Let's sit him down in the window seat. He gets the window seat? Get him seated. Hey, you hear him squeaking? Not only is he saying he doesn't want the window seat, he's saying he doesn't want to sit down, period. He needs his silicone teflonic joint lubricant changed. We'll pick up some as soon as we get paid. Well, first we gotta find some. Shouldn't be no problem. Come on, I told you. They don't make it anymore. Well, that's crazy. Still plenty of B2s in the business. Name one. This one. We'll find some. All right. Wow. Sure is hot. It'll be hotter where we're going. Wish I had a beer. Well, it wouldn't do you any good. I already had three, and I'm still thirsty. Not an XO. You don't need a thing. Never complains. Then, uh... Why does he squeak so much? You think he'll be all right? Yeah, if he doesn't get hit. Can it, Paul? Hey, come on, no use glaring at me, Steel. You know he's shot. That ain't true. A little overhaul is all he needs. Well, yeah, a little ten grand overhaul with parts they don't make anymore. <laughs> when you talk, you think he's ready for the scrap heap. Ain't he? No, he ain't. Just because he's a little old? Well, try ancient. Plenty of fight left in him. Well, you think he's okay or not? Steel. I don't know. And that's a fact. He needs work. Like what? Well, for starters, the trigger in his left arm. It's been rewired so many times it's just about had it. He's got no protection left on that side. Plus, his eye lens is cracked. Leg cables are worn out, no tension left in him. Even his gyro's off, not to mention he needs silicone teflonic... Joint lubricant. We'll get him some. Where? I'll find it. <sighs> yeah, after the fight. What about during? He'll be creaking around that ring like, like an antique steam shovel. This ain't 1940, it's 2040. Be a miracle if he goes two rounds. It ain't that bad, Paul. Actually, it's worse. Wait till the promoter gets a load of battling Maxo from Philadelphia. We'll be lucky to get monorail fare back home. The contract is signed. You can't back out. Well, the contract is for battling Maxo in fighting shape. Not this bucket of antique hardware. Just you wait. Maxo's gonna do all right. Against the B7? It's just an experimental B-7. It ain't got the bugs worked out yet. That's why they took a bout with us. Well, after tonight, battling Maxo's new nickname will be One Round Maxo. That's enough. He's been doing okay for five years, and he'll keep doing okay. So what if he needs a little work? So what? If he wins some money, we can get him all the silicone teflonic lubricant he needs, and a new trigger for his left arm, and new leg cables, and everything. He's gonna do all right. You'll see. Maxwell's going to do just fine. Sports item from the not-too-distant future. Battling Maxo, B2, light heavyweight, accompanied by his manager and handler on his way to Maynard, Kansas for a scheduled 10-round bout. Battling Maxo is a robot, or to be exact, an android, resembling a human being. Only androids have been permitted in the ring since prize fighting was legally abolished. This is the story of that 10-round bout. More specifically, the story of two men shortly to face the remorseless truth that no law can be passed to abolish cruelty or desperate need, or, for that matter, blind animal courage. Location for the facing of said truth? A small, smoke-filled arena just this side of the Twilight Zone. And now the Twilight Zone and our story, 
Steel, starring Lou Gossett Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. You were right. It is out of here. Told you. Hey, taxi. What are you doing? It's six o'clock already. We better get a move on. Well, we got no money for a taxi. We can't push him through the streets. We don't even know where the stadium is. What are we supposed to eat with then? We'll be loaded after the fight. I'll buy you a steak three inches thick. Hey, fellas, need a taxi? Uh, thanks, pal, but uh, no thanks. Oh, come on, where are you headed? Stadium. The stadium? That's six miles away. You can't push that thing that far. He's right. I told you, we ain't got the dough. Ooh-wee, what is that thing? A boxing robot. Oh, man. He is something. I've never seen one up close. Come on, I'll drive you to the stadium for free. It's on my way. You want a hand with it? Careful. He's got a bum wheel on the bottom. Ah. He's real heavy. Oh. oh boy, this is a real honor taking a fighter to the stadium. Well, thanks. Hey, which robot is that? This? is battling Maxo from Philly. Maybe you heard of him? Uh, no, but, you know, I'm no expert. He was almost light heavyweight champ once. No kid. Yes, sir. You ever heard of Dimsy the Rock? Uh, don't think Steve. so. Why don't you give it a rest? Dimsy was number three in the light heavy ranks, on his way to the top. Well, my boy took him out in the fourth round. Left cross, bang! Almost put Dimsy to the ropes. It was beautiful. Yeah. No kid. Yeah. Used to be in the game myself. Night heavy. Before they passed the law. Called me Steel Kelly because I never got knocked down. Not once. I was number nine in the ranks before the outlawed human boxers. Wow. That's something. Anyway, tonight is going to be a good fight. Driver, uh, have you ever seen a fighter from here called The Flash? Oh, yeah, you bet. Man, that is one good fighter. One seven straight, he's riding a bullet to the top of the rankings. You just wait. Matter of fact, he's he's fighting tonight, too. They're bringing in some heat from uh, back east to fight him. Flesh is gonna slaughter him. Oh, where'd you guys say you were from? Philly. Oh, oh, man, you're not. We are. Oh, look, I didn't mean nothing. I didn't know, Skip. Forget it, pal. Doesn't matter. You're right. Why don't you shut your trap for once? Look, fellas, I'm sorry. Well, you guys need anything else? Anything. Do you know where we can get some silicone teflonic joint lubricant? So, Oh. <laughs> Do they still make that stuff? No, they don't. Uh, just trying to be funny. They haven't made it in years. Hey, look. They got the fight card posted for tonight. You guys are the third fight out of seven. Woo! Your fighter must be pretty good. Oh, the Maynard Flash, B7, versus Battling Maxo, B2. You got a B2? Yeah. Well, uh, at least you're not at the bottom of the car. We do have that going for us. Drop it, Paul. You'll see. You'll all see. It's nothing personal, Kelly. It's just the way it is. Well, It'd be a miracle if he wins. Hey, hey, if he does, can I have his autograph? Sure thing. Thanks for the lift. Good luck, fellas. You're gonna need it. Steel, you know, Maxo's not programmed to sign autographs, right? I know. Let's roll him inside. The wheel fell off again. I, I, I got it. I got it. Keep pushing. Put it back on. Well, what's the point? Put it back on. The office is just down the hall. I want Max to make a good first impression. Well, let's just hope his head don't fall off next. Keep quiet and let me do all the talking. What's wrong with you anyway? After seven months, we finally get about, and all you can do is complain? What's <laughs> about? We're in Maynard, Kansas. What's this, the prize-fighting center of the nation? It's a start, ain't it? It's our first step on the comeback trail. 
The purse will give us enough to get Maxo back in shape. And if we win, it would mean we get fights all over the place. Oh, spare me. We don't have a chance. I don't get you. He's our fighter, and we stick behind him no matter what. Why are you writing him off before he even gets in the ring? Don't you want him to win? I'm a Class A mechanic, Steel. I'm not some daydreaming kid. I know machinery. We got a piece of dead iron here. Technology always moves forward. We got a B2, not a B7. No way he's gonna win this fight. Shh, keep your voice down. It's simple engineering, that's all. Maxo will be lucky to get out of the ring with his head on. Bull! It's an experimental B7. It's probably full of bugs, full of them. They always are. That's why they take a first fight in the middle of nowhere. We've got a chance. Yeah. Yeah, sure we do. Remember, keep your mouth shut. Yeah! Mr. Nolan? Nah, I'm Oscar. Mr. Nolan will be back in a couple of minutes. I'm still Kelly, battling Maxwell's owner. Oh, yeah, I heard of you. You were one of the last human fighters. Hmm. This is Paul, Maxwell's mechanic. Hi. It was getting late. We were wondering if you'd make it. Never missed a fight. Yeah, pull up a chair. I got some paperwork to do. Thanks. What was that? It was this folding chair. Uh, okay. Sign on all the X's. You heard of my fighter, Mr. Oscar? What's his name? Battling Maxo. You must have heard about him. Can't say as I have. He knocked out Dimsy the Rock, a ranked fighter in his prime. Uh-huh. Yeah, sign here, too. It was all in the East Coast papers. New York, Boston, Philly. Got quite a spread. Biggest upset of the year. Good. Initial here. And here. And a couple more here. Right here. And over there. He's a B2, you know. That's the second model Mauling put out. The B2 is one of the best fighters they ever built. The best, in my opinion. Maxson was still going strong. I don't go for these new ones, you know. The ones made out of steel, aluminum with all the doodads. Too flimsy. Nothing solid. Now, nah, Mauling don't make them like Maxo anymore. Oscar, who are these guys? Mr. Nolan. I'm Steel Kelly. And this is... Is that your fighter? Yes, sir. Battling Maxo. Fighter in shape? You bet. Prime condition. Paul, my mechanic here, is a Class A mechanic, and he took Maxo apart and put him back together just before we left Philly. Oscar, cigar me. Yes, sir. Ain't you forgetting something? Huh? Like me. Oh, yes, sir. You know, Steel, you were lucky to get this bout. We ain't staged a bout with nothing less than a B4 in... Must be two years now. The fighter we had scheduled got run over by a truck in a loading dock at a stadium in Detroit. I needed somebody on short notice. So that's the only reason you're here. You got nothing to worry about, Mr. Nolan. My fight is in shape. He's the one that knocked out Dimsy the Rock in Madison Square Garden a few years ago. Maybe you... I just want a good fight. And you'll get it. Maxwell's in top shape. No first round knockout. No, no, nothing like that. People pay to see action. Do you have a prep room we could use? We want to check him over and make sure he's perfect. Down the hall, third door on the right, next to the janitor's closet. Thanks. Your bout is at nine. Got it. You won't be sorry, Mr. Nolan. I don't like guys that are late. Understood. Paul, let's get Maxo to his prep room. Uh, Mr. Nolan... I was wondering... I know what you're wondering. You get your money after you deliver a good fight, not before. Uh, no problem. We'll get him ready. And steal. Yeah? Don't slam the door. I hate loud noises. Come on. I'm coming. Oh, my stomach hurts. Don't be scared. It'll be okay. 
Oh, I ain't scared. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten all day. How could you think of food at a time like this? This one counts. It's our chance for a comeback. We've got to get him in that room. We've got to check him out real good. What time is it? I'm busy pushing. Come on, check your own watch. I don't have a watch anymore. I had to pawn it. The one your wife gave you? Ex-wife. Hey, look, uh, we got two hours before the bout begins. Have we got time for a sandwich? I want you to check him out real good. His arm, his gyro, everything. What for? Did you hear me? Yeah, but I work better on a full stomach. You get to work. I'll get you a sandwich. Max is going to take that B7, but good. Excuse me, sir. Do you know where I can get a Philly cheese steak? Uh, try Philadelphia. <laughs> Just kidding you. Oh, there's a nice little place around the corner, but I doubt they'll have something like that there. You new in town? Yeah. Where you from? Philly. Well, that figures. What brings you to town? I got a fighter in the third fight tonight. Really? Well, you must have one good fighter if you brought him halfway around the country for a fight. Well, he's a great fighter. He's fighting an experimental B-7. A B-7 fighting a B-6 could be interesting. He's not a B-6. Oh, a five might stand a chance. He's better than a five. It's a classic B-2. A B-2? Oh, well, I've never seen one of those, but I hear they're great bleeders. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, by the way, at the diner, I recommend the roast beef on rye. Bloody rare. <laughs> We got a big crowd out there tonight. Well, what took you so long, Steel? I'm starving. Here's your sandwich. How's Maxo? What kind of sandwich did you get? Roast beef on rye. Well done with silicone teflonic joint lubricant on the side. What? It's mayo. <laughs> How's Maxo? Uh, did you get me a pickle? How's Maxo? I love dill pickles. Oh, oh, here it is. Okay, well, the answer to your question is... Maxo is still big as life and twice as ugly. I cleaned him up a little, though. The B2s always looked real. Look at him. You'd swear he was real, wouldn't you? He's got that natural-looking flesh, great muscle tone. He could have been a male model if he wasn't a fighter. Come on, get to it. Well, outwardly, he hasn't aged a bit. His hair is still curly. Just like mine. Yeah, but he's got a little bit more than you do. Hey. When I had a maid, they gave my good looks. Mm. <laughs> That's a matter of opinion. Quit stalling. What's the good news? Well, that was the good news. And, uh, well, I also turned his power source on, and that's still good. So I ran a diagnostic check. And? And everything that was bad when we left Philly is still bad. There's got to be something we can do. Open him up again. You got a thing for bad news, don't you? Come on, Paul. Earn your keep. That's what you're here for. I'm not a miracle worker. I'm just a mechanic. Well, what do you want to do? Retire? Oh, fat chance of that. Then quit stalling and open the control box. <sighs> all right, all right. Uh, let me let me power him up first, so so we can walk over to the table. He's too heavy. Okay, come on. Had a boy. There you go. All right. Okay. Here, help me get him up on the table. That's my boy. The doctor will see you now. Lift his arm. What's all that corrosion around the excess panel? Dried sweat. All the B2s sweat like bulls. It's nothing to worry about, though. You hear that, Maxo? Nothing to worry about. We'll get you cleaned up. Hand me that probe. Well? Well, all electronic systems are functional. Huh. 
Well, I hope the circuit board doesn't blow. Why should it? Well, uh, if you recall, he got knocked out of the ring in the last fight eight months ago. It jarred all his electronic systems. The connections are all still operational, but, boy, I wish I had more time to manually double-check the connections. Well, you don't have time. Sometimes you just have to suck it up and have some faith in your fighter. All right, then. Okay. Well, I activated all his systems. Keep your fingers crossed, and just hope nothing blows. Breathing sounds good. His arms are creaky, but uh, they'll quiet down when he warms up. Look, beads of sweat are forming on his forehead. I told you these were good sweaters. Can you hear me, Max? Relax, boy. Let him warm up good, Paul. I'll tell you, the, the mechanical part is what worries me. I need to check his reflexes. Uh, Look, Steel, go put on the gloves, will ya? Let's see if, uh, if he can zero in on you, okay? Maxo, get your legs loosened up. Move around a little. Loosen up your jab, big boy. Don't rush him. If it don't work now, it won't work in the ring. All right, but just enough to check the jab. Set his controls so he doesn't count a punch. Good idea. Okay, hold still, Maxo. This won't hurt a bit. Okay. That's as low as it'll go. I, I don't think his systems like it, though. You know, if that cracked eye quits, he'll be very vulnerable. I, look, Steel, start circling him and see if he can follow you. Come on, Maxo. Look at me. I'm moving in. Wanna get you? Block my punch. Oh, man, they're gonna hear that in the back row. That's good enough for now. We know it works. Oh, Steel, he's gonna get more than one punch thrown at his head. He'll outdance him to keep clear. Give him more power to his legs. Those cables are bandy. I, I don't like doing this. There's not much tension left in him. He seems to be moving all right. Yeah, but, boy, a heavy wind might knock him over. Put him on automatic. Oh, no, 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 come on. Let's not push our luck. Do it. All right. Here goes nothing. Maxo, gloves up. That's it. Beautiful. Now, let's see if he can move in for the kill. Kelly, steal. No. Leave his systems on defense. He might have a couple of rounds if we leave him on defense. It, it takes less energy. You know, he's gonna get beat to pieces if we let him move in. No, do it. Will you use your head? He's a B2. He's gonna get slaughtered anyway. Look, if we let him go on defense, we might be able to salvage him for pieces. Nolan paid to see him on offense. It's in the contract. Activate his jab. Come on, it doesn't have any lubricant in it. Do as I say. All right. Activating the jab. Shut him down! Shut him down! What did you do? What did I do? I told you to take it easy. It was on the lowest setting. I told you to check the arm. What's the matter with you? So help me if you broke that arm. If I broke it? Yeah, you. Look. Steel, I kept this heap running on borrowed time for three years now. Before we left Philly, I told you we needed to fix things and replace parts. We couldn't let this chance go. Please, open them up and see what you can do. Steel, you know, try finding another mechanic that could have kept this antique working as long as I have. I dare you to. Please, see what you can do. Hold the arm up. Oh, man. Oh, no. Come here. Take a look. You see that? The trigger spring came right off. Can you reattach it? I can try, but 
you know, it's just going to pop off again. That's what happens when a joint doesn't get enough lubricant. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stretch it. Oh, oh, nuts. Oh. Oh. Well, that's that. Oh, no. One jab too many. We, we gotta do something. What? F fix it. I can't. You, you, you just can't fix a spring. Once it can't spring, it ain't a spring no more. I told you it was getting ready to break, and to get a new one last year. He's got to be fixed if he's going out there, and he has to go out there. They fronted me the monorail fare. Steel. He needs a new spring. Nothing else will work. Well, can't you get another spring? Where? They don't make them anymore. It's a special spring. I can't just take one off a washing machine or something. Quiet. Yeah? Ten minutes! Something wrong? Oscar, can you make up about the one after the next one? Mr. Nolan does not make changes. We just need a little bit more time to make some last-minute adjustments. Sorry, pal. No can do. We want him tip-top, don't you? Nolan's got you on next. What's the difference? Third? Second? It's all the same, right? Second's the semi-main. That ain't for a B-2. Maybe some B-2s, but this one... They want to see a fight, not an execution. But I'm telling you... Ten minutes or you're out of here. Be a shame after coming all this way. Right, boys? Uh, right. Well, then, I, I guess that means... That we'll have to hurry. You heard the man? I heard him, but it's over. We're finished. No, we're not. There must be a way. What? Sell them for scrap and get a couple of monorail tickets? We hung in there as long as we could, but this is it. I have to hand it to you, Steel. You wouldn't give up. Quiet. I'm thinking. There is one way it just might work. What might work? If they don't watch the fights... Who? Nolan and Oscar. Maybe they don't even come out of their office. What are you talking about? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no! You can't do this! Get the trunks and robe off Maxo. I'll change my clothes. Steel, you are out of your mind! You can't go into a ring against a B-7! I... I used to be pretty good. I can get through a couple of rounds. Just bob and weave, throw a punch every once in a while. You'll get killed! You heard that, Tub. We deliver a fight or we don't get paid. Steel, come on. You're never gonna get away with this. They won't let you. Who's gonna stop me? Y you can't make them think you're... Steel, for God's sake! I can if you help me. Nobody here knows what Maxwell looks like. If Nolan and the other guys don't watch the bout, we'll be all right. Steel... The crowd won't have a clue. Be too sweat, bleed, and drool just like the new ones. Give me the boots. Look, I got an idea. You know what I can do? I can wire my sister. She'll send us to Dota, get us back east. Tape up my hands. Steel? Steel. Steel. I got another idea. Wait, wait. Look, hold still. I, I know a guy in Philly wants to sell a B5 cheap. We could hustle up the cash and, uh, you Concentrate know... Concentrate on wrapping my hands. If you don't take them right, I could break them on the first punch. Steel, this is suicide. It's a B-7 out there. Don't you get it? It's a B-7. You're gonna get mangled. Quit talking. I gotta do this. Hurry up. There's no more time, Paul. Put the gloves on me. Oh, I don't want to do this. Please, please don't do this. Look, let me go into the office and let me talk to him. Maybe... Maybe, maybe, maybe they'll understand. No, they won't understand. So you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here and lace up my gloves. Ow! You'll help me or I'll beat your brains out on this wall. But you're going to get killed, Steel. Then I'll get killed. Better me than you, right? I got us in this mess. I'll get us out of it. Get there, heap honor! You heard the boss. Lace my gloves up tight. We gotta fight.
That's it, Paul. Tie him off tight. Oh, you really want to go through with this? Yes. Let's go. How do I look? Like a broken down old fighter. So I'll pass for a B2? That's what I said. You look like a broken down old fighter. Here. Let me, uh, let me put a towel around your neck. Pull up the hood on my robe, too. I'll keep my head down so they can't see my face. You better do that in the ring, too. Let's go. You're late. Uh, just, uh, just gamesmanship, Mr. Nolan. Making a late entrance, trying to get Max over the edge. Just like the old days, huh? Maybe I underestimated you guys. Nice robe. <laughs> it's old school, you know? Genuine set. No more stalling. I got a full house out there. Right. Come on, Maxo. Let's show him what you can do. Hey! What? Where's that... What's... What's his name? The, the owner. Uh, oh, you mean Steel. Uh, he's already out there. One step ahead of you. <laughs> I didn't see him pass my door. Well, he went a few minutes ago. He likes to check out the crowd. You boys better put on a good show. Yes, sir. Let me know when we get to the stairs. I got sweat in my eyes. I, I, I should have told him. If you had, I killed you. Okay, first step. Careful, Steel. Grab my waist. Wipe my eyes. I can't see my feet. Gee, Steve, you're already sweating like a pig. You'll have to towel me off between rounds, just like a real B2. Between what rounds? You won't last long. Whose side are you on? Steel, you're not up against some punch-drunk fighter. You're up against a machine. I said shut up. You're not going to get away with it, though. They ain't seen a B2 in years. No one said so. Steel, you're never going to pull this off. This is your last chance. Just get me to the rain. Hey, if it ain't battle and match on. Oh, 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 go back to Philly, you bum. Rattle and match sounds more like it. Oh, you're terrible. What is that, a bucket of rope? Okay, Steel, here's the ring. Two head. steps to the apron. I can see them. Okay, I'm going to pull the ropes apart. A ten-round light heavyweight bout featuring out of Philadelphia, the B2 Battle in Maxo. I'm gonna take your rope off now. Keep looking at your shoes. Try not to blink. Stay in my corner. Of course I. Breathe through your mouth, come on. Little breaths, come on, breathe. Not too fast. I need a drink. Sorry, the water bottle is filled with B7 hydraulic fluid. And now, entering the ring, his opponent, our own B7, the pride of Kansas, the Maynard Flash! What's he doing? He's jumping up and down on his toes. I never saw a robot do that before. Must be a new gimmick. Big deal. Well, this ain't kickboxing, so he's not scaring me. You should be scared, Steel. Come on, get out of the ring now while you still can. You get out, pal. See you at the end of the round. Steel, stay away from him. the bell. The fighters come out of their corners quickly. They size each other up. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. the flash landed a vicious right. Oh. And another. Oh. And another. Come on, get away from him. Get away from him. Maxo backs away. Come on, I got money on this fight. Come on, I can take it. The flash is the aggressor. He backs Maxo into the ropes. Hey! 
No holding. Get your B2 off the ropes. See how you like this. Bring it, Jabum. I can take it. Oh. There's thunder in those punches. Your mother's scrap metal. Maxo, backpedal. Ah. The flash swings wildly. If he lands one of those, he'll take Maxo's head off. The flash is coming in for the kill. Whoa. That one was lethal. Stop the fight. Come on, somebody stop it. Stop oh. it. Maxo is down. It's over. It's over. It's over. Come on, stay down. It's over. Just get me up. I've never been knocked down. I'm Steel Kelly. In the time of one minute and 22 seconds of the first round, your winner, the Maynard Flash! Yeah, that's it. Haul him out of here. Move it! Is he broken or what? No, no, no. He's okay. Just a second, okay? Steel, can you stand? Come on. Talk to me. Are you bleeding? Put the towel over my face. Yeah, sure. Get the robe. What? The robe. I want to walk out of here like a man. Come on, before they start throwing things. Let me help you up on the table. Come on. Here we go. Sit. Come on. Steel, I'm gonna try and get you some ice. Forget it. Put your eye. It'll be all right. I think right now you need a good stick man instead of a mechanic. That eye looks terrible. Actually, I, I, I think you need a doctor. Oh, man, you are really a mess. I, I don't have nothing with me. I, no needle, no thread, no iodine. That's not what I need. All I got is a couple of Maxo shop rags. Well, maybe we can stop the bleeding with them. Go. What? Where? Go get the money. But I can't leave you. Now. Yet. All right, all right, all right. Look, uh, but just, just lie down. I, I don't even try to move. Okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll be right back. Mr. Nolan? Over that quick, huh? Yeah, I guess. Uh, Maxo did the best he could, though, Mr. Nolan. Your strategy didn't work. Did you really think arriving in the ring late would upset a robot? <laughs> well, you never know. Uh, but that B7, it must have been tweaked or something. I, I never saw anything like that. Me neither, and I hope I never do again. Get your boy and clear out. Yeah, we will. Only first... I... You heard the boss. Well, you see, my boss Hiding said... Hiding out, huh? Don't even want to show his face. <sighs> Something like that. Come here. What? Mr. Nolan says you should come over to the desk. Okay. I want you to deliver something to your boss. Yeah? Piece of advice. Can you handle that? Yes. Now listen real close. You get it? Steel. Well? Here. This all he gave you? Where's the rest? Well, that's what he gave me. This is just enough for monorail fare back to Philly. Well, he said he wouldn't pay for a one-rounder. What do you mean? Come on, take it easy. No, no. 
No, no, no. Here, let me, let me, let me see your hand. Oh, man. Did you break your wrist? He can't do that. Steel, that's it. He's got a bunch of thugs in that room now. I'll go in there. You can't. If he sees you, he'll know what you've done. But the contract says... I'm supposed to deliver a message to you, too. He said to tell you. You're lucky he doesn't run us out of town on a monorail. And if you ever show your face in town again, he said you won't be so lucky the next time. Help me up. I just, just stay seated. I'll, I'll get you a drink of water. I don't need water. That's all there is. Look, we gotta get that wrist set. I, I can make you a sling. For now, just try not to move it. We'll go back by bus. By bus? Come on, you're not listening to me. Look, just, just hold still. If we go by bus, we'll save money. We'd have enough to get Maxo a, a new trigger spring and a, and a lens for his eye and some silicone teflonic joint lubricant. He'll be good as new again. <laughs> All right, Steele. Anything you say. Then we'll be all set. Maxo will be in shape again and, and we can get us some, some decent bouts. That's all he needs. A little work, huh? That'll shape him up. We'll show him what a top B2 can do. Old Max will show him. He'll show everybody. Right? Right? <laughs> sure, Steel. Sure. Now let's, uh, let's get out of here. Take it slow. I can walk. I know you can. You're a tough guy. But put your hand on my shoulder. That's it. Don't worry about Max. I can pull. Portrait of the Losing Side. Proof positive that you can't outpunch machinery. Proof also of something else. That no matter what the future brings, man's capacity to rise to the occasion will remain unaltered. His potential for tenacity and optimism continues, as always, to outfight, outpoint, and outlive any and all changes made by his society. For which three cheers and a unanimous decision rendered in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Steel, starring Lou Gossett Jr. with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Joby Cerny, Danny Goldring, Rich Kominich, Sam Derrance, Pat Fraley, Tim Dadavo, and Jennifer Joy. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Custom Foley effects, sound design, and mixing are done in the Cerny American Sound of Picture Theater by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Beyer. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.
You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Morning, Mr. Castle. Hello, Ned. Any mail today? Got it right here. Where's my registered letter? Registered? Oh, I didn't see one. The one that says I won the publisher's house sweepstakes. Oh, oh well, I'll keep an eye out for it. I entered that one myself. Instead, I get only bills. Yeah, the check's in the mail, Mr. Castle. Say, maybe tomorrow, huh? <laughs> maybe. See ya. Another bill, and another, and another. Edna, what about the gas and electric? What? The gas and electric bill. How many months is that? Two months. That's one you'd better pay. That's the one I can't pay. Mr. Castle? How are you, Mrs. Gumley? I... Uh, it... Just, just, just fine, Mr. Castle. Good. Glad to hear it. Uh, how have you been? Oh, can't complain. Been having a lot of rain, haven't we? What? Oh, yes. Quite a bit of rain for this time of year. Well, it's, um, it's, it's good for the flowers. Uh, how's that? Good for the flowers. The, the rain, that is. Yeah. Very good for flowers. Uh, uh, an heirloom today, Mr. Castle. <sighs> an heirloom, Mrs. Gumley. You don't say. Oh, yes, Mr. Castle. Been in my family for years. Has it now? Years and years. It's supposed to be very valuable. Uh, Hand-blown glass is what it is. Mrs. Gumley, it's just a plain old glass wine bottle. Do you know what it's worth, actually? Nothing. Not even a deposit. If you could find the store where it came from, that's what they'd give you. Nothing. I could let it go for a dollar? Mrs. Gumley, if I could spare a dollar, I'd give it to you. Believe me, I would. But things have been rough here. The pawn shop business isn't what it used to be. I'm so in debt myself that... I see. Wait a moment... Yes. One dollar it is, then. I wish it could be more, Mrs. Gumley. I really do. God bless you, Mr. Castle. I could kiss you. Stop that now. It's nothing. You're a wonderful man. Good luck to you. And to you. Better days for all of us. Mr. Castle, it's not an heirloom, you know. I found it in a garbage can. It's just a dirty old cheap glass bottle. Please, please forgive me for lying to you. That's all right, Mrs. Gumley. Who knows? Maybe it'll turn out to be an heirloom. We'll just have to wait and see. Who was that? No one. It sounded like Mrs. Gumley. Then I heard the cash register. What did you buy this time? Edna. Oh, a bottle. Gorgeous. She said it was an heirloom. Is that right? She has to eat, doesn't she? And you don't? That's not the point. Arthur, we're a couple of weeks away from bankruptcy. Don't you think I know that? Then you'd better start rubbing that bottle and pray, Arthur. Pray that a genie appears, because that's about the only hope we have left. Oh, Edna. Edna, please. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle. Suspended in that brief fragment of time before fate comes out of a bottle. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, gentle and infinitely patient people whose lives have been a hope chest with a rusty lock 
and a lost set of keys. But in just a moment, that hope chest will be opened, and an improbable phantom will try to bedeck the drabness of these two people's failure-laden lives with the gold and precious stones of fulfillment. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, standing on the outskirts and about to enter the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here, give me the bottle straight into the trash with it. If you won't do it, I will. Wait, it's worth a couple of cents. A couple of cents, Arthur? A couple of cents? We've got more creditors than we've got cheap watches. You promised me no more handouts. Look, Edna, maybe all that's left for me is to try and find someone who I can feel sorry for. Can you understand that? I need to feel that I'm doing something of value. Maybe a man can be a failure for only so long, and then... And then... And then it catches up with him. Arthur, you're not a failure. Of course I am. Look around, Jedna. In this clutter, you see the legacy of a hundred years. My grandfather owned this shop, and it finally broke his heart. Then my father, and it killed him too. The meanness of it, Edna. The shabbiness of it. The hand-to-mouth of it. This isn't just a hawk shop where you buy the pitiful little residue of other people's failures. It's a shrine to failure. That's what it is. It's a mausoleum, a burial ground for people's hopes. Arthur, please don't talk like that. Edna, what happens to us anyway? What happens to us? Have you ever thought of that? We're not old people, and yet this place is making us old. This should be years ahead of us, years without having to make do, scrimping and counting and picking over checkbooks and budgets and final notices and old bills and... Careful, Arthur, you're knocking things over. I don't care about the bottle. I'm trying to explain... <gasps> Arthur, what's all that smoke? I don't know, but it seems to be coming from inside Mrs. Gumley's bottle. How do you do? Where did you come from? From the bottle, of course. The bottle? It fell to the floor, the cork popped out, and here I am, at your service. I'm supposed to buy that. What do you take me for? Rather than go into any lengthy generic explanation of my existence, suffice it to say that I am here, and I am, in fact, a genie. In a business suit, with a derby hat and a walking stick, and you expect me to believe that, that you're a genie? That's quite correct. There's no such thing, except in fairy tales. On the contrary, I am living proof, in a manner of speaking. Arthur, who is this man? You'll have to do better than that, mister. I don't know what you're trying to pull here. Very well, I'll get right to the point. I can offer you four wishes with a guaranteed performance. Four wishes? Aha! You got that wrong. It's supposed to be three. In every book I ever read, it was three wishes. Better get your story straight. That's a myth, I'm afraid. Oh, they may have offered only three in the beginning. But for some time now, four has been the operant number. Some considerable time. It's proven to be the most effective option. Think about it. Too few, and a person may waste the opportunity of a lifetime, so to speak. Too many, and, well, the possibilities can get out of hand. Frivolous, in other words. The opportunities tend to cancel each other out, if you see my point. You've got your answers down, I'll give you that. I think i better sit. Well, Mr. Castle, Mrs. Castle, what do you have in mind? Arthur, I don't understand. What, what, what's happening here? Don't worry, Edna. The bottom line is he's a con man. He has to be. But I see him. Don't you? I don't know what I see. Could be some kind of hypnotist or something. Remember that guy in television? He made an elephant disappear. Child's play. Smoke and mirrors. Y you're telling me you're not a magician? Nothing of the sort. I grant four wishes to the owner and then go back inside the bottle for a century and a day. A hundred years. Inside a bottle. Plus one day. A nice touch, don't you agree? Until a summons comes from the next owner. What if there isn't another owner? But my dear fellow, there must be. Consider the span of a man's life. Three score and ten. Isn't that the tradition? So let's say nobody calls you. Or it's the wrong day. Ah, you've hit the nail on the head. I've learned to cultivate patience beyond anything you can possibly imagine. 
All of which means you're extraordinarily lucky today. As am I, in a manner of speaking. <gasps> Maybe he's from the lottery. We didn't play the lottery this week, Edna. Just as well. The odds are quite unrealistic. What I'm offering you transcends any lottery the world has ever known. They're strictly nickel and dime operations in comparison. I have to think this over. Take your time. Interesting shop you have here. Chinese vases, Tiffany lamps, bric-a-brac of every sort. Mostly imitation, of course. No offense. Nonetheless, I have the distinct feeling I've seen some of these items before. How could you if you haven't been out of the bottle in a hundred years? I meant the originals. The originals? How old are you? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Hmm, nice silver cigarette case. Faux Victorian, isn't it? My uncle's. He passed it down from his great uncle who bought it in Liverpool in 1914. <laughs> Is that what he said? How much? Take it. Get back to the subject. What else about the wishes? Oh, yes. Now, I think the business at hand is for you and Mrs. Castle to decide the nature of your four wishes, keeping in mind, of course, that each wish is irrevocable. Once made, it is fulfilled, and once fulfilled, it is a matter of record. It can only be altered by yet another wish. Clear, Mr. Castle? Clear enough. I think we'd better call the police. Why not wish for them? I can bring you Scotland Yard, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or every bobby in the City of London. That won't be necessary. Is it the police you want? No. That's not what we'd wish for. Arthur, are you out of your mind? Go ahead, Mr. Castle. You were saying? Well, if I had a wish... You believe him? Just for the sake of argument, let's say that I wanted that broken glass in the case over there. Let's say I wanted it to be fixed. The glass display case? Unless that's too hard for you. I broke it cleaning up the other day. One whole side is cracked. Is that all? It's too expensive to replace and impossible to glue together. Impossible. Would you like to make it official, Mr. Kessel? Arthur, be careful with this man. You don't know what he's after. Well, Mr. Kessel, is that your wish? Yes, that is my wish. I want the glass in the case to be repaired. Very well, then. Am I dreaming? It's a magic trick. It has to be. No, you're not dreaming, Edna. I see it too. It's like new. How... how did you do that? Next. What? Well, Mr. Castle, you have three wishes left. Three wishes. Three. Edna, three wishes. Anything we want. Think, Edna, think. What, what, what do we want? Why, I don't... I don't know. I asked you to think. I'm frightened. A new shop, Edna. An expensive shop on Fifth Avenue. We could have that just for the asking. But Arthur... Or travel. Take trips. We could see the places we could never afford to visit. Like Paris or Rome or, or even the South Seas. We could take a cruise around the world. First class. Surely there's a catch. Or oh, money. A hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars, a million. We wouldn't have to grub anymore. We wouldn't have to sit here and waste our lives away. Arthur, it isn't right. There's something, there's something unholy about it. Clothes, Edna. Expensive clothes, jewels, a beautiful house. No more worries for the rest of our lives. Are you sure? Edna, we don't have to rot away here. We can have anything we want. Anything, Edna. Money. Money? The simplest of all requests, Mr. Castle. Simple? For you, maybe. How much would you like? In what denominations? Edna, how much do we want? I... I don't know. I, I just don't know. A million dollars. That's what we want. A million dollars. In what form? Gold? Silver? Of course, there are market fluctuations in precious metals, so there will naturally be an element of risk. Platinum shows the least movement. Diamonds are relatively stable at the moment. Forget it. Cash only. All negotiable U.S. currency. Very good. Denominations? No fifties or hundreds. Make it five and ten dollar bills. Recent dates and no counterfeits. Where would you like it? Savings account or checking? Perhaps a numbered deposit in a Swiss bank. Right here. Here? Where I can see it. On the floor? Don't you worry about that. Just bring it here. I'll take care of the rest. That is your second wish. You understand English, don't you? That's our wish. 
coming right up. Oh, just one thing. Aha! Arthur, I told you. Do you mind terribly if I... If what? If I smoke. Is that all? Of course, if you prefer otherwise. I see the no smoking sign on the wall. No, no, go right ahead. <sighs> Very well. Now then, Mr. Castle, where were we? Ah, yes, I was about to say, ask and you shall receive. What's that? Where's it coming from? What is it? It's money. Look at it. A rain of money. Edna, Edna, a million dollars, Edna. <laughs> a million dollars. There you are, Edna. Champagne. <laughs> I think I've had more than enough. I suppose you're right. How can I work if I have a hangover? Well, you could take the day off. Edna, you're a genius. Why didn't I think of that? We both could. Close up the store and... And what? I wouldn't know what to do, would you? Well, let's see now. It's a beautiful day. We could take a walk together in the park. Oh, Arthur, I'd have to get dressed up and... I... I don't have any comfortable shoes. Or we could go to a restaurant. Any restaurant at all. But we've already had lunch. Then we could take in a film downtown or a play, a musical. Do you know how many years it's been since we did that? And leave all this money out like this? I don't think that would be a good idea. So, we're prisoners here. We can't go anywhere, do anything, for fear that someone might steal it from under our noses. What good is it? Oh, Arthur, we can put it in the bank. That's tomorrow. The bank's closed now. Unless... What are you thinking? Call your brother on the telephone. Tell him to come over here. He needs money for his operation, remember? Oh, I like that idea. And while you're at it, call Avritin, the butcher, and Mrs. Tiola, and the checker at the market. And that nice girl at the bank. And the dry cleaner. And here, look in the book. All our old customers, the ones who can't afford to get their valuables out of hock. Call them all, every one. What will I say? Tell them, tell them we need their help. It's a miracle, that's what it is. I couldn't believe it when they called. Where did they get it all? They're such wonderful people. And so generous, too. Hey, now, what's going on here? Hello, Officer McLaurin. The line's halfway down the street. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. Are they having a fire sale in there, or what? Oh, it's that nice Mr. Castle and his wife. What about them? <gasps> they're, well, they're redeeming things. What things? All kinds of things, as long as you've got your pawn ticket. Even if you don't, they remember. <laughs> they're redeeming us. That's what they're doing. It's the loveliest gesture I've ever seen. Hi there, Mrs. Gumley. Beautiful day. <laughs> Indeed it is. Your turn, Mrs. Gumley. Go on in. Hold on. Where'd you get that fistful of money? Right inside, officer. From Mr. and Mrs. Castle, bless their souls. What are they doing, running numbers? Nothing like that. Strictly legit. You're telling me they gave it to you? Sure did. Enough to pay off their tab at the butcher shop and then some. Plus the next ten years in advance. And whereabouts did they get this bankroll? Don't ask me. But their ship sure must have come in big time. The horses, was it? Or the lottery? I heard it was the sweepstakes that came in the mail. No, no, it was their cousin. He died and left them a fortune. Well, we'll just have to see about that. They're not breaking any laws. I haven't had my turn yet. You're not going to arrest them, are you? Maybe not. But I'll keep a close eye on the situation. In the meantime, I know someone who might be real interested in all this. Uh, don't you people go blocking the sidewalk now. Here you go, young man. Pay off that mortgage now. I will. And then go have yourself a ball, you and your lovely wife. I, I don't get it. Why are you doing this? Do I need a reason? Every time I come in your gas station, you look under the hood. Oh, that's nothing. Check the air and the tires, all of it, without my asking. I say that's worth something. It's worth a lot these days. 
Well, thanks, Mr. Castle. <laughs> Bye now. <sighs> Who's next? Mrs. Gumley, how are you? Very well, thank you. Here, you take this now. I want you to have it. Oh, so much. Don't you worry about it, Mrs. Gumley. Anything you need, anything at all, you come to us. There's more where that came from. For you, plenty more. Oh, God bless you both. But why are you giving me this money, Mrs. Castle? Why? <laughs> Because you're so bright and cheery every time I'm in the market. Oh, Mrs. Castle, thank you. You put this in the bank now for when you get married. And for you, Mr. Jax? And you too, Mrs. Tiola. You have a nice day now. <laughs> Don't mention it. Buy a round for everybody. On me. Is that all of them? Oh, for now. Put the clothes sign in the window, would you please? Of course, dear. Whew. Now that's what I call a day's work. <laughs> you did wonderfully well, Arthur. I'm so proud of you. You know, Edna, I don't care how we spend the rest. I feel so good right now, seeing all those happy faces. I know. It would be nice to get away for a while, though. I agree. Some time in the sun, nothing fancy. How much do we have left? Look in the box. It's still practically full. We didn't put a dent in it. Your father would be proud. <laughs> Rest his soul. And your grandfather. Tell me your opinion about something, Edna. If you like, dear. I'm wondering, do you suppose I still need to carry on the family business? Well... We don't have a son or daughter. I'd say you've more than done enough, Arthur. All these years. Even if we did have kids, I'd rather leave them money to start their own business. Something with a future. What about your cousin's children? Oh, that would be a wonderful present. And what about you? You've been so patient all these years. What would you like? Well, first, of course, you're going to retire. No ifs, ands, or buts. And then, wherever you'd like to live, Arthur, as long as we're together. <laughs> Of course we'll be together. You think I'm going to take up with a young floozy? Oh, no, no, I don't think that. You wouldn't. It's not in your nature. But you're tired. You need to rest. <laughs> we both do. Rest and live. Yes? Good afternoon, Mr. Castle. Do I know you? Let me see. Harry Joy's son. I don't believe we've met before. Wait. Stu Wintner's nephew. That's it. <laughs> Not quite. Are you from the life insurance company? Because if you are, we've got your payment right here. Just let me count it out for you. In cash. Is that all right? That's not necessary. Or we could write you a check just as soon as we make a deposit. And quite a deposit it will be by the looks of all this. I told you, Arthur, we should have put it away. Let me give you my card. Internal Revenue Service. That's correct. There's a matter of an income tax, Mr. Castle. You just send us the bill and we'll pay it. But send the bill in a hurry, would you please? My wife and I will be taking off for Europe very shortly. Oh, could we? <laughs> Consider it done. Where would you like to go first? The Eiffel Tower, an African safari, waltzing in Vienna, perhaps? <laughs> dancing? We haven't been dancing since... Well, since I don't remember. Dependents? Hmm? Just a few details for the record. Ask away. We have nothing to hide. How many dependents can you claim? The whole neighborhood. They don't count. Wait, wait. What's that figure? The one you just wrote down? Beginning with a sum of $1 million taxed on the basis of a husband and wife using the standard deductions and taking into account unpaid back taxes, approximately $907,000. Oh, that's how much I have left? Good. Fabulous. <laughs> that's how much you owe the government. I beg your pardon? In addition, there's a state income tax involved, which, using thumb rule, would come to a rough figure of uh, $35,000. You mean hundreds, don't you? 
Then there will be a matter of a 5% penalty. For what? If you fail to file a declaration within 30 days of today's date, but I'm sure you won't let that happen, the whole thing will amount to about, uh, roughly, mind you, let's see here, $942,640. Arthur, we've given away a lot of money already. I'll figure out how much. Fill out this form and send it to us with your check. It should be self-explanatory. If you want to use the installment plan, we'll send you a statement after your records have been analyzed. Mr. Castle? Yeah. Yeah. Send us the bill. We'll be seeing you. Good evening to you, Mrs. Castle. I wonder if we can appeal it. Help me, Edna. You take this pile. 76, 77, 78... Oh, Arthur, where's the genie when we need him? Well, how much is there? 910535 910540 dollars. We gave away almost sixty thousand dollars, and this goes to taxes, leaving us with this. One five dollar bill. That's our entire profit, Edna. Five whole dollars. That was quite a wish, Arthur. Quite a wish. And we haven't even paid the bills yet. If you'll recall, it was my suggestion that you reflect very carefully, Mr. Castle. Very, very carefully. <laughs> now he shows up. Had you made a wish that took into account the taxes involved... Look, you... Plenty of sweet talk and promises and the whole thing. And all the time, you're nothing but a con artist, after all. This time, I want the million dollars, but I want it after... Arthur, no more money. You've got to wish for something else. Oh, something else, then. A new store. A chain of stores. They could burn down one hour after we get them. Success? Be careful, Mr. Castle. Success is a pretty broad term. He's right. You can't wish for success. <gasps> I've got it. How about ten more wishes? Or twenty, or... Very clever, Mrs. Castle, wishing for more wishes. But I'm afraid that isn't permitted. Frankly, I'd be afraid to have you try it for fear of the consequences. What consequences? Why do you have to keep losing your temper? Why can't you think about this thing carefully and, and then come up with well, a... Well, you're no help to me, that's for sure. Here we stand in the middle of this crummy little pawn shop with a whole world out in front of us and anything to wish for that we want. Anything. And you just stay on my back and... Stop it. This doesn't sound like you. Not like the man I married. Not at all. Edna, what's happening to us? What's really going on here? Oddly enough, this is the normal pattern that seems to be generally followed. Great excitement, great emotionalism, and strangely enough, hard to believe though it may be, only a modicum of happiness. Well, you've got cheap customers here. Our price is no longer so high. We're people who haven't had much happiness. People who've carried a crummy hawk shop on their backs all their lives. What, Edna? Tell me, what do we wish for? I don't know, Arthur. I just don't know. What about it? What can I wish for now? What can come to me without tricks? Without tricks? I question the semantics here, Mr. Castle. There are no tricks involved. There are simply normal and understandable outgrowths and conditions that go with any windfall. No matter what you wish for, you must be prepared for the consequences. What sort of consequences? Nothing more than cause and effect. Consider, for example, what happens when you throw a stone into a lake. The stone sends out ripples in the water. After a while, these ripples reach the shore. The bigger the stone, the bigger the ripples. And if the stone is large enough, you'll get a wave of water, even a tidal wave that could sweep you off your feet. It all depends on how much you disturb the way things were to begin with. Now do you see what I mean about consequences? That I need something without consequences. I'm not sure that's entirely possible. Something dead sure, at least. Something anchored, something airtight. I must agree, that would be the ticket. Is there such a thing? Sit down now, you'll give yourself a heart attack. Edna. I think I've got it. I think I know what it is. What, Arthur? Power, Edna. Power. Prerogatives. To be in charge of something. To be a boss. To be a leader. With respect and the freedom to live as one likes. We could wish for that. Possible. Very possible. President of a corporation? 
that sort of thing? We could be sued, go bankrupt. Warden of a prison. That's idiotic. Mayor of a city. We could get voted out of office, and then what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know what. Head of a country. Ruler of a whole country. That's it. Who can't be voted out of office. What about it, Jeannie? I want to be the head of a country who can't be voted out of office. Is that your wish? Do you want to be more specific than that? Hold on, hold on. Let me give it to you this way. I want to be the head of a foreign country who can't be voted out of office. But it must be a major country, well-known, not some poverty-stricken third-world place, and not in ancient times either, in modern history. How do you define modern? Within my lifetime, and developed. A fully industrialized country with millions of educated people where I'm very popular and can't be voted out of office. No problem. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I mean, what about the consequences? Consequences, Mr. Castle, I've already told you. You run the risk of consequences no matter what you wish for, like the ripples in a stream. There's no predicting, at least not with absolute certainty, where they'll lead. All right, then. Go ahead, Arthur. Wish for that. The thing you said. I want to be the head of a foreign country, just as I've described it. Now it's your turn, Jeannie. Take over. As you wish, Mr. Castle. <laughs> as you wish. <laughs> You'll forgive me, sir. Yes? I have not slept in three nights now, but the situation is as I described. The first Ukrainian army has cut us off from the south. There's no sign of Wink's reserve army. There is no reserve army. We are simply doomed. There is no hope for us. From now on, it is just a mass suicide. Did you hear what I said? They are already in Berlin? What about it, Führer? Führer? What do you want to do? Why do you call me that name? Here is what you asked for. Very quick and very painless, mein Führer. And we have the gasoline for you and Miss Braun. When you're finished... Head of a country. Can't be voted out of office. It's the end of the war and I'm in a bunker and I'm... Hail Hitler! It's almost the end. I've given them the poison. We'll take their bodies out into the courtyard and burn them when it's finished. Have the gasoline ready. I won't take the poison. I wish... I wish I were back where it all started. I wish I were Arthur Castle again. Oh, Arthur, you've broken it. What? Broken what? The bottle Mrs. Gumley brought in. Why? I have, haven't I? Not poison, and an old wine bottle. Let me sweep it up for you. I can do it. It had no value anyway. No, no value at all. I'm here. My final wish. I'm really here now. Where is he? Where is who? You know who I mean. The... The... And why would he be here? You've had your four wishes, remember? No, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'm a four-time loser. What do you expect? I just wish he doesn't come back. I wish... There you go, wishing again. Right. Why should I? Why did I? Look at what we have here, Edna. We have a business that's been in my family for three generations. And each other. We have each other. I'm going to stop wishing for a while. You know, Edna, I can't afford a brand new life. Neither can I. I think I'll just give the old one a new paint job. <laughs> you know something, Arthur? I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> what is it? Look, your first wish, the glass case, it's not broken. It's still repaired. <laughs> so we came out ahead after all. Nothing's ever a complete loss, is it? Careful, Arthur with the broom handle. Well, we were ahead. 
Now you have more glass to clean up. You know something? I don't mind cleaning up any of it. Not at all. In fact, not at all. A poet named Lowell said it, something to the effect that granting our wish is one of fate's saddest jokes. Lesson to be learned out of a few fragments of broken glass in a trash can. And a word to the wise, to the garbage collectors of the world, to the curio seekers, to the antique buffs, to everyone who would try to coax a miracle from unlikely places. Check the bottle you're taking back for that deposit, because the genie you save might be your own. Case in point, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, fresh from the briefest of trips into the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Linda Ryder, David Darlow, Guy Burrill, Rosalind Alexander, Richard Hensel, Rich Komenik, Carl Amari, Diane Trice, Irene Olson, and Richard Shavson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.